Hi, my name is Ed Engel. I'm the Mobility Justice Advocate at the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition. Uh, today, we're kicking off our Universal Design Forum. Uh, but before we do so, I want to give a brief summary of what we do here at SnowTrack. SnowTrack is a mobility management coalition that advocates for connecting people and communities in Snohomish County and beyond with safe, equitable, and accessible transportation. We do this by convening nonprofit, private, and public organizations in order to identify mobility gaps and needs, especially for these priority populations. I want to thank our partners, Disability Mobility Initiative, Homish Human Services, and uh, Sohomish County Human Services for making this forum possible. Uh, we value your continued engagement and look forward to future collaborations as we work together to further elevate the goals of mobility for everyone. Uh, here's our schedule for the day. Uh, coming up very soon, we have our keynote speaker, Anna Zyverts. Speaking. Uh, after her, we'll have Jonathan White uh, from the Inclusive Design and Environmental Access uh, Center speak. And then after that, we'll have an hour long break and then we'll reconvene at one o'clock for a presentation from Kathy McCall, who is the Advocacy Director at AARP Initiatives, Housing Choice and Universal Design. So today, our keynote speaker is Anna Zyverts, uh, Director of the Disability Mobility Initiative. Uh, she is a low vision mom and non-driver who was born with a neurological condition, nystagmus. Since launching the Disability Mobility Initiative at Disability Rights Washington, Anna has worked to bring voices of non-drivers to planning and policy making tables. She launched Week Without Driving in 2021 to challenge elected leaders to get around for a week without driving themselves. She also serves on the board of the League of American Bicyclists and the National Safety Council's Mobility Safety Advisory Group. With that, I will kick things over to Anna. Stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction, Ed. And thank you, Snowtrack, for inviting me here today. It was really uh, awesome that you are coordinating this event, focusing on access and mobility. I love that, that you're pulling this together. And I also really appreciate that you're one of our strongest partners in the week without driving, which I'm going to uh, talk about towards the end of my presentation. Um, so to begin, uh, yeah, my name is Anna uh, Zivarts. I am a white woman um, in my late 30s, um, and I'm sitting here in our offices uh, of Disability Rights Washington in downtown Seattle. And I'm going to try, as I work through my presentation today, to describe all the content on the slides as a way to make sure that this content is accessible for those who are blind and low vision. And I will also make a copy of, of the materials available to you all. And uh, perhaps Ed and uh, uh, Brock can send that out afterwards if you wanna check out any of the content on your own time afterwards. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and share and get started. So my presentation today is called When Driving Isn't an Option, Mobility Access for Non-Drivers. And on the screen, there are three images that I'll describe for you. The first is an image of Crystal and one of her friends in Tacoma. Crystal Monteros is a wheelchair user and she lives right on the border of Lakewood and Tacoma. And this is a picture of the sidewalk uh, near where she lives trying to access the bus stop. And there's not very much of a shoulder. So you can see in the image, there's a, a car speeding by very close to where Crystal and her friend are uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, the picture in the middle is uh, Jaime Torres, who lives in the Tri-Cities area, and this is him in his uh, neighborhood in Pasco, where the sidewalks have crumbled, and he's trying to navigate a crumbling, gravel-filled sidewalk in his wheelchair and looking on in frustration. And then the, the final image is uh, Vanessa Pruitt, who's uh, one of the folks who works with me um, with the BIPOC Mobility Action Coalition. It's a partnership we have with Front and Centered, and um, Vanessa is a uh, uh, also lives in the Tri-Cities and um, navigates with the help of a, a, a guide dog, a service uh, dog. And so she's pictured here walking in the Tri-Cities in a park with some beautiful, dry, rolling uh, Eastern Washington uh, hills behind her. So I wanna start out uh, by talking a little bit about the misconception that everyone drives. And uh, you know, this is something that I believe growing up, I grew up in Olympia and um, outside of Olympia in the woods. And I really didn't know any adults who, who didn't drive. I felt like you know driving was part of, of becoming a, a fully independent human being. I didn't know folks who used the bus um, or who, who used other ways of getting around. And, um, and I think this is true for a lot of people who grow up 
uh, outside of areas that are well served by transit. There's just this assumption that, that the only way to have mobility is through driving. And the reality of that is, is something quite different. Um, based on just uh, data from who has driver's licenses and who, and who doesn't in the United States, uh, we know that 31 out of every 100 residents in the US does not have a driver's license. And uh, thanks to some wonderful research conducted by Tool and others funded through the, the JTC um, last year on, on non-drivers, um, in Washington state, we know between 25 and 30% of our population are non-drivers. Similar research from Wisconsin showed that 31% of their population were non-drivers. And the image on this, this slide is an image of a group of us uh, doing an organized walk roll audit along Rainier Avenue in Seattle. Um, this is crossing one of the I-90 on or off ramps. I think this is an off ramp. Um, and there's a group of folks of mixed abilities trying to cross um, what is an unsignalized on -ramp, off ramp in the rain. And um, there's some folks with some high-vis clothing trying to get vehicles to stop as the group crossed. Oops. Ah, there we go. So who are non-drivers? I want to dig into this question a little bit more. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I guess, why I, I'm talking about non-drivers and not specifically about disabled people. Uh, the Disability Mobility Initiative is a program that I launched at Disability Rights Washington in the fall of 2020. And the goal with uh, DMI is to talk about the needs of non-drivers and to organize non-drivers to demand a more accessible uh, transportation system and more accessible land use and housing and zoning um, for all of us who can't drive. And that includes you know, people like myself who are blind and low vision and other folks with disabilities that prevent us from driving. Um, from that non-driver study that, WASH, uh, that the JTC funded, um, we know that 19% of adult non-drivers in Washington state can't drive because of a disability. So that, that's a pretty significant chunk of folks who can't drive. Um, it's also folks who are aging out of driving. 19, 18% of people older than 65 uh, don't drive and 35% of women over the age of 75. And um, this stat comes from a friend of mine, Danielle Argoni, who's writing a book for Island Press about aging and climate resilience. And I um, can't wait to read it when it comes out this fall, because I think um, there's, there's a lot of folks who, um, who, as they age, need communities that can work for them and, and they can continue to be active and, and participate. Um, there's also a lot of young folks who can't drive. Folks who are you know, too young to drive, young people who haven't yet gotten driver's licenses um, for a variety of reasons, even though they are old enough technically to, to get a driver's license. And we know that many folks can't or don't drive because they simply can't afford to. Households that make less than $25,000 a year um, are nine times more likely not to have a car than households that earn more than $25,000 a year. And um, we know because of the, the, the deep correlation between race and poverty in our country, um, that that means that, that Black and Brown and Native American folks are also less likely to own cars or have access um, to driving. Uh, according to the National Equity Atlas, 18% of Black households lacked access to a vehicle, and that compares to only 6% of white households. And 48% of Native American and Native Alaskan households lack access to a vehicle. Um, we also know that immigrant households are less likely to uh, have access to a vehicle um, compared to non-immigrant households. So um, non-drivers, uh, we, we are more likely to be low income or more likely to be people of color or more likely to be disabled um, and seniors and young people. And so uh, I wanted the, 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 the purpose behind the Disability Mobility Initiative and, and the organizing work we do with non-drivers is really to bring together this coalition of folks who may or may not identify as disabled, but who have similar mobility needs and to be able to, to organize and, and demand for demand change. And sort of the, the visible uh, manifestation of our organizing work, you can check out online, it's, it's our story map, our transportation access for everyone's story map. And these are some images from uh, one version of that story map online. We have versions that are you know, just text versions as well for accessibility. And to date, we've interviewed more than 250 non-drivers from every legislative district in the state. And thanks to partners who I know many of you are on this call today who have helped us reach out, reach out and connect to folks 
who might be willing to share those stories, we've been able to build this network of folks who historically haven't had a, a big voice in transportation planning um, and land use planning um, and, and start to have our voices be part of the conversation and be visible. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pause for a second and show you a video. Some of you may have seen this before, but I think it always just really grounds the conversation about um, who I'm talking about um, and who we're organizing with uh, and who, who are the folks who need uh, our transportation system to change. So I'm going to pull up that video and let's hope this works. Come on. Here we go. All right. When I had my brain bleed in California, I moved up here because that's where I have all my friends and family. Jaime rolls along a cracked up sidewalk in Pasco. But then you have sidewalks like this, which to me is an embarrassment. Like where I'm standing is on grass, where a sidewalk is supposed to be. Chris uses a white cane to walk along a muddy path to a Vancouver bus stop. Other disabled people navigate the mud and walk in the street. So when it's rainy, like Washington often is, it gets really muddy and hard to walk, so you almost feel like you're safer walking on the edge of the road. In Spokane, Alco uses a white cane to navigate along the edge of a suburban neighborhood street that doesn't have sidewalks. My worry is somebody's really zipping hellbent for election and I don't get out of the lane time, you know? Cody Shane in Chihuahua pushes a trike along a sidewalk that is missing sections and filled with gravel. So without transportation, people with disabilities become isolated. And we, when we become isolated, we become depressed. Originally, I moved out to Edmonds because that's that's what my roommates and I could afford. Erica crosses a suburban Edmonds street in her power wheelchair. It means uh, taking an hour and a half, two hours to get uh, anywhere that I need to go. A person in a power wheelchair rolls over a cross street where the ramps are angled, so he has to go out into high-speed traffic. Another person, using a white cane, crosses a multi-lane road without crosswalks while a semi approaches. We can't get across the street sometimes to get a bus or to get some food or some water because there's all these barriers in between. Jamin in a manual wheelchair approaches an uneven crumbling sidewalk in Port Orchard. My trip to school takes me two hours. Abby from Vancouver holding a white cane and waiting at a bus stop and then getting off a bus. If I end up missing one of buses, it takes me around three hours. Chris waits at the bus stop next to her apartment complex on Bainbridge. I think buses and ground transportation should be something that is seen as anybody and everybody should use that. A person in a manual wheelchair waiting at a crosswalk as a Pierce Transit bus drives past. Kat from Bremerton waits with her power wheelchair in the middle of the road for the bus. Her partner, JR, waits in the loose gravel with his service dog as the bus approaches. I'd have all the sidewalks paved that are anywhere anybody can walk, including uh, and especially bus stops. Clayton rolls down the street with other young wheelchair users in the Friday Harbor 4th of July parade. I'm looking forward to the day where we have some kind of transportation. Cars speed past the tip of Zach's white cane as he stands on the edge of a busy rural road in Kingston. You can make a lane wider for big trucks, or why can't you make a sidewalk for people who are, are traveling that don't have access to driving? People like me shouldn't be an afterthought. Like, we are here, there's plenty of us, and we don't just want to stay cooped up in our houses because a curb cut is missing or there's roots growing and throwing off the sidewalk. Kanisha rolls up to a missing curb ramp on her street in West Seattle. Another wheelchair user rolls over a giant crack in a sidewalk caused by a tree root. And we don't want to be harassed in the street because that's our only option to be safer. Tanisha weaves through the cars blocking the curb ramp as she tries to cross an intersection. And those are things that are preventable, so we should prevent them. Produced by the Disability Mobility Initiative. All right, let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint here. Um, here we go. So as you heard from, from the stories there in the video, there are a lot of barriers that exist currently in, in the way we've designed our communities and the way that we have baked in car dependence into so much of the way we've organized our lives. And um, I wanna highlight some of the issues and some of the biggest barriers or the common themes that we heard again and again um, with these interviews in Washington State. And um, if anyone is, is joining us here from other parts of the country, I also think that much of the, much of the, the content, much of, of the knowledge and expertise that we've gained here with, with our work resonates in other parts of the country as well. 
um, you know, there's there's places that that look a lot like uh, Tacoma, that look a lot like uh, Eastern Washington, that look a lot like Seattle, um, in, in many parts of the the country. Uh, so the the first major theme that I want to touch on is the the importance of a connected sidewalk network, and I think this is often overlooked in transit and transportation conversations by folks who uh, are not disabled and perhaps don't notice the gaps or aren't impacted as deeply as uh, by the gaps as people with disabilities. And Crystal Monteros, who I, I described earlier, is, is the person who really, I think, has articulated for this for me in a way that, that resonated. She said, quote, we need to start thinking about public transportation and sidewalks as going together instead of as two separate things. You can't use the bus if you can't get yourself to the bus stop. And this image uh, here is of Crystal at the bus stop across from her apartment complex. And the bus stop has a, a concrete platform, but then it ends and there is no sidewalk on either side of it. And there's this very fast multi-lane road with no shoulder. And so when it's muddy, when it's wet, when it's icy, um, when this, this section of sort of mud becomes inaccessible for Crystal to get through on her wheelchair, she has to call over to neighbors in the apartment complex and get someone to push her through here. And that lack of connectivity, you know, is, is a real barrier for so many people in our state, not just people in wheelchairs, um, but, but blind and low vision folks, people with strollers, um, people with other mobility disabilities. And it's something that we need to be thinking of and need to be planning for and need to be really intentional about uh, repairing um, so that we do have this connectivity. Because when there isn't that connectivity, what happens is that people who may be able to use fixed route transit instead can't. And so we get stuck at home or we end up having to rely on paratransit or other you know, rides from friends and family. Um, and those, those aren't as, as flexible um, and perhaps don't offer the same level of independence as, as being able to uh, roll out of the door and, and catch a bus. Um, uh, this is another uh, example of, of, of sidewalk connectivity. And this uh, is Blake Guyon, who uh, lives in Tacoma as well. And he uh, worked with me uh, at DMI as a fellow for a little bit. And he had pointed out that there was this missing piece of sidewalk between the nearest bus stops and the Pierce County Election Center, which is where you go if you need to use one of the accessible voting machines and want to be able to vote privately. And so every year when he wanted to vote, he would have to roll along the shoulder of another big, pretty gnarly, um, uh, big strode <laughs> in, uh, in Pierce County to get to the voting center. And so with Blake's advocacy, with support from Crystal, who uh, serves on the Tacoma Area Commission for People with Disabilities, um, with support from Pierce Transit and lots of Tacoma and Pierce County leaders, we were able to get funding for the sidewalk, um, pieces of sidewalk to get built, and they got built. And now every year when Blake uh, goes and votes, he tends to, to tweet a picture of himself. And that, it makes me happy because it makes me think that, you know, these changes are possible. And, but it shouldn't have to take this, these Herculean amounts of effort to get these little pieces of sidewalk built. Uh, it shouldn't take, you know, huge community mobilizations. We should be able to look more comprehensively as a state, where are there not missing sidewalks? Um, where are these critical connections missing and start to, to make those repairs? Another um, theme <laughs> that we hear again and again is the importance of being able to cross safely. And um, many of our roads, because of the high speed of cars, because of the way we prioritize the speed of cars, are inaccessible to people who are walking and rolling for transportation. And one example of this is in Eastern Washington. This is Cody Shane, lives in Chewila, up north of Spokane. And the, the main street of his small town is a high estate highway. And so it's really difficult to cross. There's only one stoplight um, through sort of a, a mile long stretch of town. And so he has to go way out of his way to get to the stoplight. It's a short crossing. It feels super rushed. Um, and, and the rest of the time there's high speed cars and trucks and freight um, barreling down what you know could be a the, you know a really enjoyable main street of this small town, and Cody Shane says there's only one light and it doesn't give you enough time to cross. And this is an image of him wheeling his trike across the street here, trying to get in between his house and the library where he works. A piece of this puzzle uh, with high-speed crossings is figuring out how to have uh, transit, high, you know, high-speed frequent transit <laughs> um, that 
that also um, is accessible to people walking and rolling. And I think about this a lot in the Puget Sound area as we are expanding light rail. And you know, because of the way we are citing light rail or citing bus rapid transit along these highways or along major corridors, that really can present real barriers to people who are then trying to get to those transit stops and cross the street. How, you know, how can you get across Pacific Highway safe, safely uh, to access the, the upcoming uh, bus rapid transit that's getting built along there? Or this example um, in Seattle is, is you know, the light rail that's getting built along the um, I-90 corridor. And this is the Judkins Park Station. This is an image of some of the on and off ramps. And this is the same, those same ramps that I showed in the, one of the earlier images that are unsignalized. And it's gonna be a real challenge for people who are trying to access that station to get safely uh, to the station when they either have to go up and around a big hill or have to um, you know, cross some of these ramps. And on the left is an image of Micah Lusignan, who's a, a blind um, fellow who worked with me for a while. And we went out and walked this intersection and he walked up to the sign thinking it was gonna be a pedestrian button to get a walk signal across one of these ramps. And instead it just says, use caution while crossing, um, really putting the, the honest on um, those of us who are walking and rolling to try to, to dash across these intersections uh, safely. And so Micah said, so they can't see us and I can't see them. That's rough. Um, and it is rough. And I, I think, you know, so often we don't consider the experience of people, especially people with disabilities, in navigating um, that connection between the pedestrian environment and transit. Another theme that we've heard um, throughout our, our conversations with folks is how ride hail itself isn't the solution or isn't the complete solution. And um, I'm gonna read a couple of quotes here. This image on the left is Amandeep who's blind and lives um, near the, the, this is uh, her, I think at the Linwood Transit Center, uh, Center. And she says, in the blind community, not all blind people have good jobs. Students and others are struggling financially and Uber is expensive. And so yeah, the expense of ride hail is a real barrier for, to people who, who could otherwise perhaps benefit from it. Um, Jessica from Kent, who is a wheelchair user says, people talk all the time about getting rides from ride hailing companies, but people in chairs can't do that. And finally, Leah, who lives in Port Townsend says, we don't have Lyft or Uber here. All we have is one taxi, which doesn't run on Sundays. It only runs on certain hours on Saturdays. So I think you know our, our community has seen real limitations to, um, to ride hail being uh, the solution or being a, a workable solution for those of us who have disabilities and who are low income. Another major theme is how much housing matters. And I think this is really uh, the underlying theme of all of this is that if you can't afford to live somewhere with reliable transit, with an accessible pedestrian network, um, with stores and medical services that are accessible to you, um, then, then it can be really challenging. And as the you know, prices, housing prices keep going up and up and up, people on fixed incomes, people who are unemployed or underemployed really struggle. And this is an image of Chris who lives in the Vancouver area who is blind and she's working her way along a muddy track that is the sidewalk um, to access the nearest bus stop to our house. And she says, housing can be a struggle to figure out. Can I walk to the grocery store if I need to? Or is there a bus that, I can, ta that can take me without having to transfer five times? And um, Vaughn, who now lives in Spokane, um, but previously lived in Vancouver and was struggling there to afford uh, housing said, more affordability means moving further out. Me moving further out means more limited transportation. And I think, yeah, Vaughn's comment, it just really sums it up that this is, this is a housing, um, this is a land use uh, a question as well, right? It's not just about transportation. It's not just about, you know, frequent buses. It really is about how can we imagine communities that um, wh where what we need is accessible to us. So uh, getting into solutions, um, one uh, big, uh, big ask, and I think that the thing that I, I hope you take away from this presentation today is how important it is to engage with, um, to listen to, and to ultimately employ people who can't drive. Um, and your organizations, if you work in the transportation, if you work in the housing um, spaces. 
because uh, we have spent so many, so many hours of our lives thinking about how to make this the situation work better for us. I just think about, you know, um, this morning, for example, I went to a, a breakfast in Bellevue and it took me, I left my house at 545 and I got there around 730. And most of that time I was thinking about um, how there were gaps in, in, the, in their transportation system that were making that trip so difficult um, and, and, you know, mostly just so, so time intensive. And I think about that multiplied by every trip I take, um, how much time I, I really do consider how to improve our, our transportation and housing situations. And I think the same is true for everyone who can't drive because we do spend so much more time trying to get around. And much of that time is, is spent thinking about how to make things better. Um, and so, you know, there is an incredible amount of knowledge. There's also in the disability community in particular, a lot of underemployment and unemployment people who would like to have the opportunity to share this expertise, but who have been excluded because of a lot of barriers. And um, one of the easiest barriers to address is driver's license requirements in job postings. And we see these again and again in postings related to transportation, um, ADA coordinator positions, um, planner positions. And we've you know, made a point of trying to point this out to the uh, public agencies who post these and try to get them to remove those licensing requirements. And, and we've, you know, people have been really receptive to that. But unfortunately, in a lot of HR systems, driver's license requirements are the default. And so it's time to, to look at your HR system and think about, okay, maybe this isn't a default that we should have. I think there's also a lot of barriers that exist because of the way we have prioritized credentials um, and academic credentials over lived experience. And for many reasons, um, because of ableism, because of racism, because of um, economic insecurity, many disabled folks haven't had the opportunities to get the credentials, to go to urban planning, um, you know, master's programs or engineering programs. And, and so uh, we perhaps aren't being viewed as uh, viable candidates for jobs, despite the fact that our, our lived experience might qualify us and might in some ways be um, more useful. Um, and then I think at, at, at a deeper level, there's it's time to start rethinking expectations around, um, around workplace culture um, and, and perhaps ableist expectations. And I think the pandemic has allowed us to rethink a lot of the requirements we had around in-person in uh, workplaces and, and that it's possible to do work remotely and do it well. Um, but there are still other barriers that can make it difficult, especially for people with chronic health conditions to participate you know, in a workplace that has uh, strict requirements around hours or um, you know, 40, 50 hour work weeks. And so how can we think about ways to redesign our workplaces to have the flexibility to bring in more people um, with more diverse experiences that can really help us build transportation systems that ultimately are gonna work better for all of us. And so um, the, the thing I wanna leave you all with is our week without driving challenge, um, because this is how we begin to help elected leaders, help members of the public, help people working in transit agencies and transportation departments, start to understand some of the barriers that we experience as non-drivers. And the week without driving challenge is, um, you know, if you can drive or afford a car, you may not understand what it's like to rely on walking, rolling transit and asking for rides. But for a quarter of people living in the United States, people with disabilities, young people, seniors, and people who can't afford cars or gas, this is our every day. Um, and so we ask you to, to contemplate that every day. And um, this year, the Week Without Driving, it will be our third uh, annual Week Without Driving Challenge. It will be taking place October 2nd through, uh, 2nd through the 8th. And um, we're taking it national this year in partnership with America Walks. And so in addition to doing a lot of outreach and coordination here in Washington State, other organizations will be hosting it uh, in communities throughout the country. And so um, we're hoping that that will start to resonate and really start to bring more attention to the fact that so many of us don't have the privilege of driving. And to sort of inspire you about what a difference this can make, I'm gonna show one more video um, that takes some of the reflections from elected leaders who uh, participated in the week without driving last year. And many of these folks were recruited by Snowtrack. So again, shout out for their awesome collaboration with us. 
um, to make the week without driving a success for the last couple of years. So I'm gonna pull this other video up. And here we go. What I thought I knew about transit, what I thought I knew about the user experience was very transformed the past week and the week without driving. It's a lot different to choose to not drive versus to not be able to drive. Whenever I wanted to go somewhere, I had to plan a lot of additional time. And it changed my whole life. I had to think about how do I pick up dog food for my very large dog that eats a lot? How do I um, get to work every day and make sure that I can move around safely? I had to think about when I can leave, how I get there, what I'm gonna wear. I did keep a journal and since you want to see this. So I had to get rides back and forth to city council meeting. I took the Swift most of the time. I found out that they don't go after 8 p.m. on Sunday. So I had to go back to the event that I was at and had to ask for a ride. It's frankly kind of hard to imagine how someone who didn't have access to a, a car, how they could do the job of a city council member. That means we have voices that aren't being heard in uh, leadership. When I participated in the week without driving, I ended up on one of these roads where there was no sidewalk and there was very limited space between the, the road and cars flying by me. This would have been very challenging. I think about this a lot when I had kids at home who, you know, were counting on me for rides everywhere. I think it reinforces the holes in our head bike transportation system. If you're not out there walking and biking and experiencing it, you have no idea how important it is to fill those holes. What are the, the ways in which the decisions that I make as a school board director can emphasize we want you to be here because we've thought about the bus schedules when we planned when this was going to happen. This is my second year joining the week without driving and it is a challenge and I think that that's such a great thing for me as policymaker to understand. By the end of the week I was realizing that I was like feeling a little bit blue because <laughs> uh, I just hadn't had the social connections that I usually do. When we plan our routes of public transit I know that hospitals are included, but those aren't always all of our medical service. If there's ways that we can have more flexibility for our staff and for others um, for meeting times or leaving early or catching the bus. It's gonna help me focus on improvements to our transportation structures for the city of Lacey. Keep applying for those sidewalk grants. Why would we be building car dependent urban space when we shouldn't expect people to drive as they become elders. If the week without driving, if that was new to you, uh, then you gain firsthand experience about the everyday reality for 25% or more of the Washington residents we serve who don't drive. That kind of uh, frontline observation can only be a positive in trying to inform um, any decisions that we make. The Disability Mobility Initiative is a program of Disability Rights Washington. Support for the week without driving provided by Amazon. All right. Well, that brings me uh, to um, the end of my presentation. And I, I really do encourage you all to join us for the week without driving this year. And you can go to weekwithoutdriving.org to sign up now. Um, to start getting uh, communications from us as we as we pull that together this year. I'm also sharing a screen here with some other resources. Our transportation access for everyone um, story map is available at dismobility.com. We have a YouTube channel. If you look up Disability Mobility Initiative, there's some videos, um, longer videos uh, with stories from people uh, who have experienced uh, what it's like to get around without driving in our state. Um, our transportation for every transportation access for everyone white paper is also available on our website that pulls together a lot of the policy recommendations from our interviews. And finally, uh, we have some more information about week without driving. There's an image here of some of the social media highlights. You can look at uh, week without driving, hashtag week without driving on um, Instagram or Twitter and maybe even TikTok. Uh, and you can uh, check out some of the content. So I'm going to leave it there and, and thank you again for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Snowtrack. Thank you, Anna, for that insightful presentation. I think that really sets the tone for the rest of our forum and the intersectional, our intersectional nature of accessibility. That's not just increasing frequency for buses, but it's also a whole host of problems that come together and being able to solve those. 
Uh, so before we transition into our next presentation, uh, I believe Brock, you have a survey uh, for everyone to fill out. Uh, and we will share the results of the survey after we get everyone to answer the questions. I think hopefully just pop on your screen should be a quick poll to figure out where everybody's coming from. Um, people kind of rolled in during the keynote, so uh, it's a good opportunity to, to mark uh, to see where everybody's from. And then um, we'll share the results so that way our next presenters can see and know uh, who's all here. Um, and then I will do a uh, a quick sign in sheet as well uh, to follow this up. This is you know three questions, and so um, you'll have to scroll through the results if you want to see them. Uh, we have uh, five people from Everett Mukilteo, five people from South Snohomish County, four from North Snohomish County, three from East Snohomish County, two from Island, Skagit, and Whatcom Counties, uh, 10 from King County, uh, one from Pierce, one from Thurston, one from uh, someplace else in the state, and three from outside of Washington State. Uh, 18 of the folks work in Snohomish County, 17 work outside of Snohomish County. We have great representation from uh, city government, 12 individuals, five from county, four from transit agencies, uh, six from either regional or state government. Um, and we have two from nonprofit advocacy organizations, three consultants, uh, and three other. So uh, that's a great representation. Um, and we know that people will be coming in and out over the next, uh, over this day and tomorrow. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everybody as part of that. Um, I'm gonna pop up the other poll. I'm not gonna share the results, but if you could sign in. Uh, so we have uh, a record of everybody who is here, that'd be great. And I'll just continue to leave this open throughout the day. So next we have uh, Jonathan White from the uh, Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access at the State of oh, State University of New York at Buffalo. I think Jonathan is in the call, but I'll give a brief introduction for Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is a licensed architect in the state of Ohio and has worked for the University of Buffalo Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access Idea Center since 2007. Jonathan believes that built environments must respond to the needs of everyone, allowing all people to be independent and self-sufficient for as long as they desire. Jonathan's experience and extreme attention to detail have made him an expert in accessible and universal design. We'll turn things to Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I got the, the memo on the blue uh, shirt and the blazer here. It looks like uh, Ed and Brock. <laughs> Um, so again, so yeah, my name's uh, Jonathan White. I'm um, with the University at Buffalo's uh, IDEA Center or Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access. I'm coming to you today from uh, New York in a hotel room. I'm here uh, on business all week, so I will be doing uh, transportation without a car here in New York on the public transit system here. So uh, a lot of things to think about uh, there. Um, uh, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what universal design is. Uh, a lot of times people think of it as the same thing as accessibility or design for people with disabilities, and it's not. So we'll, uh, I'm going to give you what that part of it. What is universal design? What are its benefits? What are its goals? How do we define it? And how is it different from accessibility? Uh, I'll also give you the business case uh, for why we should be doing it. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the public transportation um, research that we've done at the IDEA Center. We have... Um, a grant on accessible public transportation. Uh, and so I'll talk to a little bit about some of the research projects that we've done here. And then I'll go in depth on one of those projects in a, in a case study um, that we can talk about. Um, and then uh, we'll summarize and have a little Q&A. Uh, first, a little bit about um, the Idea Center. Our, our mission is to produce knowledge and tools to increase the quality of life for groups who've been marginalized by traditional design practices. So universal design works for everybody, but it works best for people 
uh, who fall outside of that middle part of the bell curve, um, they see the, the greatest benefit. Um, as I talked about, we, we have a grant on accessible public transportation. Um, it's a five year, $5 million grant. Uh, we were first awarded that in 2008. And um, we've gotten it reawarded uh, every five years since, and we're hoping to get reawarded again this year. Uh, and I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll go into some more detail on what some of that is. But uh, so at the Idea Center, we do that sort of research. We also have a grant on universal design, of course. Um, but we also do product uh, design research. Um, you can see the one image there of somebody using a ramp out, uh, in front of a bus that I'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, but also housing design uh, and, and things like that as well. Uh, we do development projects, uh, so maps, tactile maps for people um, with visual impairments that, that, that also help everybody. You can touch it and it'll tell you, it'll speak out loud and tell you where you are in the building or give you verbal directions of where to go. This one is at the Google headquarters. And then development projects in terms of housing design um, and universal design standards. We also do design consulting. Uh, we've done over 1400 um, home modifications for people with disabilities. We also help consult with architects who are designing facilities to make them uh, universally designed. And we audit existing facilities for their usability um, by people with disabilities and, and for general universal design as well. Also for ADA compliance. Um, so let's start by talking what is universal design. Um, I like to start by talking about what it is not, uh, and that is not the same thing as accessibility. Of course, you have to have accessibility to have universal design, but it's not about saying, okay, well, we've provided some accommodation for people with disabilities. Um, we provided this entrance over there somewhere around the back. Um, it's about making sure that everybody can participate equally, um, as equally as they're able to. And so one example I like to show of that is the Hall of Remembrance at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. You can see um, pretty prominently these stairs going down into the space here. Um, and this is a really quiet reflecting area. And they made it accessible by putting this wheelchair platform lift in. Um, and I presume it meets all the, the technical requirements to make it accessible, but it makes a lot of noise. It doesn't look very nice in this space. They spent a lot of money on this space. You can see um, how nice the rest of the space is. And they have this thing sort of just stuck on there, right? So this is accessible, but it's not universal design. Um, it doesn't treat everybody equally and puts uh, somebody who uses wheelchair sort of on this. Uh, it gets unwanted attention to them while using it. Um, and I should talk a little bit about defining disability and how that has changed a little bit over time. So there, there was this old medical model that focused on individual rehabilitation that said the, the focus of the problem is the person, but the new social model says it's about the person environment fit. We're only as able as the environment allows us to be, right? And so you can see uh, there's some people here um, next to these steps. And imagine if all buildings had steps that were as, as tall as these, these are like three times the height of normal steps. We would all have difficulty using them or um, a lot of people would have difficulty using them. And so it's not that, oh, you can't climb a step that's really tall. It's the steps are designed to be too tall. Um, well, some people can't use steps at all. Um, and so it's about how, how are we designing the environment to fit? So let's talk a little bit about what universal design is. Now that we know what it's not. Um, universal design is a process that enables and empowers a diverse population uh, by improving human performance, health and wellness, and social participation. In short, universal design makes life easier, healthier, and friendlier for all people. Um, and you might notice that the idea center is not the UDIA center. It's, um, we use the term inclusive design. Um, and both terms really describe the same concept and philosophy and, and we use them interchangeably. Um, design for all is another uh, term used in Europe to describe the same thing. Um, we like the term inclusive 
because uh, sometimes people hear universal and they think like a universal fit, you know, jumpsuit or <laughs> universal fit glove, and then it fits everybody poorly, right? Um, and instead of thinking of it universal as in the universal sense, but that's the term our funders use is universal design, but we like inclusive design because it really gets at, at what we mean. Um, but so if I jump back and forth and, and use these two terms, uh, don't be shocked by that. Uh, so we developed eight goals of universal design. Um, and here's the, that uh, definition again. Um, and there's these three improvement areas, right? It improves human performance, health and wellness, and social participation. And so within each of these, um, we've, we've organized several goals. So the first one is body fit, accommodating a wide range of body sizes and abilities. This is um, a water play area that used to be at the, the Pittsburgh uh, Children's Museum. And so everyone can dry off after water play, they would have these uh, hand dryers at all sorts of different heights that could rotate and, and people could dry off. Um, and then they eventually replaced this with ones that had um, these tubes, that almost like vacuum tubes that would blow hot air and you can move them around. But of course that required greater use of your hands, um, but it, it was a, lot, a little more precise. And so there's, there's some trade-offs, right? There's no one right answer to what is um, necessarily the best design. There's always going to be um, some sort of trade-off um, and we can design to accommodate as many people as possible. Um, the next is comfort, keeping demands within desirable limits of body function and perception. You know, I tried to find some transportation related uh, images to go with this one, um, but there's not a whole lot of comfortable looking, um, looking seats out there on, on the internet and uh, that we found for, for public transit. Um, but it's, it's, the, what this image shows in an office building, it's not just about seats, it's, it's about acoustics, it's about lighting, it's about temperature. Um, and so that's, that's what this idea is showing here. There's this, the many different levels of lighting, there's task lighting at the desk, there's lighting up above, they've put um, some sort of sound baffling with the acoustic tiles here, and then they have adjustable seating uh, to make sure people are comfortable. Right, so the first part is about fitting, and the next part is about um, being comfortable, uh, right? Not just fitting, but also being comfortable while you're there. Uh, the next is awareness, ensuring critical information for use is perceived easily. So here, there, there are tactile guides on the floor uh, through this wide open lobby that that direct people to the to the reception desk, um, and these are often found in transportation stations um, in Tokyo, for example, that help guide people. Um, to where they need to go, because um, if you use a cane, uh, the, the, the toughest part are these wide open areas where it's tough to know exactly which direction you're going. And so these give you a spot to go. And then they have like these little um, dots on the floor that uh, tell you to stay back and wait your turn at the desk, right? So you're not just walking straight into the, the person in front of you at the desk. Um, so they give a little waiting area as well. Uh, understanding is the next goal. Uh, making methods of operation and use intuitive and clear. So it's not just being aware of the information you need, but then being able to actually make sense of it. So in New York, uh, the newer subway cars, in addition to the verbal announcements, uh, ideally automated verbal announcements. So it's not um, the sound of, of the trained operator like eating the microphone. It's, it's uh, you know, pre-recorded, um, but they have this visual guide uh, as to what the next stop is, what the connections are, what the next 10 stops and then further stops down the line are, and then the last stop. And before this, uh, if anyone's ever been on the uh, subway in New York, um, you know, they would have just that one route line, but you didn't necessarily know where you were on the line if you weren't from there. Uh, you didn't necessarily know that, yes, the Jamaica station, that, that's the last stop on the line, and that's north of here. You didn't necessarily know that if you weren't from the area. Um, you, you don't know what the last stop is on the line. Um, and so this really helps everybody uh, find their way a little bit better. Wellness, contributing to health promotion, avoidance of disease and hazards. So this is about uh, safety and encouraging alternate forms of transportation, encouraging public transit use, uh, and making that last mile a bit easier to um, maneuver for everybody, right? Uh, so whether you're rollerblading or taking a bicycle or just walking to the bus stop, having um, some, some space to do that and having traffic calming measures. Again, this is New York 
where they've converted a lot of streets to provide um, extra space for these sorts of activities. And then they've provided, uh, you can see these large plantings and, and um, large stone objects to prevent vehicles from driving into that area. Um, that just makes it a lot, a lot easier to use for everybody. Uh, social integration, treating all groups with dignity and respect. Uh, if you've ever been to an airport, you you see, um, you know, you're, you're there and then there's a cart driving down uh, with somebody who um, maybe uses a cane is in the cart uh, and that cart is beeping as it's going through uh, the crowds in the airport. But in Detroit, they've got, you know, this tram that runs all the way through the terminal to provide this alternate means and it helps everybody, right? It's not this special separate system for people. Um, so we've got several different modes here and people can choose the mode that they want. And of, co of course, they still have the, the, the carts as well. Um, personalization, incorporating opportunities for choice and expression of preferences. I put the, the phone here, um, the iPhone as an example that um, a lot of transit agencies now have apps that help people um, uh, you know, navigate. And it was actually one of our projects we worked on um, as well. Um, but being able to put in your preferences, right? Right now I'm, I'm in New York and I'm, I don't have the app because I'm not from here. Um, and, and just trying to navigate using Google, I don't know, uh, because I don't have my preferences put into, the, into some sort of app. I don't really, uh, there's all sorts of mistakes that, that happen along the way. Um, like standing there waiting for the M train um, and then seeing the J train go by and, and seeing my stop uh, in the J train window go, I could have gotten that one, I guess. Um, and all the Google was telling me to go one stop further and, and to save me a minute of walking, it was going to have me wait on the platform an extra five. So, you know, there's things like that. Well, I could put in my preferences. Well, these, these, this is where I'm going. These are my home. This is what I prefer. Um, um, and have, have different preferences. So the iPhone is really the first example of, in terms of cell phones, being able to put in those sorts of preferences, having an app for everything, their original slogan, right? Ha there's an app for that. Uh, so you could personalize the phone in many different ways. Um, and cultural appropriateness, respecting and reinforcing the social and environmental context. And that can mean different things in different places. Um, you know, here in, 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 in this picture here from Buffalo, we say, um, uh, you know, access to outdoors, especially when it's cold for six months out of the year um, is a great thing. But what they've done here is they provided means for everybody to get out on the ice um, by providing these walkers and ice bikes for people who might not be able to skate. Uh, that allows, you know, a great, I, I wouldn't say everybody, a greater number of people to be able to enjoy this experience and so that grandmothers can go out with their younger uh, grandkids and, and enjoy the ice as well, or people who maybe aren't comfortable on skates can just get out there on a bike. And so here's how those goals align with um, uh, the, the improvement areas. Um, and so um, there's, there's that as well. All right, so moving on, who, who are some of the beneficiaries of universal design? Um, Children for security and safety. Um, you know, something as simple as having handrails at, at two different heights on stairs, going down into a subway station or up onto a transit platform um, can make things uh, safer for kids. Or having doors uh, on the side of a, a subway platform or transit stop that you know align with the doors on the, on the car so that people don't fall in or get pushed in uh, or in, into the, the pit uh, under the train, um, you know, but especially kids who might not know better or might not know that they can't walk that close to the edge of the platform, right? Um, when you think about stairs, who who's most likely to, to fall on the stairs? Um, perhaps it's a kid. And so having the handrail at that height, uh, you know, might help them. Adults, just in terms of reducing stress and anxiety, it's been a pretty stressful week here so far. And you're trying to get from one place to another, getting here to do the presentation and getting uh, to the next job site and on, on the trains and then not knowing what's going on. It, it can be stressful trying to get around and navigate, especially if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, older people in terms of support for independence, um, you know, if you're living alone um, and you need to just go out to the store, you don't want to have to ask for that help um, all the time. 
Uh, and so, so it helps with independence instead of having to, you know, try to figure it out, um, you know, and have to ask somebody for help. Uh, people with disabilities, again, in terms of support for independence. People of varied uh, statures, um, people who are maybe are left-handed, um, who have chemical sensitivities. These are all people who can benefit from universal design. People with invisible disabilities like uh, PTSD, epilepsy, um, people in low resource settings, such as people um, without homes, people who are victims of disasters or conflicts who've been displaced. Uh, I think you get the idea by now that, that we're all beneficiaries of universal design. And whether it's something permanent or something temporary, we can all benefit. The people who benefit the most though, are, are people who are in one of those uh, populations who design is often excluding. So let's take a look now at the business case for universal design. I like to start with this example um, from Boston. This is on the T, the red line uh, in Boston. And they, at, at some point they went through and they replaced all those old turnstiles with these uh, gates, these uh, motorized gates. And in order to fit more gates into the station, they ordered a bunch of narrow gates and then they put one wider gate at the end of the row that with the accessibility symbol for people who use wheelchairs. And what they found is that this gate kept breaking down because it was so overused that the mechanism inside would go faster. And then the station would become completely inaccessible to people with disabilities. Um, and, and so what they found was that they could have just put these wider gates in everywhere. Everybody liked using these wider gates, people with strollers, people with bicycles, pulling luggage, or people just wanted more room, um, you know, even just carrying a backpack instead of bumping into stuff. If they had put these everywhere, it would have cost a little bit more up front because the wider gates are more expensive. Um, but they found that the cost of having to keep repairing that one gate um, was a lot higher in the, in the long run than if they had just put them in everywhere initially. And then if one of them did break down, the station would have still been accessible. Uh, and then there's also the confusion here in terms of when we talk about awareness and stuff, this gate says reduced fare. Uh, I'm not sure how much that contributed to people wanting to use that gate, but if you're approaching a, uh, the, the gate with um, you know, your fare card or your phone or whatever it is, and you see this one says reduced fare, you might as well try it, right? So I don't know how much that actually contributed to it breaking down more often, um, but that could be something as well. People, in this case, people with disabilities had a special fare card where they had a reduced uh, fare. Um, and so some of the other business case though for universal design. So one is uh, market broadening, expanding your reach to a diverse and global population. Um, the changing demographics of the marketplace make it right for universal design. Um, and the demand will grow over time as people, as the population uh, skews older, as people are living longer. Um, people might not call it universal design. They might not demand universal design. They just want products and environments um, that work for them and the people they live with and that, that they care about. Relative advantage increasing competitiveness and providing a social branding opportunity. Um, investing in social capital is goodwill to the community and it's a social branding opportunity. It also has less risk of failure. Universal designs, they're more thought through. We've thought through different, we've talked to different people uh, different, uh, with different needs um, and, and they consider the end users needs the most. So it helps avoid some of the unexpected negative results of innovations. Um, and so again, there are also investments in social capital, capital saying, hey, we're, this is goodwill to the community. Our transit system works for all people. It's good marketing, just like saying, hey, our product is good for the environment. We see a lot of times they're going around and uh, taking buses and they're doing um, buses with alternative fuels um, and that sort of thing to say, hey, look, we're being uh, conscious of the environment. And they do that um, not just not just out of altruism, but to, it's, a, it's a branding thing. It's a marketing thing to say, look, we're being good for the environment. We're trying to help. Um, uh, your, your transit dollars are being well used. 
Um, and so enhancements that uh, to transit agencies that help safety, that help promote, um, you know, ridership, uh, that help say we're being inclusive of all people uh, is, is great for, for, for branding as well. And, and again, helps uh, increase competitiveness. Um, risk mitigation um, helps increase productivity while reducing operating costs and reducing errors. Um, universal design can reduce the burden of customer assistance, minimize absenteeism, facilitate customer service, again, and, and reduce errors, can reduce operating costs, can help attract and retrain work workforce, lower accident rates, lower healthcare and reno renovation costs. We talk about life cycle costs with that, those transit gates, can reduce worker injury and reduce liability. When you look, this train here has got these steps coming off of it, and of course, with no handrail and the steps fold in. And then there's one platform all the way down at the end that the, the wheelchair users use um, uh, that has a nice safe uh, ramp with handrails and, uh, and all of that. And so think about the potential for lawsuits, right? Uh, uh, people coming out and slipping on these stairs, right? Reducing that. What about putting, he heating pavement, putting heated pavement in? Yeah, it might cost a lot up front, but now we don't have to plow it uh, as often or, or get people out there shoveling the snow. And if they don't do it fast enough, somebody slips and falls. You have to put out salt and then the salt pits the concrete and you have to replace the concrete more often and creates potholes and, and other things. Um, some worker throws their back out shoveling the snow on, on, on the ramp. All right, so there's all these other things to, to think about as well. Making the environment safer for everybody, including employees, uh, helps reduce risk. Uh, and compatibility with other business goals. Having a unique and seamless user experience promises a higher rate of return. If somebody goes to a transit system and they get on the bus and they say, you know what, I'm never doing that again. That was terrible, <laughs> right? But then they don't want to support future investments in public transportation, right? Um, and so, but if you can create an experience where it's great to use, like if you go overseas and uh, get on get on a train, they're, they're vast, uh, public transit network there, and you see how well it runs and how efficient it is, you come back here and you say, wow, why can't we have that here? And so um, people would be more likely to support uh, something if it's, if it's well run um, and, and seamless. Um, and and that's, a, that's a goal of a lot of places to create this uh, unique uh, customer and end user experience. Um, and, and by creating these new experiences with the public, uh, it, it, it's higher rate of return gas, but also, um, again, people uh, supporting future investments in public transit. Um, so we, a lot of times when we talk about universal design, say, okay, that all sounds great, uh, but what's it gonna cost to do universal design? And the, well, well, that's an important question. It's, it's often um, the wrong question to ask because the answer is always the same thing. It's, well, you get what you pay for. Um, the more important question is one, one of value. What's the economic benefit of adopting universal design? Cost is always important because projects have a budget, uh, but there are priorities in every project as well. Um, and, and we establish what those priorities are based on our values. And so uh, the most obvious example um, are sports arenas, landmark arts venues, or even landmark transportation hubs, like the one I showed earlier of the one um, here in New York. Um, and and in, in these cases though, like in the case of the sports uh, stadium, this Olympics, uh, abandoned Olympic stadium, I should point out, um, you know, a lot of public money was invested with questionable economic returns for the community, right? Created a lot of jobs to build the stadium, had tourism money for the stadium. Um, but they're seeing now that a lot of places that, that host the Olympics have these big empty stadiums sitting around now. Um, but the idea is that the public values these things, or at least the elected representatives value these things. Research and experience shows that accessibility features cost well under 1% of all new construction costs. While universal design features can add to that, because they're not mandated by law, they can be selected strategically to address important project priorities that have high value 
to a transit agency and its users. Innovative solutions can be selected that give a lot of bang for the buck and that simultaneously support other non-inclusive design goals of a project. Um, so this is an example of the Hayden Planetarium at the Rose Center for Earth and Space at the American Museum of, Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, here, um, there's a ramp that leaves the planetarium um, that has an exhibit on a timeline of the universe. It has different stages along that ramp. And as you, you walk, you're progressing through um, the, the timeline of the universe. And there's different exit points for this ramp. There is still choice because you can still use the elevator or stairs to get up uh, and out of there if the ramp is too long for you. Um, but they said, you know what? Hey, it's kind of, it, it fits um, with, with our mission here. It kind of almost looks like rings around a planet too, right? So they're, they chose a universal design option that also helps them address other important things, the aesthetics of it, having this sort of futuristic planetary looking exhibit they they then put an exhibit on it so it's not just about circulation it's this exhibit as well sometimes the value of universal design is obvious like in a supermarket no one questions using automatic doors because they obviously benefit everyone including the employees and have direct economic benefits they reduce congestion at entries they reduce accidents and they reduce the need for staff to help customers and all this can be quantified uh, because one could say the same thing about um, transit vehicles, right? Having automatic doors. Imagine if everybody who gets on the bus had to open the door themselves, right? Like you do in a passenger car, <laughs> how much time that would waste, right? And so those are really a universal design to have these automated doors. Um, all of that can be, can be quantified. Sometimes though, um, the value is not so easy to quantify be uh, in the design phase uh, because difficult decisions need to be made without a whole lot of good information, like a small project, like a bus shelter. A design team will make decisions about the resources. What's the best investment for the project? Can we make it, you know, can we increase levels of comfort and security or maybe a more iconic form, something that you see and um, you know, looks really cool. Both are difficult to quantify, but the first produces more social capital because it can lead to increased ridership, increased revenue. If the transit station is comfortable for people, if it's, if it's heated, if it has seating, if it has lighting, if it has Wi-Fi, whatever it is uh, that can make that, that better. Um, and, and again, support future investments in public transit by demonstrating that the agency cares about the user's experience. And a lot of times this social capital aspect is often overlooked when priorities are established. But I should also point out that that example that I just gave you um, is what, you know, in logical argumentation, they call a false choice. Um, sometimes when people talk about universal design saying, ah, you know, it's too much money or, or whatever it is, um, they include false choice arguments. So the idea that we have to spend money on comfort and security as opposed to this iconic form is a false choice because an iconic form doesn't necessarily increase costs uh, and neither does universal design have to. A creative design team can produce an iconic form for very little cost, if anything. And the same can be true for comfort and security features, right? You've got a budget and then decide, okay, what do we value the most, right? So what does all this mean? Rather than talk about cost, we'd like to talk about uh, value. It's not because universal design is necessarily more expensive. It can be, uh, but can also be done within, within that same budget. And that's why we, we like to talk about the value before the cost question comes up. Um, so universal design is not about these add-on features that are going to cost more, but it's instead uh, about finding a better balance of priorities, increasing value over the long term. Uh, increasing the investment in social capital. Um, and because there's no law that mandates universal design, there's a choice of which features to include, right? Nobody's saying, hey, you got to put Wi-Fi in that bus shelter. Um, that's just one other thing that could, uh, you know, make it more usable for people so they can find, you know, their, their transit map on their phone or whatever it is that they need to do um, or get work done while they're waiting for the train and, or, or the bus. 
um, right? So there's, but there's no law that says you have to do that thing in particular, right? Um, and so you get to choose what you, you want to do. Um, finally, uh, it's, it's important not to confuse the cost of the mandated accessibility features with universal design features. Accessibility is required by law. Um, and so you, they have to get done anyway. So for example, um, larger clearances for wheelchair access should be provided uh, if you're thinking about universal design. Um, this chart here shows this, this dotted line just above that 59 inch mark for manual and power wheelchair users to make a 180 degree turn. Those of you familiar with um, architectural design are familiar with the, that circular wheelchair turning space that they put in that 60 inches. And um, so, but if you increase it to 67 inches, now instead of accommodating um, just over 75% of manual and power wheelchair users, you're accommodating over 95%. The cost of universal design then is just that extra seven inches. It's not the full 67 inches. So, um, and it doesn't mean that now our buses are all seven inches longer, right? Um, or now all of our transit stops are seven inches longer. You can create a, a more, you know, depending on the entry uh, and whatever, you can create more efficiencies in the, in the layout and the planning of it. All right, so that's um, the short version of what um, uh, universal design is. I think I, I left enough time here. Okay, great. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the public transportation projects that, that we've done at the Idea Center and some of the, the research that, that we've done. Uh, first, just to set the stage a little bit, what are some of the current barriers? I think you heard about some of them already, um, uh, but obviously transportation plays an important role in creating an accessible society because it's critical for ensuring participation of people with disabilities in employment, citizenship, social roles, education, and recreation. We're going to vote, as was pointed out earlier. Um, um, but millions of Americans experience transportation barriers. Um, they're exponentially worse for people with disabilities who have a more frequent need uh, for health care, uh, require greater access to transportation, or have lower incomes, as was pointed out. Lyft and Uber don't, don't always cut it, right? Um, and there's approximately 3.6 million people with disabilities who cannot leave their homes because of transportation difficulties. Uh, that was as of 2018. Um, and those who are able to leave their home represent 40% of the 15 million people in the US who have inadequate access to transportation. Limited fixed route bus service areas, physical barriers, um, and poor information access often prevent um, large sections of society from using bus uh, or rail systems. And these barriers to access increase demand and cost for paratransit or door-to-door -door service, which is the most expensive form of accessible transportation and a major burden for a lot of transit operators. And even though paratransit services provide a vital link to uh, these community activities and employment, uh, a lot of people with disabilities report many barriers to effective service, such as scheduling issues and long wait times. We saw that firsthand when we did a lot of our research at the Idea Center. We brought in a lot of people with disabilities to the, to the Idea Center and it's really tough to schedule when uh, paratransit gives you a, a two to three hour arrival and pickup window, um, you know, and, you know, we compensate people for their, you know, for their, you know, their role in the study, but this, you know, an extra two hours waiting um, in Buffalo, no less, um, you know, is, isn't great. Um, and so um, automated vehicles um, are something that, I imagine will happen uh, in my lifetime. Um, they have the potential to reduce the dependency for people who cannot drive themselves. Uh, and it's a good target market for the early adoption of, of automated vehicles because the cost of transporting dependent groups is so high in both human capital and operating costs. So if systems are designed for these groups, if automated vehicles are designed for these groups, um, they'll most likely address a lot of the other uh, the issues that other riders might face who, who maybe don't have a disability and could be a good testing ground for technologies for the broader market. So uh, that's all just to say, you know, automated vehicles might help provide 
um, some access that that last link in the in the system um, or help you know in terms of paratransit services or something like that. And as and and as these technologies are being developed, we need to make sure that they're accessible. Um, otherwise, we'll be dealing with the same issue we're dealing with now with you know trains, for example, that it's really difficult to upgrade um, a transit platform in an old city, especially like Boston or New York, where, you know, I said, oh, it'd be great if they had doors on the edges of the platforms. Well, why don't they do that? It's not just because they're saying, oh, it's expensive, we got a lot of train stations, but it's also, well, depending on the cars and how old the, the train cars are, the doors are in different locations. And so they won't line up with the doors on the platform or just getting, um, in, in Boston, there was, I think it was the green line had, uh, had the train, uh, you had to actually use steps to board the train, um, except like the last car or something like that had, had a platform or a lift uh, in a lot of stations. And they said, well, we can't just put new platforms in at all the stations because then we have to get new train cars. <laughs> so it, 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 you know, it becomes a, an, an issue. So, or you're, you're dealing with these legacy issues. So, um, when it comes to automated vehicles, we don't, we don't want to repeat that mistake. We want to make sure that the vehicles are as accessible as possible from the start. That we're thinking of the needs of everybody. Um, so I'm going to go over today a few different uh, research projects that we did. One uh, was on the fixed route large bus. It was on our RERC APT. Uh, we did that, uh, like I said, from 2008. Um, uh, fixed route large bus uh, paratransit. Uh, optimizing accessible public transit um, grant, uh, ride hailing, improving the demand uh, for responsive transportation for all and the Toyota social mobility project and autonomous vehicles and semi-autonomous vehicles uh, as well. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those. Um, I don't know if I actually get to the ride hailing or not. I'm not sure about that. So the fixed route, uh, the fixed route bus. So um, here's a different image of that bus that we saw earlier. Um, uh, we had it built in our lab. Uh, basically, we took one of the, the buses um, that our local transit agency had, and we, we built a, a full-scale mock-up of that bus with a few little tweaks uh, to it. And of course, it was all open so we could see through it with our motion capture cameras. Um, and, and we, uh, there's, a, there's a few little tweaks in the design here. So that fare box, uh, we designed exactly how the fare boxes are, but then we said, you know, what if, what if we cut it in half and it, did, it wasn't on a pedestal to the floor. So we made that part, part removable. Uh, and then you can see on the wheel wells, uh, there are extra uh, panels on there. So well, what if we could make the wheel well just a little bit narrower and see, would that improve usability? Um, and the seats are all removable as well. Um, so getting in and out of vehicles, that's one of the most serious challenges um, uh, by people who use wheel mobility devices. Uh, the low floor bus has reduced the need for assistance in boarding for this group. Uh, but a challenge for the industry is the development of, of very low floor vehicles or kneeling features that reduce the ramp slope required for boarding to the point where all riders manage without assistance. Um, uh, what you're seeing on the screen here, uh, we tested ramp slopes. We did it outside of the bus. We did have a ramp on the bus as well, but it was easier to, to, to measure outside of that. Um, and of course we couldn't build a full size kneeling bus. So we had a platform that actually raised to mimic the sort of kneeling uh, height of the bus to change the ramp slope. And then you can see he's got all these little red dots, little red lights on them. And that's, that's for the motion capture camera. So we brought everybody through the bus and um, you, could, you could map, you know, how they moved through, through the bus and, and could time that as well. Um, and, and these ramps, they make it really safer for all people as well. And that's part of it too. Um, you know, whether you're using cane walkers, kids, that sort of thing, and just making sure that there's enough space for the bus to pull right up to the sidewalk so that the, the ramp can deploy properly. Um, you know, reducing dwell time is a huge thing with transit operators, as you probably know. Um, and so if the, the door is open and the ramp just, you know, flips out and everybody uses it, um, you don't have that extra dwell time for people who, uh, who use real mobility devices. Um, it was at 
Disney recently and they had their their shuttle buses and you know it was a, it was a bit of a process when the bus would show up and somebody uh, used a wheelchair they had to not open the doors the bus driver had to get out had to turn you know press a button or turn a key to deploy the ramp at the back of the bus let the wheelchair user in secure them well we'll talk about securement in a minute as well um close that ramp and then everyone else came into the front of the bus and it really takes took you know a lot of time um uh, but going back uh, to the ramp we tested a few different conditions uh we started with the the lowest slope first one to twelve uh you know I think this is out of order here. Uh, that one to six and one to eight should be flipped. Uh, one to 12, one to eight, one to six, and one to four. Um, oh, well, actually that, that is right. I don't know why they're, uh, they're transposed like that. The, the images aren't in order. Um, but uh, so we tested all these different ramp slopes to see you know, what was safe. Because we know that one to 12 is what we use in buildings. Um, but for a bus, the ramp is usually a lot shorter. And so people can sometimes handle that. I'll tell you now, one to four um, is really difficult. Uh, you can see how far forward this person is leaning. Uh, and if if you don't lean forward far enough, you tip right over backwards. One to six was also pretty difficult as well. And so we got to make sure that the, are the bus is able to kneel low enough. Is the ramp able to flip out uh, and get to those slopes? So here's the results from that study. Um, showing, uh, you know, uh, their, their score, their different, there's basically a difficulty grading score here. How easy or difficult was it uh, for people who are you know, visually impaired, use a scooter, walking aid, manual and power chairs, and so on. And you see that one to four, is all, they're all pretty low there at the beginning. And as you go up to one to six, uh, they come up a little bit. You can see manual wheelchair users still struggling there. Uh, one to eight seem to be okay. Um, you know, it's not, not a great score, but the one to 12 was really the best spot uh, for those. Uh, we also took a look at vehicle interiors. Um, our research, we found, um, we find that the current buses are not adequately designed for easy use by people with disabilities. Wheelchair users have difficulty getting access to the securement area. Uh, people who are blind cannot find empty seats easily and are embarrassed by, you know, running into other riders. Uh, and there's not enough room to stow walking aids and packages or service animals um, out of the way. And a lot of people have difficulty with fare payment. Uh, so we did a few different test conditions of the vehicle interior, um, re reconfiguring the seating layouts, access ramps. Uh, we put in mannequins um, to occupy seats to simulate crowding. And you can see different uh, conditions here. Uh, where we've got all forward facing seats that, that two rows sort of, uh, you know, two seats all facing forward in, in two separate rows. You've got the, the seating where they all face off to the side. And then we've got the wheelchair securement, securement towards the, you know, in the front and then in the middle uh, with the ramp uh, toward the back. And you can see where the, the different boarding zones are uh, as well. Um, so layout one, uh, you board and and disembark from the front ramp and the wheelchair space was closer to the front. Layout two, you would board from the back, uh, secure yourself near the near the back and then exit through the front so you don't have to turn around. And then layout three, uh, boarding and disembarking was from, from the rear. Um, And there was the you know randomized crowding conditions and all that. So uh, a participant would experience both crowding conditions of one layout before proceeding, uh, and they would practice the next layout. Uh, and they they ranked these layouts in terms of preference. One is the most preferred, and three was the least preferred. Um, and again, we recorded these uh, using conventional video cameras and and our motion capture. Um, so. We found that there's uh, too much, uh, too narrow of a space toward the front of the bus coming in off the ramp and then trying to turn around the wheel well. Uh, an inadequate turning space with a second wheelchair on board. So if there were two wheelchair securement areas, um, it was, uh, you know, and one of them was occupied, there was inadequate space. The longitudinal seats were less desirable um, and increased the risk of injuring others. And there was limited reach capability uh, um, among the wheel mobility users. Um, let's see, trying to use the uh, fare box there. 
Um, so now let's move into uh, our, our studies on securement. We looked at, um, obviously for the safety of everybody, wheelchairs uh, and scooters need to be secured in the vehicles for safety reasons. Um, the current approach is the manual approach. It's standard, it's standard practice. Uh, it's ineffective. Only 30% of the users are properly secured, even though the drivers do most of the securement. We actually had uh, an issue in one of our studies where we were, uh, I'm not talking about this study today, but part of our study was uh, taking people on guided tours of the local transit system. And um, we had somebody who was secured in the wheelchair by the driver and they tipped over as the bus rounded uh, a corner coming to the stop. And then, you know, they, they were okay. Um, but, you know, it always, you know, makes your heart stop a little when you're doing a research study and uh, something like that happens. And so uh, it was just, a, you know, an example of, of how um, these things can be difficult to secure. There's an automated system available, but it requires facing backward, uh, which people don't like. Um, um, and also a shoulder belt, and it's far more expensive. Um, but the success of any automated vehicle technology that's covered by the ADA, like shuttle buses or shared van services, ultimately depends on developing a system that can be used independently and ideally is front-facing because passengers prefer to see where they're going. Um, but there's also an issue with private automated vehicles. How can they be adopted for independent use? There are systems already developed that work, even for the most seriously... Um, even for people with the most serious disabilities. Um, uh, securement uh, is an issue for all passengers, right? Um, if, if there's an accident or you know, that bus just turning a corner and somebody tips over, yes, the wheelchair user is injured, but somebody else can be injured as well. And then who's liable if a passenger, let's say if it's an automated vehicle, uh, doesn't use the seatbelt when the device is difficult to use, right? Um, proper securement of children is an issue as well. Um, so it's a, it's a universal problem. Um, it's not just about helping people with disabilities. It's about making sure everybody's safe uh, on the vehicle. Um, so let's take a talk, uh, talk about these different uh, securement systems that we tested. Um, the securement type had a significant effect on the securement time, the dwell time. Um, and significant differences were found between each securement type. The four point system took significantly longer to secure than the Q pod, uh, which is pictured in the middle there. And um, the quantum, pictured all the way in the end, was significantly faster than both the four point and Q pod systems. Let me tell you a little bit about what some of these are since you can see the, the, the pictures on the screen here. So uh, the four point, uh, is the pretty common one that's used. Uh, and you can see uh, at the ground, there's red arrows indicating where the securements are that requires the driver to, to, to bend over and, and secure them and reach around uh, to, to secure the wheelchair user. We found a lot of times there's a lot of uh, physical contact involved in this. Uh, this study was done all before COVID as well. So I can't imagine how uncomfortable some people might be now <laughs> with it. Um, but I mean, you know, you've got a bus driver who might be a larger person and a wheelchair user who's a larger person. There's a, there's a lot of body contact going on trying to secure um, some of these securement systems. Um, the Q-Pod there is in the middle. It just has two bottom points, but then has a shoulder harness. So again, that requires reaching over the body. The Quantum all the way on the right um, has this rotating arm. So there's one that's already fixed in the down position indicated by the red line. The wheelchair user backs up um, to, to that system and then the other arm folds down and then squeezes in. And so it holds the chair in place that way. Um, so this, uh, so, so uh, there's a significant effect on the overall time for ingress, securement and egress. Um, and the comparison revealed that the total time to use the quantum was significantly faster than the other two. There was no significant difference in the total time between the Q-Pod and the four point. In terms of um, the usability ratings that people gave, um, we have ease of use, low embarrassment, low unwanted attention, low safety risk, independence, low mistakes, time efficiency, low mental effort, and low physical effort 
are all plotted on these charts here. And these are in the same order as was pictured before, the four point, the three point, and then the, uh, the quantum, the self, I say, I forget what this essay stands for, self something, uh, self automated. And um, you can see how much larger of the area um, people agreed with those statements that it was a low safety risk, low, uh, you know, high time efficiency and that sort of thing. And so the larger area of this graph that you see, the better the design was. And then we're seeing from manual power and scooter users, those are the different colors that you're seeing there on the screen. Uh -um. Um, let me go through a few more of these. Um, there were statistically significant effects on ease of use, physical comfort, time efficiency, assistant needed, and unwanted attention. And each user group had a statistically significant effect on ease of use and, and mental effort. Um, and it's just here's some, uh, just another uh, view of that, another comparison uh, view of that. Uh, let's see here. I'm not sure why this one was different. Okay. Shared autonomous vehicles. So, um, We, we were at looking at a few questions here on our campus. We had this autonomous vehicle, like this little autonomous bus that was moving around. And we wanted to study a few things with this. Um, the first uh, was what benefits and challenges to the community um, to the, the, of mobility users, um, what, what challenges do they perceive that they will experience, right? You start talking about automated cars and everybody says, I'm gonna have, the, this is what I fear with automated cars, kind of like it is with any sort of new technology, right? People are like, okay, but here's where I see the problem coming. Um, the next is what factors would influence people with disabilities to use or avoid using a semi-autonomous vehicle or a shared uh, autonomous vehicle? What accessibility features on these vehicles do people with disabilities need and prefer? What are the benefits and challenges to providing accessibility to these for manufacturers? And what operating practices do transit agencies need to employ to enable safe uh, vehicle usage by people with disabilities? Um, I think a lot of times there's this tendency for people to think, oh, they're great. The transit agent is gonna come up with a semi-autonomous vehicle. In other words, there's gonna be nobody there to help me. <laughs> and so um, you know, how are we making sure that it's staying safe? How are public works departments preparing for the implementation of semi-autonomous vehicles? Um, if they're relying on, you know, making sure that the paint on the ground has been uh, uh, put down and it is, if, if the vehicle is using the paint striping on the ground to, to see, and that's not, re, you know, replaced or there's large potholes in the ground um, that, that aren't being repaired, you know, how does that affect the vehicle usage? Um, and safety. And then how are, you know, and then the vehicle hits a pothole and breaks down and then what happens? Um, and then how are government agencies and standards organizations protecting the needs of people with disabilities in the industry? So if we're going to develop these technologies, how are they being protected? Um, and so we did some research. Uh, this is sort of a, uh, what I just went through here on the, on the past side, what, what features would not just the people with disabilities, but older adults need? Uh, how are transit agencies preparing? Uh, and what practices do they need? Um, how can we work with industry partners to help create and evaluate the designs of these vehicles? And can we develop universal design guidelines that can be applied to help overcome those challenges of the first and last mile challenges? Because that's where these vehicles would be um, probably used is, is for that last mile for the first and last mile. Um, <clears throat> okay, so moving on to a, a case study, um, factors influencing fixed route transit decision-making and exploring the differences by disability and community type. So basically the issue is looking to address the problem. How do we ensure that both quality paratransit services, um, how do we ensure that, that we have both quality paratransit services and accessible fixed route services, right? Um, 
there's sort of this, this balancing act that needs to occur where you want to have you want to have the transit system as a whole as accessible as possible. The more accessible that system is, the less people rely on paratransit. But that means there's less money going into the paratransit. You know, there, there's there's less riders of the paratransit, um, and so we don't want to see people then decrease this. You know, or transit agencies decrease the services towards paratransit. Well, people aren't riding it. People aren't using it as much, right? Well, some people really still depend on it, um, even as the other services become more accessible, um, as fixed route services become more accessible. Um, so. As an overview, transit agencies utilize um, the following initiatives to encourage greater fixed route transit usage. One, uh, again, implementing more rigorous uh, paratransit eligibility determination practices. So that's one way that transit agencies are um, enc encouraging greater use of these, uh, of uh, let's just say a, a regular bus, a city bus, right? Uh, the other way is to address the factors that deter people with disabilities from using the fixed route transit. And so this research that I'm gonna talk about now in this case studies, uh, looks at that last, uh, that last part, addressing what factors deter people from using fixed route transit. Um, and uh, how we did it is we, we used previously conducted survey data to determine what are the most important factors that people with disabilities consider when deciding to use these various options and how these factors change by disability and community type. So again, we, we use previously collected data from um, something called the Transit Cooperative Research Program or TCRP project, uh, National Survey of People with Disabilities um, to examine the relationship between two sociodemographic variables, disability and community type. And again, the factors influencing their transit making decision by people with disabilities. The survey also addressed how people with disabilities rated the importance of 13 factors that influenced fixed route transit decision making uh, that we measured on a five point uh, Likert scale ranging, um, well, you know, ranging from one to five, uh, where one was not important and five was very important. Um, the, the web-based survey was distributed in, in 2012 to participants throughout the US uh, disability community. And the participants from that study were considered ineligible for the second, this secondary analysis um, if they lived in a community that did not provide fixed route service or ADA paratransit service, or if they were unaware that these services existed uh, in their community. And here's a, a little breakdown of the, the demographics from the survey. There were 1,435 US-based people with disabilities. 56.4% um, of them had a mobility impairment. 35.2 had a visual impairment. 26.3 had an intellectual or cognitive disability. Uh, and 13.5% had a psychiatric disability. And if you do the math, you'll say those add up to more than 100. And that's right, because some people had more than one disability. Uh, and they, so, and again, they had to live in a community with both fixed route and a complementary uh, paratransit service, and they had to be aware of the existence of those services. Um, and here's how they broke down by community. Um, large city was about a third of, of the sample. Small city um, was about 30% of the sample. Suburban was 20, let's say 24%. And a small town or rural was about 13% of, of the sample. <clears throat> so uh, in order of importance, um, we, we talked about those 13, um, those 13 variables. I'm gonna show you here some of the top uh, issues that were looked at. Um, so these are the built environment barriers that were uh, identified. And so the, the, the most important um, was barriers in the pedestrian environment getting to and from the stops and stations. So again, that's that first last mile problem, getting to that station. Um, the, the next was distances to or from the stops and stations. So again, getting to and from the station. 
And then the, the next built environment variable, which is actually number six on the list, that, that's why it goes one, two, six, um, was a lack of information about the potential barriers they might encounter, again, getting to and from the fixed route stops and stations. So it wasn't about the stations themselves, it was that, again, that last mile. In terms of scheduling, in order of importance, um, we have fixed route service uh, that doesn't run often enough. Having complex or multiple transfers on fixed route services and uh, fixed route service that doesn't run at the hours that they need to travel, which is sort of like run, not running often enough, um, right? So we heard earlier about well, the, the taxi service doesn't run on Sunday you know, in this town or whatever it is. Same thing happens with, with fixed route services. And so these were um, you know, the top barriers that the people experienced um, running on. So let's take a look at some of the findings um, from this case study. Um, the findings indicate that people with mobility impairments consistently rated the, the built environment factors as more important to their transit mode decision-making than the scheduling factors. Um, and a lot of times transit agencies are focusing on the scheduling issue when um, the built environment issue is more important. And, and you know, it's understandable while well, the transit agencies might say, well, we don't control the sidewalk outside of the of um you know the the bus stop or whatever it is right and so it requires a bit of coordination um we heard earlier um during the keynote about you know just putting that little strip of sidewalk to connect from one point to another uh, is important i there's a bus stop in buffalo right near the university where brand new bus stop new concrete pad brand new sidewalk um and there's a little strip of grass in between that's like uh, a foot or two wide. Well, both sides, the, the people who do the sidewalk and the people who bust up, both of them said, well, that's not my responsibility. That's the off of my, outside of my um, jurisdiction here to provide that little connection. And we have to try to avoid it. You know, it was pointed out earlier, it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, we see the same thing when I do presentations on, um, you know, bicycling and, and having complete streets that, you know, um, just because uh, a county road meets a city road doesn't mean a bike lane can just stop because <laughs> then you're on the bike and then where do you go? And now there's there's no place to go. So um, this, it's the same thing with with transit. It's, it's great that you could have the most accessible public transit service. And if, but if that stops at the bus stop and doesn't get you to that, that polling place, well then, um, it's, it's it's not effective for the people who uh, need it the most. Um, the the findings also highlight the importance of addressing complex trips when assisting riders with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. So again, if you have multiple transfers, um, another example here in, in New York, you know, you've I've got I can I can use Google as well as anybody. Um, to try to find the right route from the trains, but every 30 seconds I could Google the best route and it's going to give me a different route. Some of them will have four transfers um, and it'll put that as the top choice. Here's, here's this route, it's got four transfers and it takes 39 minutes. And here's this other route that has one or two trans, you know, one transfer or no transfers. Oh, but it's, it's three minutes longer. Well, <laughs> I might want that. Uh, choice so that I don't have to remember all these stops and, and, and try to navigate the different stations and, oh, this station isn't accessible to me. I can't put in my, um, my preferences to say I only want accessible stops. I get off the train and I got to go up and across to the other track. Um, so, so you know, that, that's an important issue. The study also reveals that people with disabilities experience barriers differently based on where they live suggesting the need for context sensitive uh, interventions to support fixed route ridership. And transit agencies should utilize this information to employ more targeted interventions to encourage greater fixed, use, uh, fixed route transit usage for people with disabilities. Um, so what's on the screen now, this um, illustrates the ratings of the six important factors. So those six 
uh, of those 13, we narrowed it down to those six that I had just showed you, the built environment, the three built environment issues, and then the, the scheduling ones. And what you're seeing here are the significant differences across the different disability types. So we're looking at those across, and then you're seeing the importance rating, um, a scale of one to five, five being the most important. And so uh, we see that there were significant differences, but you see most of them sort of rated a four here in terms of importance, but mobility, disability, um, built environment, question one and two, there were significant differences. Um, and again, just to refresh your memory, those were the barriers in the pedestrian environment, getting to and from the stops and stations, and the distances to or from the stops and stations. And so that's what you're seeing in that first uh, chunk of, of six there. Uh, then the next, you've got um, blind and visual impairments. You saw there was no significant differences amongst that group um, across these six factors. For intellectual and cognitive uh, disabilities, there was a significant difference saying um, that uh, scheduling two, which is complex multiple transfers on fixed route services. So that's what we, I was just talking about, that the, complex, the complexity there. And then for people with psychiatric disabilities, um, uh, question S1, fixed route service doesn't run often enough, and the fixed route service doesn't run at the hours I need to travel. So we talked about those are the six important factors, but there were significant differences amongst disability group as to which ones are more important for that group as well. Then when we look at um, uh, factors by disability and community type, um, you know, I had, I had a chart for this, but it, it was rather complex, so I figured I'd just sort of summarize it for you uh, in, in bullet points here. Um, uh, so we found that if you had, uh, uh, for people who had a mobility disability um, and were in a small town or rural area, uh, then the service frequency was more important to them than in the suburban areas. Um, we also found that if you had a mobility disability and lived in a small city, that the complex multiple transfers um, were more important than people in small town or rural areas, which makes sense. If you're in a small town or rural areas, there probably isn't that complicated of, of a network where there's a bunch of transfers going on, right? Um, if you had a mobility disability and lived in a small city or a small town or rural, then the service hours were more important than in large cities. Again, sort of makes sense. The bigger cities got transit that's running more frequently, right? Come to New York and, uh, you know, the trains come in every five minutes sometimes. Um, and then it's surprising when uh, you, sh you show up and it's midnight and the Long Island Railroad only goes every hour <laughs> at that point, you know, so uh, consistency is important too. Um, or have, you know, just having access to that information. You, you get on the train, it was coming every 15 minutes, you go to dinner, you come back and, oh, now it's every hour. Um, uh, another issue uh, for people with visual impairments and um, who were uh, in small cities or small towns, um, the service frequency was more important than, than those in suburban areas. And uh, for people with visual impairments and who lived in small cities, the service frequency was more important than in large cities. Um, visual impairments uh, who lived in large and small cities, uh, the complex and multiple transfers were more important than in small town and rural. And again, say probably the same thing with mobility disability here in smaller town and rural areas, it's easy, you know, there's probably fewer transfers to begin with. So they're rating it as less important. Um, and then if you had a visual impairment and lived in a small city, the service hours, again, were more important than in large cities. So you're sort of getting a little window here. They're talking about importance but uh, of the issue, but you're really also getting um, um, it's sort of like a little window into to what is actually happening, right? The, the smaller cities probably have poor, you know, less uh, desirable service hours than a large city. And so people are noting that as more important. Um, you're getting that as well. And so overall, um, people with mobility impairments consistently rated the built environment factors like the path of travel issues 
and build environment barriers and distance to transit stops as more important um, to their transit mode decision-making than the scheduling related factors. Um, in the past, transit providers often addressed built environment areas by, barriers by making bus stop improvements. But more recently, transit agencies and municipalities have become focused on creating streetscapes that improve the first and last mile, the route between an individual's origin and destination and the nearest transit service. And that support uh, supports having diverse transit uh, modes and users. Recent strategies uh, employed to improve the first and last mile include passing complete streets policies, developing design guidelines for transit agency and public works departments, and utilizing um, geographic in information systems, GIS, um, data to inventory and assess environmental conditions and funding improvements for transit stops and the adjacent sidewalks with community development grants. Um, so one of the things we talked about uh, that we had done research on was um, having an app that would allow people to report in real time barriers that they're facing so that they can be addressed. And so this could work not just with the transit system itself, but with that first last mile. I can't get to the transit station at this corner because there's a tree in the middle of the sidewalk that's made the sidewalk all crazy. So I can't get to the transit stop. Um, what you know, whatever those issues uh, might be. Okay. The findings also highlight the importance of addressing complex trips when assisting riders with intellectual and cognitive disabilities, as I've mentioned. Um, it suggests the need to integrate personalized information, including individual needs and their previous trip experiences when developing travel training and trip planning programs for um, these people. Um, technology enhancements could provide real-time updates about built environment conditions and improvements. For example, a team of researchers at the University of Washington and Maryland is seeking to transform how sidewalk accessibility data is collected and visualized using a combination of crowdsourcing and machine learning. This is from something called Project Sidewalk. Um, and it's a new online tool that enables anyone uh, from motivated citizens to government workers uh, to virtually walk through cities and to locate, label, and assess sidewalks. Um, there's something called Open Street um, as well. And I haven't used it yet. It's one of our studies that's going to be coming up. We're going to be assessing uh, using these. And there's basically different um, uh, what would I say? Different, key, you know, keywords and different functions, different label, different tags that you would could could assign to things in the environment. Like there's a barrier here, there's a barrier there, um, and and so there's this open source uh, movement towards towards getting that put together um, to allow people to to collect this data and report it to the the agencies. I can't tell you the number of times I come across something like I just don't know who to contact to report this to. Um, and then um, there's user contributed labels that help create new accessibility friendly mapping tools like route planners and map visualizations to train machine learning algorithms to semi automatically assess cities in the future and create better transparency about city accessibility. Um, and then looking at small city and small town and rural. Um, fixed route scheduling uh, was the greatest challenge for mobility uh, for people with mobility and visual impairments. Um, so they experience um, barriers differently based on based on where they live, suggesting the need for context sensitive interventions again to support uh, fixed route ridership. Uh, issues with the fixed route scheduling again pose greater challenges for people living in small cities and small towns or rural communities, especially those with mobility and visual impairment or blindness. To support increased fixed route transit use by people with disabilities in these regions, transit agencies might consider de developing and implementing flexible transit delivery services. And these services could include transportation network companies, such as Uber or Lyft, um, share car or micro transit, such as privately operated or dynamically rooted or crowdsourced transit service or autonomous vehicles. Um, and this doesn't necessarily, uh, obviously I, we take the point about, you know, paying for this, who pays for that, right? 
Um, not all Lyfts and Ubers are accessible. So it's not necessarily um, that th they shouldn't be the solution, but they could be considered as, as part of, of, of a, you know, they could be part of, of the, the solution. Um, and uh, increased utilization of different shared modes of transportation can grow ridership in public transit, reduce car ownership, and reduce the cost of transportation overall. Providing flexible transit services can increase the level of service, reduce dependency on paratransit, and help overcome some of the, the first and last mile trans, um, challenges by providing, um, by, by transporting riders uh, with disabilities to fixed route stops and stations. Um, so it could, you know, be one uh, tool to help get people to, to the stations, especially in rural communities where it might not even be a sidewalk, right? Um, and, and consumers have shown support and even a preference for some of these new mobility options. Okay, um, so I want to take a little pause. Um, I do have a little bit more to talk about, but I thought now would be a good time to go into um, some of the Q and A uh, before summarizing everything and moving on. So we, you know, I've planned about 15 minutes or so for, um, for questions. Um, uh, and then and then I'll go back into the, the presentation. So I'm going to take a look at the chat here. If anyone has a question and, and would like to, to, to post it to the chat, I know uh, I've gone over a lot between what is universal design and then some of the transit research we've done. I could also talk about some of the other projects that aren't in here as well. <clears throat> We can also Let's have see. people raise their hand and then we can call on them and they can say the, the mic. Yep, that, that sounds great as well if people don't want to uh, post in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, and hand raising. I'm not seeing anything as well, participants. Okay. I should point out too that the study, um, you know, I don't know if I have a link to the study. Um, all of this is, uh, is on our website as well. There's, there's links to, to this research study to get more in depth if you, if you want it as well. And um, there's a website too, rercapt.org is, is our um, transit website. It won't come up at the end, but that's our, our, our website for that. What are, so uh, one question that's come in is, what are some ways you recommend closing the gap between city staff that is responsible for infrastructure and community transit groups uh, responsible for public transportation? Um, and so I, I think one of the ways that, that we see doing that is through um, a coalition of, um, uh, of having you know, community input, you know, input from the community and having all the right stakeholders in the room. Right. And so that people can then decide, well, who's responsible for this or that? Um, and, and even sharing some things like if, if it's some sort of a crowdsourced app that's reporting issues. Well, again, I don't know necessarily as a transit user who I need to contact for A, B or C. But if that all went into one place and then that could then get routed to the appropriate um, people um, you know, who can do that. Um, and, and it's also about, you know, really meeting and getting on the same page, uh, as to what our goals and values are, um, for, you know, for the community. We want to make sure if, if the idea is we want to increase ridership in public transit, um, well, of course the transit agency wants that, but is that, is that the city's goal as well? And what are they doing to, to help with that? Um, But I, you know, I think a lot of it is really that that information sharing thing, where we're getting the right stakeholders in a room, um, and and having the right information, getting to them about where the the issues are, um, instead of both people just washing their hands and saying, "Oh, that's not us. That's not for this meeting." Um, you know, making sure that that we're really listening to what people have to say. And I hope that helps. That's sort of a, an, an easy answer to a difficult question. 
on you know a, a complex question uh, that that I think a lot of cities are dealing with. Is in, so another question is: Is investment in universal design increasing? I would say yes. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, companies, very large companies, uh, investing in universal design for their uh, employees. Uh, we've worked with now either directly or indirectly with three companies who are like in the Fortune 100 um, who've wanted universal design uh, audits um, you know, or tools to help make sure that their facilities worldwide um, are more inclusive um, for their employees. And so to hire um, firms either like us, either directly or indirectly, um, to do these audits, to develop the checklist, to do these audits, um, you know, produce lists and mes metrics so that they can rank their buildings. And, and then the investment that they need to act on what those recommendations are is, is a pretty large investment. Um, I think we're also, we're seeing this, you know, a lot, I think a lot in the business area. Um, I think because people are trying to retain employees and get them back into the office too, I think. Um, so uh, that's, that's um, it really is, is increasing. Um, and, and people want to be able to benchmark it. And I'll show at the end in one of our resources, one of the ways you can do that. Um, I like to, another question here is I like to bring up the turning radius on a ramp of 67 versus 60 uh, at a meeting I'm going to tomorrow. Where can I find that to cite? What study was that in? Um, so that would be on our website in something called our design resources. Um, I will put up the website again at the end that has, it doesn't have the actual study. So, so it was originally our anthropometry of wheel mobility study. It was funded by the US Access Board, um, which is the, the board that does uh, you know, ADA uh, uh, guidelines in, in the US. Um, and there is a link to that full final report on our website um, that I'll put up at the end. So I'll, I'll put up a few different websites as resources that will, that will show that. There are sort of uh, easier graphics too. I think I've got that website up there as well. Next question is how does the US compare with investment in universal design in the public realm with other nations? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Ooh, I, I don't know, uh, I guess is the, is the short answer of saying, I do, you know, um, it really depends on, on the, the other nations, right? Um, in, in, in public transit, obviously other nations do, do, I think, a better job in terms of uh, some of the longer public transit. I think there's a lot of other countries we could learn from in terms of the public infrastructure. Um, where I'm often pulling examples of streetscapes and such from um, some of the Nordic countries um, where bicycling and, and all of that is, is much more prevalent. Um, and then, you know, their transit systems are designed to, to handle that. Um, whether or not you call, they call it universal design. I, I don't, I don't think so. You know, they call it things like design for all, but the problem there is that a lot of, um, for example, Europe would be, I, I would say that the one that could, you know, if anybody's beating us, it would be Europe. Um, they, they've got a lot of really old buildings and old public infrastructure too. And, and they don't have laws like the ADA. I mean, they have some laws, but they don't have laws as comprehensive as the ADA. And so um, there's sort of this, this trade-off where, yes, they're doing really great stuff here, but they're sort of more constrained in some cases by their older uh, infrastructure. So, it's, you know, it's tough to really answer, you know, uh, generally, uh, you know, whether, whether we're, we're matching up as, as well as they are, you know, wholesale. And I don't know if, I don't really know of any study that's looked, you know, across the U.S. 
uh, in all of, let's say the major cities, right? Um, how our, our transit system compares um, to, you know, or, or our public, you know, universal design uh, compares. There was a question from Brian Wood, and maybe I should reframe it a little bit or, or put a different, slightly different explanation on it, which is sure. um, under some federal funding streams, there's a requirement for certain transportation providers, nonprofit public agencies to make sure that the services they are providing are consistent with a transportation human services plan at the local and state levels. Um, and uh, Snowtrack is one of those organizations that develops a, a plan like that for our county. Um, there's also a regional plan and a state plan. Um, I'm so to ask Brian's question, have you seen examples from across the, the country of where those planning exercises or strategies have been useful in bringing together coalition partners uh, to identify um, mobility gaps and to address them from a universal design perspective? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure um, if I'm aware of any. There might be, but I don't, I don't know of them. All right. Um, if anyone does have more questions, I'm sure by the time I get through the summary, if someone, uh, you can keep, uh, keep putting your questions in and I will get to them uh, after this. But uh, going through the summary, I'll, I'll be able to answer a little more in detail. I'll give you some of those websites that will help uh, answer some of those questions, uh, in, you know, more, more fully. Well, there's the Q&A. Um, uh, so our resources, um, there are several publications on inclusive and universal design that we've put out. Um, the first one, Inclusive Design Implementation and Evaluation. It's a really short read, good pocket, pocket architecture uh, series book. It talks about what universal design or inclusive design, as it's called in the book, uh, what that is uh, in the introduction. And it goes through the pre-design, design, construction, and occupancy phases of design projects and talks about all the considerations you would need to do if you're going to do an inclusive design project. And this would work uh, whether you're doing a building or, or if it's transportation related. Um, you can follow these same techniques. You know, who's involved? Who are the key stakeholders? What research are we doing? Um, universe, uh, diversity and design, understanding hidden consequences um, is, uh, you know, a book that we use in our undergrad uh, course here on diversity and design. Uh, and it's about well, exactly what it says, understanding hidden consequences. What are some things that we don't think about uh, in design? Um, you know, an uh, example I like to bring up is one of the things I never thought of um, all my years using a tape measure doing ADA audits, I never realized that, that the numbers are upside down if you're left-handed on a tape measure, right? It's just one of those things I just never thought of. Um, my father was a contractor, he's left-handed, never mentioned it to me. Um, everybody knows about the scissors, um, but that's like one thing I never thought of. And so diversity in design talks about what, are, what could we be missing here and how can we help anticipate unintended consequences? Um, and then universal design, creating inclusive environments uh, is the textbook we use in our graduate course on inclusive design. Um, and that, that goes through uh, in a lot more detail, the, the, the nature of barriers, demographics, um, what universal design is and those, those goals and uh, the history of it. Some people might have heard of something called the principles of universal design. We talk about those. Um, and, and why they, they were helpful for early adopters of universal design, but a little confusing to some people uh, in the broader public uh, and why we helped develop the goals. Uh, and then it goes into different areas and there's a chapter in there on transportation. You know, I should have put in that book too. There is a textbook as well called Accessible Public Transportation um, that is also out now. Um, so that should be pretty easy to, to search, Accessible Public Transportation. Um, our website is idea.ap.buffalo.edu. If you go to that projects tab, um, you should uh, be able to find, it's called the Anthropometry of Wheel Mobility Report. That's the report that's got all those uh, turning clearances and that sort of stuff in it. And it's not just that 180 degree, um, but it's also um, you know, a, a, a 90 degree turn uh, as well. And there's reach ranges and all sorts of other things in there. Um, 
And uh, what else do I want to point out about that? Um, the 2017 version of A117.1, which is the, it's, it's essentially, it's a voluntary standard, um, but it gets adopted by states for use in, in their building, you know, in their building code often. I don't know about Washington State and where they are in terms of adopting it hasn't been and has not been adopted in New York yet, but it is in the um, in the uh, the IBC and in the International Building Code 2022. So if your state's adopting the 2022 building code, they would adopt that unless they make an amendment not to uh, and they go back to the 09. But that 2017 version has a lot larger turning clearances, has used that research uh, to develop that, that standard. And so you could also point to that standard as well and say, look, this, they've increased the standard here. And even though that standard might not be required by law here yet, or maybe it is, um, you could, you could point to that uh, as well. But if you go to that projects tab, you'll find more as well. Um, udeducation.org. This is where we do our online con continuing education. Most of them use that that textbook, that last textbook I told you, you buy the textbook, you come and you can take a course on it. Um, but also there's a resources tab here as well that has some free resources. And if you go to this resources tab, there's something called design resources. And in that are the sh short versions of that longer anthropometry report. That anthropometry report is like hundred pages. Um, we've taken that and broken it down into shorter little documents that are available on this resources page here. www.thisisud.com. This is where we have a certification program uh, for buildings to be universally designed. And in here as well, there's 500 universal design solutions. You can create a project um, and it's a certification program to certify a building as universally designed, just like you would certify a building as being sustainable, you know, LEED certified or something like that. And so whether you want to certify your building or not, or just see some great universal design ideas with pictures and drawings, uh, you can go on here as well. Um, that 67 inches is in here too. Um, it doesn't have the research. Uh, we don't have the research uh, on here though. It's just, hey, do this. We, we simplified it for people. Um, but like I said, it's a certification program. I'll tell you how you're doing in different areas of the building. Uh, you can get points and, and get certain and get a certification plaque uh, for your facility. We're looking at doing it uh, at a few airports right now um, to certify some some expansions on there. Um, so to summarize um, today's conversation, universal design is not the same thing as accessibility. Universal design benefits all, and universal design adds value. Um, it is a process, a process that enables and empowers a diverse population by improving human performance, health and wellness, and social participation. In short, universal design is good design. When you look at those eight goals, you think, hey, these, um, you know, body fit, comfort, awareness, understanding, wellness, these, these are all things that every project should have. And so whether you call it universal design or not, um, you want to strive to uh, achieve these things in, in all of your projects, no matter what they are. All right, um, we do have a few more questions, it looks like, uh, maybe a few more comments on the chat. Um, I'm up here. Uh, um, book title, yes, Diversity and a Design, uh, Understanding Hidden Consequences was the book. Okay, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, it looks like I made up some of the time there uh, um, from, the, from the last one. So if anyone wants me to go over anything again or has any other questions, please let me know. All right, well, not seeing anything. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Jonathan. For, that was a really great presentation. I definitely learned a lot about universal design. Uh, kind of, I've had a base level understanding universal design and seeing it kind of mm -hmm. applied to all these scenarios and whatnot was really insightful. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. So we, I think we'll finish a little early before our break. We'll have a break from 12 to 1, uh, and then we'll reconvene at 1 o'clock.
for Kathy McCall, who is the Advocacy Director for AARP uh, in Washington State, and she'll be presenting on housing choices and universal design. Brock, do you have anything to add? That's perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was fantastic uh, intro for us for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the forum. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Universal Design Forum. It is one o'clock. Uh, today, we have a presentation from Kathy McCall, the Advocacy Director at AARP Washington. Uh, Kathy McCall, I said that. Uh, and she manages public policy and government relations to advance the issues that matter most to the 50 plus population. By working with state legislators and coalition partners, she successfully helped to pass several pieces of legislation that allow for housing options, such as ADUs and missing middle housing that allow for older adults more ranges or more options to age in place. Prior to joining AARP, she worked for Microsoft, World Vision, and YWCA and developed strategic communications, community engagement, and public policy support, supporting a variety of global and domestic poverty, economic justice, and digital inclusion issues. With that, I'll hand off things to Kathy. Just uh, real oh, quick before you. Kathy starts, um, I'm going to relaunch two polls. So for those who uh, are here, if you could take the first poll so we know where you're coming from, both uh, where you live, work, um, and which agency you work at. So I'm gonna launch that now. Three people from Everett Makotio, three from South Snohomish County, two from North Snohomish County, two from uh, East, one from uh, North of Snohomish County, six from King County, uh, Thurston, and then elsewhere in the state. Um, 11, so more than half of the folks who took the poll uh, work within Snohomish County. Uh, a little under half work outside of Snohomish County. We have five folks from city government, five folks from county government, one from a transit agency, two from regional or state government, uh, two from an advocacy organization, two consultants, and two other. Um, and finally, uh, what are your primary subject area? We have seven within transit, seven within public works, uh, five within land use, seven within housing, four social services, and five other. So Kathy, that's who you're speaking to today. Uh, take it away. Uh, well, hold on one second. I'm gonna put up another poll. Um, this poll is just kind of a sign-in sheet, not going to share out the results, but love to have folks sign in with their, their name and email address to make sure we have everybody here. That's it. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, and thank you very much um, to Brock and Ed for including me um, in today's forum on universal design and housing. Um, my topic is the housing choice and universal design. Um, I work for AARP uh, here in Washington State. AARP has um, roughly a little under 900,000 members in the state. Um, a majority of our members are obviously over 65, but a very growing number of individuals are 50 years old um, and even some younger because people are realizing um, the importance of planning and anticipating what their needs are going to be in terms of long-term care, retirement savings, health care, and housing. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I also wanted to um, say that I'm going to you know, be speaking for a while on a variety of different housing choices and options that exist. But if you have questions, um, I'm not sure maybe Ed, Ed could facilitate um, if you see questions in the chat. Um, you know, or if you want to raise your hand and you have a question, I'm, I'm not going to be able to see everybody. So if Ed maybe just kind of single signals me, I can see Ed, um, that there's a question. Um, because a lot of these are very specific potential policy areas or specific land use areas that not everyone is going to be that engaged in, but there might be some of you that want to have a deeper discussion. I will also, um, you know, leave plenty of time towards the end so that we have a chance to have not just questions and answers, but you know, discussion and sharing some best practices. 
and sharing what you're hearing, what you're seeing on the ground. AARP is very committed to this issue um, around housing and especially for our older adults. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, why is this not advancing? There we go. Um, so the housing crisis in Washington state is most dramatically seen in the number of unhoused um, older adults that we're seeing. Um, so I call this downstream. I used to work for the YWCA and it would literally break my heart when I would walk into a homeless shelter or one of our transitional housing programs and see women in their 50s and 60s who were homeless. Um, obviously it was the YWCA, there was also men that were also homeless um, or experiencing homeless or on the verge of being vulnerable to homelessness or being unhoused. The statistics are pretty shocking here in Washington state. Um, you know, we have a changing demographic. A lot of people talk about the age wave. Well, the age wave is here. And the age wave is the last of the baby boomers and they are fully aging and they have unique and individual needs when it comes to housing and also services. So I call this a quiet crisis because the headlines show individuals in tent camps and people sleeping in doorways. But what is hidden and really the quiet crisis is older adults who are experiencing homeless and homelessness and being unhoused. The real challenge here is that this problem is going to continue to increase if we don't look at really creative innovation, innovative solutions and looking at barriers that we need to remove to make more housing choices available for individuals as they age. Just to give you a quick reference on some of the demographics, this is a comparison slide that I've used in the past. And basically what it shows here is that by 2050, we're gonna have a majority of the population is going to be over 65. Um, that's an increase of about 952,000 people who will be over the age of 65. And then we also will see a, a nearly quadrupling of people who are 85 and older in this state um, by 2050. That means we have a lot of work to do to lay the foundation to provide the types of housing that people will need as they age. A major challenge is assuring that affordable and accessible housing options are available for older adults and a preference for them to age in place. And you'll be hearing a lot about aging in place from me during this presentation. So AARP, one thing that we do really well is collect data. You know, we have 32 million members nationwide and we have the ability to really pull on questions and issues of concern and areas of interest. The number one is about long-term care and what is what are people's options as they think about how they're going to age? So as the recent survey that we did, and we're updating this right now, this was from 2018, but it really clearly shows that people want to age in place. They want to age in their own community and in their own home. And But the challenge is, is that as um, housing prices go up, affordable and accessible housing choices become smaller and smaller. And we need to look at ways to also continue to bolster and support um, Social Security, Medicare, pensions, everything within the system to support our older adults. So aging in place, um, again, this is um, just to emphasize this point, is that people want to stay in their homes. That means they want to be close to family and friends, their social supports, doctors, churches. Um, and we know for a fact that these are more. this is a more affordable option than what we call institutional care or facility-based care, or to have um, you know, a, a family member potentially move in. Um, we want to try to do everything we can, again, to create more housing choices and more options, because the other good news is that there's better health outcomes. Yet the other challenge that we need to take into consideration, the same people we polled, is that they also don't see themselves staying in the home that they currently are living in. And oftentimes our older population, again, think the baby boomers, 
have purchased homes, you know, in the 60, 50s, 60s, 70s, potentially, and they raised a family, um, but now they've aged, maybe their spouse or their partner has died and passed on, and they're living in a very large house, and they can't afford the property taxes, they can't afford the maintenance, and it's just isolating. They don't, and if they stop driving, sometimes, a lot oftentimes those single family homes are not in transit oriented development communities where they can access public transit. A lot of this based on the demographics that Brock shared, um, I'm sure is repetitive for you, but I'm trying to just set the table here for what we're gonna be talking about in terms of housing and universal design. So um, about two or three years ago, a um, AARP along with the Master Builders Association um, and corporations, Amazon, Microsoft, Habitat for Humanity, built a coalition called the Coalition for More Housing Choices. And the goal of this coalition is to really explore innovative approaches to housing that addresses the needs, not just for older adults, but people of all ages. We feel really strongly that if we do what's right with housing and create housing solutions for older adults, that also benefits younger, younger people in communities and the community as a whole. So AARP is committed to working with policymakers, community organizations, funders, um, state agencies, and consumers to find balanced solutions to both address short-term emergency housing needs and long-term increases in housing supply that we need for generations to come across the state. So AARP has also invested heavily in creating incredible content information. And at the end of this presentation, and I can share with Ed, um, we have a just a bounty of research. We have a bounty of publications. Um, we have model legislation. We have model plans for different types of housing. Um, this one is called Where We Live, um, Communities for All Ages. So AERP has been recognized by the World Health Organization as the lead organization to create livable communities for older adults across the country. So here in Washington state, we have, um, the first was Puyallup down in King or Pierce County. Um, then there's also um, Seattle, um, Renton, White Salmon, um, which is over along the Oregon-Washington border. And then also the state is looking for a livability designation because again, this crisis in terms of housing and addressing the age wave is universally experienced across, across our country. Other countries in the world like Japan, South Korea, Germany, Belgium have had to deal with an aging population for hundreds of years. We are just now experiencing that and thinking through the infrastructure that we've built, which also relies on single family homes, which has also been a challenge. So um, the first kind of housing that we're really focusing on in supporting ARP is, and it's a bill that just passed, um, it's, it, it's an innovative approach to alternative housing, which is called ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Um, ADUs are small houses or apartments that exist on the same lot as a primary single family residence, and they're convenient, they can provide care for a loved one, um, it can also house a family caregiver. Um, ADUs are, you know, a really important topic. We've been working on the ADU legislation here in the state. We started in Seattle in 2018. Um, I thought it was going to be easy to pass a state bill. Uh, it was not, it took three years, but now we have a ADU bill that gives builders and families and owners the choice of not just to build a single family home on a piece of property, but potentially also include, and that's about missing middle, and I'll talk about missing middle in a little bit, but also around um, accessory dwelling units. I cannot stress um, how important this is for family caregivers. Um, about six months ago, I have had the honor to become my mother's family caregiver. Um, my mother has is 85 years old. She has dementia and can no longer take care of herself. 
I am very fortunate and very blessed that she lives in a community. It's part of a Merrill Gardens community, but she owns her own cottage. It's all one level. So when we talk about universal design, it was built with universal design standards. And it, it makes it easy for me to live on the other side of the house where I have my own bathroom, I have my own office, and I have my own bedroom. We moved her out of a three-story home um, with stairs and mass property to take care of and landscape and vegetation that she loved gardening when she was younger. Um, but with dementia, she no longer gardens. ADUs are that type of housing for family caregivers to be able to have a family member potentially live with the with the older adult that needs help and care and assistance to be close by. It also gives the opportunity for an individual um, to actually design a home that they could live in for the remainder of their life. So that could be single story, could have wider hallways. The one image that I have here has stairs. This actually is a unit, the white one and the one in the middle is um, the same. And it's basically that the son is living upstairs and downstairs, his mother plans to, she's using it as an art studio right now, but she plans to move the, into that unit um, when she can no longer navigate the stairs of her primary residence and that they will rent out the primary residence for income to pay for her retirement and her long-term care needs. So ADUs um, are something that has been around for centuries. And ADUs here in, in Washington State, again, until just the passage of the legislation this year, were basically not permitted, with the exception of a very few numbers of very forward-thinking municipalities. Um, and I've talked to a lot of them. Um, one of the other things that is important to you know, consider and think about is that you know this is also a great way to pepper in density in a very modest, very um, scattered way to also help address sprawl. I also had the opportunity to speak to a nursing home, a group of nursing homes, and they wanted me to talk about housing. And I couldn't understand why, because I'm like, you are living in this assisted living facility. You have your housing needs cared for, taken care of for it. And they said, well, we like this idea of ADUs and we like this idea of missing middle because what we're recognizing as we're living in our assisted living facility post pandemic, our bank does not have the same hours. I can't get an appointment to my dentist. I can't you know, get a appointment easily to see my doctor. Everything is prolonged in terms of reservations and access. And they had made that connection to the need for additional infill housing. We call it infill when it's kind of peppered in density um, to actually help service workers, retail workers, and other you know, people within our service economy that might not necessarily be able to afford rent, but they could afford potentially the rent on an ADU or another type of housing that's been uh, peppered into a community. And the rise of um, you know, suburban single family home developments began in World War II. Um, and it's something that, again, thinking about, we need to just reframe and reshape our thinking about what types of housing we need to have in communities and to address the needs of older adults. Um, AARP worked very successfully with a coalition of organizations, again, um, the Master Builders Association, the Coalition for More Housing Choices, but also Sightline, the Sightline Institute, and Habitat for Humanity. The bill was a bipartisan vote. Um, it was co-sponsored by Representative Barkas um, out of Eatonville, and it removes the parking requirements for one ADU. So a homeowner could build one ADU, and here's examples of detached, um, attached ADUs, um, above garage, garage conversions, and, but it does require parking for two ADUs. Um, parking was a huge issue. Um, owner occupancy was also equally important. A lot of people were very concerned that ADUs would change the look and feel of their community. 
Um, so what we did also was made sure that there was a minimum rental, um, a minimum 30 day rental for these units so that you would also avoid some of the issue around um, Airbnb. Again, it's up to um, local communities and local zoning to make some of those additional determinations and work with the Department of Commerce, who will have a process for local municipalities to basically enact their own ADU policy. So missing middle, um, missing middle was also, um, Brock just mentioned, um, was also a bill that just passed this session. It was probably one of the more contentious bills um, because people are concerned about density and they're concerned about changing the look and feel of neighborhoods and the communities where they live and they own their homes. But what the missing middle bill is all about is giving owners and builders more choices beyond just the senior, single family home. It allows for duplexes, triplexes, um, and quads. Um, it also has guidelines around density related to the proximity to transit. Um, so that was a really incredible bill and something that AARP was really proud of supporting. But it was one of those that we had to really bring our membership along in terms of understanding what this meant. Because even though people might say that they want to help and they want to address the housing crisis, when it comes to their own neighborhood, people have, they push back and they have concerns and very valid concerns and very valid issues. And we spent a lot of time over the interim talking to community organizations, talking to our membership um, and understanding those concerns and issues, and then working with the legislature to make sure that we could address it. But missing middle homes provide the size and affordability options that people of all ages, including air, older adults very much need. They also have an opportunity to create and use those universal design concepts from the build, um, from the beginning of the build. Um, missing middle housing is house scale, um, but it's different from other buildings. Um, it can be, again, it can be a stacked unit. It could be one that's side by side. The housing type is also great for family members, for them to be able to live close to another family member. So I also have two daughters who are in their mid-20s and they can't afford to live in most parts of North King County and South Snohomish County. Um, and yet they have figured out, you know, a ways to make this happen. But it would be great for them to be able to have an opportunity to potentially buy into a duplex um, or have the ability to um, have that as another option uh, for their own housing needs. So one of the things missing middle types um, can fit, they can fit into a, vi a variety of places and a number of street skates, streetscape spots. Um, they can be distributed throughout a block with sing other single family homes. They can be located at the end of an otherwise single family detached block. Um, they're built adjacent to commercial areas and transit so that it helps people transition um, and also have the ability to work in the community where they live. Um, single family homes um, and missing middle is tend to going to be leaning more towards communities with higher density housing already. Since missing middle homes vary in size and be, can be quite small, they can fit um, on all just about all plots of land um, and they can work around um, the other issue around trees and other natural topo topography. One of the other co you know concerns that we had heard and at first, you know, um, we didn't understand why, you know, people were so concerned about the trees and, and, but it, it's not just aesthetics. It's also about heat map and it's also about um, heat deserts and removing the tree canopy is not, it's about creating a sense of community and creating a beauty where people want to live and also at the same time, helping our environment. And um, when I saw just on one survey question that somebody just said trees, I was like, we have to dig into this. We have to understand. I knew the science. I knew what was behind it. But it was really about creating that connection to community and creating that beauty of an environment where people want to live. 
One of the other challenges that we have um, continued to look at related to missing middle housing is affordability. And um, it's important that as we think about missing middle housing, that it doesn't just become a additional, um, it doesn't just become an additional um, way for developers to make money. And it should be something that is meeting a community need, but at the same time, how do you make it affordable? So one of the things that we worked on a little bit this session, but I think we're going to be continuing to work on, is tax incentives. And we've started having conversations with the King County Assessor's Office of, you know, if somebody makes one of these units, let's say they build a duplex on their property and they uh, rent one of the um, duplex units at affordable rates, can they get a slight decrease in their property tax? Um, is there value to a community, to a city or a county to have that affordability? And what is the cost associated with it? So there's a lot of economics that we need to look at and examine as we think through what those options look like. Uh, before I go on anymore, I wanted to see if there was any questions or comments um, around missing middle or the ADU piece. because I don't want to miss out any good conversation or comments that people might have before I go on to the next pieces. I'll just remind folks, feel free to put up your hand, your digital hand, uh, or turn on your screen so we can see you have a question. OK, then we'll just keep, keep going on here. Um, the next type of housing that is something that we're looking very closely at and also worked on legislation this year. Um, we worked on pre previous legislation a few years back as well, is preserving manufactured home and mobile home communities. And I pulled up just, I, I couldn't get an accurate count, but it said that there were somewhere between 110 and 140 manufactured and mobile home communities in Stohomish County. Um, there it's a really significant type of housing, especially for older adults. 49% are headed by somebody that's 55 and older. Um, they're smaller square footage, they're affordable, they have reduced upkeep. Um, but one of the challenges is around resident rights. And resident rights comes because they don't own the land. And they rent the, they rent the land in order to have their unit. Also, a lot of the units in mobile home communities have a huge need for repair. Um, and they also have issues around septic, sewer systems, water. Um, there's a variety of issues. This was one of the issues that I have heard um, probably the most, and I think because they're allowed an uh, organized voice, is from the manufacturer and mobile home community associations across the state. And there are such questionable business practices that take place, especially when you have huge private equity companies coming in with a lot of money to buy these, buy these communities. Because oftentimes, at least in King County, a lot of these communities sit on very valuable land. And equity companies see an opportunity to move the residents out, basically raise the community, and put in, you know, a high rise apartment complex, which would be fine if, you know, those same residents could afford to live in it, but usually they can't. We also had heard numerous examples of individuals where their rent had been $350 a month, and then it literally doubled in a year um, to $750. And for a, an individual, an older adult on a fixed income, that becomes near impossible to pay. So, our focus um, on manufactured and mobile home communities was um, in the creation of a bill called 5198, which basically gives a private equity company, they have to give residents a three-year notice if they plan on selling the park or that they need to move the residents out. Um, that will also help um, give residents an opportunity to purchase their community, to form a collaborative um, we are also working on setting aside some budget in the housing trust fund to make sure that there's some funding available for those communities that want to form their own um, coalition and buy their park. 
Um, again, this is all about preserving the manufacturer and mobile home communities because these are places that are affordable and where seniors want to live. One of the other things that we're looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I talk about some of the other housing choices, is that we are looking um, also at creating um, these locations and providing wraparound services. We are going to use under Medicaid, which is called presumptive eligibility, we're going to assume that they are lower income and provide health care, wellness care, and preventative care services in some of these communities. Because we know that a lot of the health issues that are experienced are experienced by people who are lower income and lack health care or lack the ability to get to a health care provider or lack the internet connection to have a telehealth visit. So we know that there's a, a variety of complexity, but it just points to the fact that, again, as a community, this is an important place for older adults to live out their, their days. They also have the opportunity to connect with other older adults and have an opportunity for that kind of social engagement and social interaction that's so equally important just to overall physical health. So I mentioned just a little bit um, when we were talking about mobile homes and manufactured homes, um, also senior housing plus services. Um, this is really an emerging model um, that we've started to see. Um, there's there's called um, NORCs, which are naturally occurring retirement communities, NORCs. They're really prominent in New York in a lot of the housing projects that are unlicensed. So they're not health, they're not housing authority properties, but they might be an apartment complex that has 60 to 70 percent of their population is over 60 within these complexes. So it makes sense in New York. But what we're starting to see is that there's some um, apartment complexes that are that exist here in Washington state that also potentially could be um, points of services. So the service the senior housing plus services model for unlicensed multi-unit housing that is, is housing primarily older adults. Um, there's a great, also a great example in Vermont called SASH. And um, I also put a resource page at the end of this presentation. I can send that out. Um, it's great information on um, the program that they have in, in Vermont. And basically what they have done is that they have um, RNs, they have case managers, they have occupational therapists that come in um, you know, once a week or more to do health screenings, they do medication checks, they teach classes on falls prevention, they provide um, access to services, so helping people enroll for SNAP, so the supplemental nutrition program is completely underutilized by older adults who would be income eligible. When I've asked seniors why they don't apply for SNAP, they say that's for other people, that's for poor people. Um, and yet they are living on maybe $10, $20 a month in terms of food budget. And they're skipping medication um, in order to pay for food. So Set in these types of services, what we want to do is help older adults access services that they might not necessarily know are available to them, but also provide that that um, that fill that gap when it comes to healthcare, and helping them manage chronic conditions, chronic diseases. And again, there are provisions within the federal Medicaid um, that our DSHS here in Washington State has been working on. Again, using presumptive eligibility so that somebody does not have to apply to Medicaid, but we are assuming that they are Medicaid eligible based on the community where they live and doing a quick income verification um, based on what they're living on in terms of social security or small pension. So this is also a really another really interesting model because again, I started out talking about People want to age in place. They want to stay in the communities where they live, but the housing does not exist. And the housing plus a sor uh, um, uh, supportive services does not exist across the board. We also know that um, older adults need to have, um, you know, 
people and individuals in their lives to help them and navigate and have caregivers. We also have an incredible large generation of people who do not have family. They have chosen not to have children. And so these communities become their community of choice and their family of choice. So we want to incentivize and help support that type of housing so people can move out of the large single family home and stay in their community, stay where their doctor is, their church is, have access to their friends and family and the restaurants they like and all of those things. But in order to do that, we have to have more affordable, accessible housing choices. The village model, um, and I included one here, which I don't know a, a lot about, but I was thrilled to see it, which is the Sunnyside Homes in Marysville. And I figured I'm speaking with um, Snohomish County people. I, I saw that there was a lot from King County as well. Um, and I know that there's several other programs like this, but this is just a really great innovative model. I'd love to hear more and learn more. In fact, I, I wanna go drive up there. I live in Woodenville. Um, and I would love to go see um, what this looks like. Um, but right now in Washington State, we think we have about 40 communities, but I keep hearing more about others that are not on like this list that I've seen. So I'm thinking that there, there might be some others that are less formal um, communities. These communities, again, like I said, this is your family of choice. Um, this is for older adults that might not have biological family or they don't have family that lives close by. Also the changing demographic is families don't stay as a unit anymore. They don't have mom or dad or aunts and uncles and generations of people living within a mile. They might live across the country. So again, we need to think about housing choices and options for older adults that also address that, that create this sense of community. So villages have been around also for hundreds of years and it's kind of what's old is new. Um, but one, one of the differences is, is that, you know, a lot of these are um, shared, they also have their private homes, their own individual homes or cottages, and then they have shared spaces um, where they can have communal meals, um, they can do activities. Um, I've seen communities where they have somebody come in and do Zumba once a week. Um, they also do health screenings and again, access to services. But it's also the neighbors recognizing and saying, I want to help care for other individuals in my community as they age because I want the same thing in return. This is the one model that is really changing the paradigm of what it means to age and what it means to age in place. There's also a great example that I also put in the resource tab up on the Olympic uh, Peninsula called Quimper. Um, and they also are doing some really innovative things. Again, the challenge is, is to keep these units affordable um, and also make sure that you have um, agreements among the residents and that people are also engaged and involved. And I've seen basically the equivalent of CCNRs that write out and are prescriptive in terms of a person's role and responsibility in the community. And part of your uh, agreement of living in the community is also agreeing that you will provide assistance and help other neighbor neighbors in the community. There's also been villages that have gone so far as to create their own monetary system where they actually have like vouchers for, you know, I will set up your um, your Christmas or your holiday lights if you will provide, if you will make me three casseroles. <laughs> so, you know, there's like this exchange. Um, and so there's really innovative ways for people to have a barter system in place um, to also engage and support their other community members and partners. And again, it's this is a great model, again, rep representing the demographic shift from people with no family or that they um, have family that lives halfway across the country or all the way across the country, but they want to have that sense of community and belongingness. So that's also something, but there's, you know, there tends to also be barriers to that um, and land use issues. And so I, I would encourage everything. I think if there's anything from my talk today is just to think through the work that you do 
and make sure that you have a lens that's looking at the needs of older adults because the de demographic age wave is upon us. So on to the next um, example is um, home sharing. And I just, I thought it would be fun just to have a picture of the Golden Girls because I think they had it right, um, is that they really looked at how did they come together um, and live in a community or live in a house. They lived in a, a it sounded like a, a, a continuing care retirement community kind of thing in Florida. Um, and they had a home share. Um, they're basically sharing meals, they're sharing the utility costs, they're sharing taxes. And this is a great model for lower income, vulnerable adults. I had the opportunity to speak to a group up in Whatcom County, and um, we were talking about ADUs and missing middle. They had specifically wanted that. And several of the people, there were several uh, consumers and individuals saying, you know, I can't even afford an apartment. I can't afford an ADU. I can't afford a house. Um, you know, what type of housing is available to me? And um, I and I started talking about home sharing. And all of a sudden, this natural occurrence happened on this call where individuals were saying, I have a I have a house, I have a room. And the, you know, the other woman's like, well, I'll talk to you, you know, send me your email and private chat. <laughs> it was this natural connection. Um, and it's something that we know takes place. Again, when I worked at um, the YWC, we had a program called the Landlord Liaison Project. And the Landlord Liaison Project was basically this. It was helping to screen, especially people who needed transitional housing coming out of homelessness or you know, wanting to stay out of homelessness, stay out of the shelters. And the Landlord Liaison Project basically trained the landlords on what it meant to be a have a tenant. Um, it helped train the tenants on their responsibilities to respect the rules of the landlord. And the landlord liaison was basically like a mediator and a, um, you know, housing selector for these individuals. And um, we partnered and matched individuals to homes. And then there were instances where somebody said, you know, they weren't supposed to have parties after 10 o'clock. We called them and told them to stop. Um, they immediately got on the phone with the landlord li liaison person. And that person said, you know, you potentially could lose your housing because you need to follow the rules. And again, it just, there are models that exist that work. Um, here in Washington state, we also used to have something very similar through our area agency on aging. Um, but I, I'm not exactly sure what has happened to it. About two weeks ago, I started checking around. No one seemed, can seem to give me an answer. So if there's anybody on this call that knows, what happened to our program here in Washington State? I'd be curious. The one thing I know that has changed, you know, even if this program was five or six years ago, is the use of technology. And there are so many use, so many apps out there, as we all know, that help you navigate and figure out, you know, somebody for to care for your dog, to care for, you know, if you need a babysitter or you need to have a home care aid. When I need somebody temporarily for my mother, I go to care.com. And I can look up specifically groups of people that are in my community near where my mother lives, and I need them available for two or three hours on a Saturday. Um, and there's technology that's based to do that. And I'm just thinking that there must be some opportunity to create some type of model very similar to that. Again, when it comes to that housing, what does it mean? Because we need to make sure that that housing has universal design components to it at, for older adults. It, are there incentives that that homeowner who enters into that program could be afforded? And that's something I'm actually suggesting to AARP. So when we talk about universal design, I know you had a whole um, forum this morning and I'm so sorry I missed it. I know that there's a recording and I want to go back and look at it. I had a mandatory training that I had to do through AARP um, and I could not get out of it. I tried. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to the recording. But um, so universal design for older adults specifically are single level homes with no steps. They can be apartments, they can be condos, you know, with elevators. They include wide hallways, lower counters, 
Um, a big one for my mother who has arthritis is the fact when we moved into this house, it does not have knobs on the doors. Everything is levers. And I did not realize how important that was until I found that she could not open her own bedroom door or bathroom door because of her arthritis in her hands. And now in the, this house or where she lives now, she has that ability. So it's simple things like that. And we have a whole list on the next slide of things that we're working on when it comes to universal design. So we want to continue. Um, one of the things we've been working closely with um, is the Master Builders Association and the Building Industry Association of Washington. We're also looking at um, collaborations with the Association of Washington Cities to also get out more information on, you know, universal design, that this should be an asset that is attached to the house and attached to the home. And again, a selling feature because as people move out of primary residence, what we have found is a lot of older adults are saying, I can't live in this house anymore because it's too expensive for me to do all of the improvements I need to do. And so they want to move to improve their house and their ability to age in place. So as I kind of wrap up here, um, AARP has also entered into a, um, a partnership with Lowe's um, on the livable home. And again, I'll have a link to all of this information. The QR code, for some reason, did not translate from the website onto the PowerPoint slide. Um, so I tried to use it and it didn't work. So don't try to use the QR code. Um, but anyway, there were some other additional guidelines that, you know, are things for individual consumers to think about as they look to remodeling their home or to into moving into a home or um, that they want to create a home for their family member or they're building that ADU. These are considered in ARP's perspective, also universal design is to think about small things like motion censored lights, um, you know, putting in smart devices. Um, one of the things that, you know, that we've done in my mother's home is um, we have um, sensors because she's starting to wander because of the dementia. And I want to know when the doors are opened. Um, and so I have it, you know, connected to my phone and I can tell when she's moving from room to room. Um, so that's important, especially even if I go away, you know, for an hour or two to go to the grocery store, it's just important to know, and the technology is available and there's so much opportunity there. So again, this is a great partnership that we have, um, that we've been working with, um, Lowe's on, and we're looking forward, um, and we participate each year at the consumer electronic show that usually takes place in Las Vegas and really looking at the use of technology and how technology can be integrated into our homes um, and also help people age with purpose and dignity and to help support their caregivers. So I feel like I've gone through a lot and I, I feel like I still have plenty of time for conversation. Um, and um, so I just wanted to kind of close in conclusion that you know, the population is aging, um, just takeaways. I mean, everybody knows that. Maybe everybody doesn't know it. Maybe it's just because I am, you know, focused in on it every day. Um, we need to have systems, including housing, that reflect the needs of this changing demographic. We need to integrate universal design principles into design and land use. Um, we need to remove barriers, um, to innovative housing approaches, whether it's permitting or zoning or financing, um, taxation. Um, we need to look at all of those systems. And finally, everyone needs to be engaged in housing solutions. Um, it's you know not only just our government leaders, community organizations, builders, but it's also consumers. Consumers need to know that they have the ability to demand choice that they want to have homes and communities where they can live. I think one of the best examples, I have two examples also in closing I wanted to share. Um, one is that um, I spent some time over in Kashmir, um, Washington, which is um, just on the other side of the Cascades. Um, it is east of Leavenworth, west of Wenatchee. And 
in the 90s, a huge number of older adults retired to that area. And we, I was over there with um, a healthcare professional because there are huge complaints around lack of healthcare. And the conversation evolved into, it was really more about the lack of transportation. And then the conversation evolved lack of housing and lack of, of housing that was universally designed, that was single story, that as the individuals who moved there in the 90s were skiers, hikers, outdoor enthusiasts, fishermen, fly fisher women. Um, and, but as they got older, their mobility issues became more problematic and they couldn't live in the homes that they wanted to live in. And they didn't have the transportation infrastructure to get to the hospital or to go grocery shopping. And so it was interesting. It was really eye-opening to me um, that we've got to also address this housing issue. And that's why when we worked on Missing Middle and ADU, that I was also very conscious because I did the same type of survey work in Spokane and the Tri-Cities. And to see that a lot of people moved out of the Puget Sound area for cheaper, more affordable housing and, and rent with good intentions, but as they aged, the infrastructure did not exist to care for them. And that housing choices were not available for them as well. The other thing I um, I really reflect on is what I open with is the quiet crisis. Again, working for the YWCA, um, I saw numerous women who lost homes because they lost a spouse, and the spouse was, was the one taking care of the mortgage and the paying the taxes, and they um, had not been involved in that process. They also had never worked. And they couldn't find a job that paid enough to pay for the upkeep and payment of the house. And they basically lost their home often in a foreclosure. Um, this was back, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, ended up couch, what we call couch surfing, which is bouncing back and forth from different friends and family um, and sleeping on their couches. And again, it just really challenged me to think about how we can create more housing choices, not only for older adults, but for people of all ages. So thank you. And I'd love to open it up to any kind of um, questions and discussions. And here are all the links. These are all links. And I'll send this to Ed of all of the resources that I um, have been working with, including some of the bills and you can read the legislation. Let's look like we have a question in the chat. Uh, I can read it out loud. Uh, Kathy, with an aging population, is there a conflict with land use development encouraging tall multi-story homes such as townhomes, but more older buyers need single floor homes with those stairs? Yes, um, that is, um, I, I see Jeff Rivers from the city of Montlake Terrace asked that question. Um, and yes, there is a real challenge. Um, and it's interesting because you see a lot of three and four story apartments or condos going up and um, they're all stairs, there's no elevators. And that really inhibits the ability for an older adult to be living in those facilities. There was actually discussion um, among my colleagues at ARP where you were talking about housing. We we're um, and we were talking about what role could ARP play in helping make sure that there's elevators in these units. And we just completed our round of challenge, uh, community challenge grants. And the community challenge grants um, give municipalities in the state and across the country an opportunity to submit uh, requests for funding from our office. And one of them was for an elevator. Um, it was in a, um, I wanna say it was down in um, the Vancouver area. And it was for a, um, a community center that also had 
residential on top. So they were using the first floor or their plan. They're in the process of a capital campaign, but they asked for funding for an elevator. And, and I think it's one that we're actually going to fund because it's so important for seniors to have the, that opportunity. It shouldn't just be a community center. It should also be a center for older adults where they can um, enjoy services. They can also have social connection with, you know, other older adults, but they should be able to have access to that housing above, above the senior center. So thanks for the question, Jeff. Really good point. And Brian from Island County, the issue of aging is significant. Many residents who have age-related disabilities live off of transit routes, but don't necessarily qualify for paratransit. How do we encourage and incentivize aging people to think about moving to centers before they become isolated? That is a very good question as well. And uh, there was also a bill that did not go forward in the legislative session. It was on transit-oriented development. And I um, had researched um, transit-oriented development. And the original bill was, um, they were saying, oh, transit-oriented development could be a half mile um, you know, and that you could have this density, you know, half within half a mile. I said, if you're older and you have a disability, a half a mile might as well be 10 miles because you can't, you can't make, you can't walk that distance in a walker or even a wheelchair or even a motorized scooter. Um, and I think it's important for planners to continue to keep that in mind, even a quarter of a mile is really difficult um, for a lot of older adults just to get up and walk around their house you know during the day or walk around their yard is sometimes all that an older adult especially if they have a physical um, disability or you know that they have other mobility issues or they have a heart ailment or copd or what have you um, but i think it's important also to um you know help older adults understand what is available. So there's a lot of ride shares. ARP's had numerous conversations with both Uber and Lyft um, on how do we actually create better um, concierge desks for older adults and reduced ride trips um, to also tap into their network of um, drivers to help um, older adults get from point A to point B. We also need to, I think your, your point about incentivizing transit-oriented development is really key, is, you know, a lot of the senior centers are, not all the senior centers, but a lot of them, at least in King County, are in, in communities and in existing communities. And the biggest draw for getting older adults to come to a center is free food, is a meal, is and because they're often on fixed incomes, Often as you get older, you don't like to cook. Food, you know, is not as interesting. They can't afford to go out or order in or what have you. But if you could incentivize a center for also becoming a place to provide food or a meal and having that ability to um, engage, have social connection, have a good meal, have I think that there would be a way to attract people to more transit-oriented development. But again, that requires us also thinking through and, and modeling the existing zoning and development to reflect the needs of older, older adults. And I think it's also about education. The other thing uh, is that there are a lot of community organizations that are free, that have volunteers that provide free rides to seniors, but oftentimes older adults do not know that that service exists. Um, in on the east side of King County, um, it's called the Friends of East Side Friends of Seniors. And their sole mission is to provide transportation to homebound um, and isolated older adults. And also um, they provide as they drive them, they provide them information about where to get meals, 
Um, if they're taking them to a grocery store, um, that they also have gift cards for that particular store. You know, if they know that that, that older adult is struggling um, to put food on the table. Um, so uh, Safeway had given out um, gift cards for them to also share. And they also then also hand them a list of phone numbers, not email addresses, not websites, but phone numbers for them to contact in the future for other kinds of services that they might need. So, but I think it's important for us to continue to look at ways to incentivize. And that really involves um, listening to, you know, communities. So Brian, thank you. And Brian had a follow on comment. He said, I recall an older gentleman who could not walk up a steep block um, to reach transit. And that is very, that is my point when they were talking about the debate with transit oriented development, you know, the half mile or the quarter of a mile, as I said, what about the terrain? You know, are we talking a quarter of a mile up a hill? Or are we talking about a quarter of a mile with no sidewalks um, and no curb cuts? I, I said, we've got to be really specific about this legislation. And we really push back to say, let's focus in on missing middle and ADUs. Um, and I said, I don't know if transit oriented development is quite there yet. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, and especially as we're building out our, you know, our state, at least in the Puget Sound area, the, you know, um, our regional transit, um, both sound transit and, um, you know, the Pierce County transit and light rail and trying to get everybody to connect and link together. So that was a good point as well. Thank you. So um, other questions or um, I would love to know if anybody um, here today has, um, you know, thought about or experienced being a family caregiver and have you thought about where you're going to live or where your loved one is going to live? The other thing, um, I talk a lot about long-term care and long-term care and housing are so deeply entwined with each other. And, you know, for most people, long-term care, they think about a nursing home. In Washington state, we are in a very, very rare position. Um, we are ranked consistently the leader, either number one or number two for our home and community-based services. And that basically means that we are really resourced and funded to focus in on keeping people in their homes as long as possible for them to age with purpose and dignity. Because if you want a family member to live in a facility, I just got estimates from the Merrill Gardens here for the assisted living for my mother, and it was going to be about $3,800 and that's not with any in checks. That's not, that's not like that is just the bare minimum. That's meals, her, her studio apartment. Um, so three meals a day. But if I wanted her to have transit assistance or to have somebody check in on her, or I think that included laundry, all of a sudden it started to go up to five to $6,000 a month. Her pension is would not cover that. She has a pension from LA Unified School District, which is very generous, but does not cover that cost. Then I looked at memory care and it was starting at $9,000 a month. So we have to explore other options for helping older adults remain in place and age um, in their homes. Tom, I see your hand. I have really enjoyed this conversation, Kathy. Um, because you are talking my life right now. I have a 97 year old mother-in-law who lives at home alone, technically not really alone. She has a son and a nephew that live in the basement and provide her some assistance, but they're not caregivers. And so far uh, her memory is sharp, but she just can't get around very much anymore. My wife is her primary link between her and the outside world, groceries, all those kinds of things. And we're hoping that we can keep that arrangement to her last days because she doesn't want to go anywhere but there, or as she says, maybe a, a, a an iceberg out in the ocean like the Eskimos. That's what she describes. Uh, but that's not an option. And then uh, in our family, my sister and my mom lived together 
and my sister bought my mother's house and the house was set up for my mom to age in place there. So we did that to you know, protect her ability to stay where she wanted to stay. And um, so that's, that's worked well. And my mom is 85. And then my, my wife and I are at the stage where we're trying, to, we, we're those people who have the big house with the really steep steps and it's paid for. But we can't find in a and and I, I do okay. But I can't find a acceptable solution that doesn't put me into another long term, uh, you know, financing situation where I don't want to be as I get close to retirement. So it's this is really good conversation, and I, my my brain's been spinning <laughs> while you've been talking about this. And I have young kids, uh, younger children with grandchildren, you know, and. Um, and so there's a desire to keep some of these properties in the family because it worked for us and it might work for them, but not necessarily just because they might not be able to afford it at this point. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tom, for your um, comments. I um, anytime you want to talk, I, I <laughs> Um, feel free to, um, I have my email down at the bottom of the slide. Um, but one of the things I am, you know, really looking at myself personally is constructing an ADU in my backyard, because I started penciling out the numbers. And once I found out um, that my neighbors were doing it, but they were getting around the prohibition of ADUs by calling them art galleries, but now that's not going to be a problem. Um, or they calling them barns. Um, so, because I live in an uh, unincorporated area in King County, right on the border with Snohomish County. And um, I, the ADU model seems to, uh, as I started thinking about it, and I've been thinking about it now for about a year or more, and um, because I can rent it out, um, or my daughters, because one of them just decided to, you know, had a great job, quit her job. I'm like, well, where are you going to live? She's like, well, you're not living in your house. Why am I going to go live there? <laughs> So um, I'm like, sure, you know, but the ADU might work because again, I have a house, it's a two-story house. Um, you know, I'm pretty, um, you know, able to get around. I do stairs, I hike, I, you know, but I can see a future where I'm not going to be able to do those things. And I have the ability to design my own future where I could construct something very minimal um, that I could live in and I could rent out my primary residence or rent it out or sell it to my kids or I don't know I just I believe and why we got involved in housing was about creating those choices that we have options because right now where I live in in Woodenville you know I would not be able to afford to buy my own home I've lived there for 20 plus years and um and, but I would not be able to buy a home and there are no other housing options that are in my community that would be affordable. So that's what we're really trying to do is we think about housing policy and flipping the paradigm. We got to think about the aging of the population and we've got to continue to look at how do we make sure that we have a vibrant um, housing ecosystem and we have a system that works for everyone. It's been really interesting also having um, Microsoft. Um, so I used to work for Microsoft and my counterpart who now works there is part of this housing coalition and having conversations with them and Amazon is that they're struggling with a lot of the same things is that they see multi-generational families um, starting to, you know, families wanting to be closer to family members but not being able to afford to live there. Then workforce housing, even though that they have a good salary and income, that they're you know not able to afford to live in a lot of the, these areas. And then also for a lot of the other non-technical staff and for the service economy that Microsoft needs, um, that they don't have workforce housing. And that also, the importance of quality schools. As you look at what happened in Bellevue, um, Bellevue basically aged out. Um, and that's, I was talking to somebody over on, um, not Whidbey, 
uh, not Coopville, what, another community that was talking about that they have such a huge number of older adults because all the older adults can't afford to move. So younger families can't come in. So they're closing down schools because there is not enough of a younger family population to populate the schools because older adults have no other way and no other place to move. And so basically the cogs of the wheel of housing are jammed um, because you have seniors that are sitting on these huge, amount, huge amounts of equity. They're sitting on these house, houses and single family homes with no other place to move and not giving the same opportunity to a family that could move in to have access to those great quality, same quality schools that they raise their children in um, and have the opportunity to you know, purchase a home. So it's just a really interesting time that we're living in. And this is just a really interesting, I love these complex challenging um, issues. And I think this is one that is just very um, engaging and there's still more work to be done. I think there's still more work um, to be done on, on housing. And um, I love the fact that you guys are doing these instant polls. And if there's other, you know, polls on, um, you know, what other policies around housing should we be thinking about? I am always open to feedback. And again, please feel free to email me if there's um, other, you know, housing policy issues. A lot, oftentimes what I get in these conversations as well is, you um, questions about the senior property tax exemption because, and that's an interesting tricky one because like I just said, we want to try to get seniors to move out of their houses. And if property taxes are too high, that's, you know, um, a way for people to move out and they don't want to pay the high property taxes. But at the same time, we need to think about um, the senior property tax exemption. So there's another bill that we also just passed working with the King County Assessor um, to raise the income level for the senior property tax exemption because we passed a um, a fix it. Um, we passed the senior property tax exemption bill a couple of years years back, but then um, the cost of living adjust adjustment under Social Security went up by eight point three or eight point six percent, which um, basically forced people um, and made made them not income qualify anymore for the Washington State Senior Property Ta Tax Exemption Program, Senior Property Tax Exemption. So there's more work that we can be do done on that. Um, but we're ARP, again, we recognize that. We know there's a problem. We're trying to address it. But I would also love to hear if there's other ideas around policy. Um, I know there's a lot of work at the municipal level. Um, at both the city and the county level around zoning, um, land use, um, the UGA, um, everything. But if there's other questions, um, you know, feel free or other policy areas that we should be in, let me know. Um, thanks for the results on the, the poll. So we had, um, when I asked, have you had a had to care for a family member. 46% of you said that you've had to care for a family member. And 85% of you have thought about your long-term care living arrangements. That's great. You're, you're ahead of everyone. Because we have um, also AARP did polling um, about long-term care. And um, about 75% of people had never really planned for their care. Uh, and for their financing, um, more importantly. And a lot of them, um, we actually had responses where people, instead of you know going to the traditional answer of saying that they were going to pay for their long-term care and their long-term care housing needs and their retirement costs, um, that they were going to use 401ks or their pension, their savings, you know, Social Security or a combination of the, all of the above, um, there was actually people saying that they were going to start a business and sell it and make a million dollars, that they were going to um, inherit money from a family member, and that's how they were going to pay for their housing, their long-term care, and their retirement. My favorite answer was that they were going to win the lottery, and we did a sample size of, it was over 800, and so uh, 45 people said that they were going to win the lottery. So that is not a good way to plan for your long-term care, your housing needs, or your retirement. 
Um, Karen Taylor, what are your thoughts on social housing? This all still, still feels very, sounds very compassionate, but capitalistic oriented. Um, well, I've never been called a capitalist. <laughs> so, um, I believe very strongly in social housing. Um, I think that, um, and I appreciate the discussion because I think it's so important. Um, social housing is incredibly important and there's a need and a role to play um, with it. And I think that there's more of a role for government and the federal government to step in on housing. And because if they're really serious about healthcare and universal healthcare, the way you keep people healthy is they have to be housed and they cannot be living on the streets and they cannot be living in stress of where they're gonna be living from month to month. Stress is the one way that you kill somebody the fastest. And housing is should be a right, um, just like healthcare. Brian's comment actually came in right before you started talking about it, which was kind of amazing. Um, and so if you notice, he uh, th that challenge of uh, older adults having to, to stay in place and not allow families to move in. What was that? Uh, Brian's quite, uh, comment right before, uh, you, right after he put his comment in regarding uh, seniors having to live in place um, because of finances and not, and as a result, families want to be able to rotate into the, those communities. Uh, that comment came right before you made the exact same comment. Oh, okay. It's right nice. on point. Yep. It was right <laughs> on point. Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting challenge because when um you know the bellevue schools I, I think they limit they cut down the number of schools that they were going to be closing um but you know people immediately thought oh it's all the tech workers and oh and it's like no it's all the other adults staying in their houses and not moving because there is no housing there is no other place for them to move to and that's the other i the other question i get from older adults about the senior property tax exemption like, why am I paying property taxes when it to the schools and I don't have kids in schools anymore? And I'm still scratching my head on to exactly how to deal with that one. But that goes to kind of that concept of social housing as well. Uh, any other questions as we wrap up? Ed or Brock, is there anything else you wanted me to cover off on? Just real quick, um, this presentation was fantastic and I think we would love to share it out. Uh, and so I just mentioned during the noon hour, I took the time to uh, put together a listserv for the attendees uh, and presenters of the forum. And so attendees can uh, communicate with one another as if we were live and in person, you'd be able to walk up to somebody. In this case, you can shoot an email and talk to uh, everyone within uh, the digital forum. We'll close it in a week so we don't have this ongoing email that's, that's bouncing around. Um, but that is a resource uh, for people to exchange ideas or ask questions. Um, so hopefully we can share out your presentation via that email um, and if people have additional questions, they can shoot you an email directly or via the group. Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciated my time. Um, I am very passionate about the work that I do with AARP. Um, and um, the organization is really looking at, you know, how we change, um, you know, what aging looks like. And and because we have, you know, more people that are going to live over a hundred than any time in history, um, and we we have that now. And so, you know, life expense expectancy, you know, I, I for myself, I'm in my mid fifties, is well into my nineties, 
Um, and to think about that, to think, oh my gosh, I have almost half another half of my life. Um, and what does that look like? And so AARP is really invested a lot of resources and time and people and some of the best and brightest minds looking at these issues and working with business and industry. Um, we also work closely with unions and, um, you know, nursing associations and the medical community. Um, and we're in constant fight with the prescription drug um, industry. Um, but again, because, you know, this is about people's money and their ability to create their own destiny and own future as they age. And we're looking at every single lever we can move and pull to make sure that people live with purpose and dignity as they age. Uh, well, we certainly here at SnowTrack appreciate uh, the work that you do at AARP uh, and the great resources that you provide. Aging in place is a really important aspect of the work that we do. Um, and in Snohomish County, you know, the entire country is aging very quickly. The state is aging even more quickly than the rest of the country. Um, and Snohomish County is aging faster uh, based off of what the State Office of Financial Management says that our county is aging faster than the rest of the state. So it is a very relevant topic for us of how we build our communities and where people can live. Um, so yeah, I, I saw that statistic and I was like, is that accurate? It was like 19.7% of your population. Yeah. Um, well, thank and, you. And it's going to grow. So thank you very much. Ed, you want to wrap us up here? Yeah, thank you very much, Kathy, for your presentation. Oh, these are kind of my own comments, but uh, as someone who is younger or probably comparatively younger than a lot of people on the presentation, it's nice to hear about uh, kind of what the future looks like regarding housing and how young people also have a vested interest in like housing affordability and how that looks. So thank you for that. Uh, so with that, that concludes uh, day one of the Snow Track Universal Design Forum. Uh, we will be coming back tomorrow at 9.30 with uh, a presentation from the Northwest ADA Center. Uh, I'd like to close out saying thank you to our partners, uh, Disability Mobility Initiative, uh, Homish Senior Services, and uh, Sohomish uh, Human Services. Brock, do you have anything else to add? All right, it looks like it's 9.30. Uh, today is day two of the Universal Design Forum. Uh, I'm Ed Engel, Mobility Justice Advocate for SnowTrack. I'm going to share my screen and uh, so we're on day two, April 20th. Uh, we will be kicking things off with a presentation about ADA compliance from the Northwest ADA Center. And then we'll have a brief 10 minute break and then we'll start at 1110 where we'll be having a discussion about universal design, ADA and overall mobility with two staffers from the Seattle Department of Transportation, uh, Tom and Michelle. And then we'll have another 30 minute break and then we'll round things off with our roundtable discussions slash presentations from our wonderful public works departments and consultants that have worked on ADA transition plans throughout Snohomish County. Uh, I believe just like yesterday, we'll also be sending or showing a survey. Is that right, Brock? Yes, uh, yes, we will do that right now. Um, while I do that, uh, can you thank our partners here? Yes. Excellent. I would also. And I would also like to thank our partners, Disability Mobility Initiative, Homage Senior Services, and Sohomish County Human Services for making this Universal Design Forum possible. All right, we have launched a, a quick poll or survey on the screen to find out uh, where you're coming from. So our first uh, presenter here uh, knows where everybody is. Uh, so if you could go ahead and fill it out, that'd be fantastic. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Uh, and you can, on the pop-up window, scroll through the results yourself. Um, we have about 20%, 21% from Everett McLeotio, uh 11% from South Snohomish County, uh, equal number from North Snohomish County, 
one person from East Snohomish County, two from counties north of Snohomish County, seven from King County. Uh, and of course, <laughs> one person from outside of Washington State, who I would guess is our presenter. Um, That's me. Yeah. Uh, where do folks work? We have 47% uh, working within Snohomish County, 53% uh, outside Snohomish County. Uh, we have about a fifth of folks representing city government, 16% uh, representing county government. Uh, regional state government, we have uh, another fifth. And uh, one advocacy organization and four consultants on board here and three other. So that's who is here. Um, they also, in terms of what they focus on, uh, transit is 37%, public works transportation 47%, land use 21%, housing 21%, social services 11 and other is 21. So obviously uh, lots of individuals who are cross-disciplinary, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm gonna launch one more poll and the purpose is for you to sign in. Um, we won't share the results, but it's just a, a good way for us to keep track of who has shown up. So thank you uh, for that. And we look forward to the, to the workshop coming up. The ADA or the Northwest ADA centers uh, part of the, national, the ADA National Network uh, Centers as a national platform of 10 centers comprised of ADA professionals and experts charged with assisting businesses, state and local governments and people with disabilities as they manage the process of changing our culture to be user-friendly with disability and the effect a variety of health conditions can have on society. Uh, today, we are excited to have Sabine from the Northwest ADA Center to present an introduction to ADA compliance. Over Thanks that. for having me. Am I good to get started? Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for having me. My name is Sabine Rear. I am a continuing education coordinator here at the Northwest ADA Center. Um, and I'm actually located in Portland, although our center is uh, up in Seattle. We serve the, um, the region, Region 10. So that's Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. Um, I am going to start sharing my screen. Um, so give me just one moment to make that happen. And for my own access, while I do that, I'm gonna have my camera off um, so that I can work my slides um, and not show you just like the detail of my eyebrow while I do it. Um, and I will get us going here. Um, are y'all able to see those slides? Yep. Great news, okay. So, Thanks for the sweet introduction. As you said, we're gonna be talking about um, ADA compliance kind of overall and um, looking at your schedule today, hopefully this will be sort of a good baseline um, for the conversations that y'all will be having later in the day. Um, so I'm gonna be talking specifically about um, Title II, state and local government entities under which transit orgs fall. Um, and I'll be starting with an overview of the ADA. Um, Again, my name is Sabine Rear. I'm a certified ADA coordinator and a continuing ed coordinator here at the ADA Center. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna read our beautiful disclaimer. Here we go. The Northwest ADA Center is funded under a grant from the Administration for Community Living, Nidler grant number 90DP0095. However, the contents of this presentation do not necessarily represent the policy of the ACL, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. And then we've got our logo, the Northwest ADA Center, as well as the Nidler logo. So consider yourselves disclaimed. All right. So the plan for this session um, is this welcome that we've just done here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Northwest ADA Center as a resource, um, kind of what we do and what, how we're available to support um, uh, both organizations and individuals. Um, then I'll go into the overview of the ADA, who's covered, who must comply, an overview of Title II and the limitations, and we'll see where we are if we have some time. We'll do some scenarios and then open it up to questions. Um, so that's the plan. Um, 
as was said in the beautiful introduction, the ADA National Network is sort of the uh, umbrella organization under which we fall. So the ADA National Network um, is a network of 10 centers and a main office that uh, support sort of the overall distribution of unbiased knowledge about the ADA. Um, there's one per region, um, and we are funded federally to provide information, uh, education, and training, as well as to do research. Um, the Northwest ADA Center, uh, again, supports Region 10, so that's Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Alaska. And the idea of that regional center is just that we're um, we're here, we're in the correct time zone, we've got maybe some specialized knowledge about the region that we can help, uh, that will help us answer questions and provide better training. Um, our office is housed within the University of Washington Center for Com Continuing Education in Rehabilitation, that's CSER. Um, one of a few programs under CSER, including our partners, um, the Accessible Design and Innovative Inclusion Center, that's ADDIE. Um, they do things like site surveys and consulting around um, physical and web access. Um, the Vocational Rehabilitation Service for Professionals in Washington. Um, some online learning, conference coordination, as well as the Emerging Leaders uh, Institute in Rehab Medicine. So quite a broad um, little network there, and we're happy to have uh, that partnership. Um, Northwest ADA Center, again, uh, the, the on the screen here is an image of the states in our region. Um, we provide objective and unbiased current and accurate information about the ADA and related laws. Um, we are not lawyers or advocates. Um, that's a tough boundary and one where uh, our role really is to provide as unbiased information as possible and then to get people to their next right piece of information. Um, and so that's our that's our primary goal. And through uh, our grant, as I said, we provide technical assistance. So our phone number and email will be at the end of this presentation. And anyone can call us for information. Um, and we can be a great resource if, as a professional, you're concerned about an ADA issue, but you don't want to go to an enforcement agency for information. We can be a great resource for individuals with disabilities on any topic related to the ADA. We also provide trainings like this one. Um, we do research. Uh, currently, our primary research interest is in healthcare access um, and um, disseminate materials. So again, our, uh, oops, I've uh, moved on without showing you this slide. This is the list of things we do. Um, and uh, our website is full of great resources, one of which I will link to in this presentation. Um, common technical assistance topics include service animals, accessible parking, effective communication. We're going to talk about quite a bit of these here today, um, but just as an overview of things that we commonly discuss. Um, and then here is a screenshot from our beautiful website. Pretty standard stuff, but there's lots of great resources in here, including toolkits for employers and businesses, fact sheets about service animals and accessible design. Um, access checklists for buildings, um, et cetera. So that's the plug. We've gotten that out of the way and we'll move into an overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act here. So the ADA is the most comprehensive piece of civil rights legislation protecting the rights of people with disabilities in public space. Um, the purpose of the ADA is to provide the same rights and opportunities as everyone else and to prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities in all areas of public life. So the ADA assures the same rights and, and opportunities as everyone else and equal opportunity in all sectors. And the public life aspect is pretty important, um, as we'll see in the titles of the ADA. The ADA relates specifically to public space, employment, business state and local government entities and communication. So it's part of a network of disability uh, civil rights le legislature um, that protects people with disabilities um, and the ADA protects your public access rights. The ADA operates on a three-pronged definition of disability, 
uh, which is uh, embodied here on the slide with a cropped picture of a beefy arm of a statue holding a trident. Um, so uh, under the ADA, instead of providing a comprehensive list of what disabilities quote unquote count, um, the ADA instead provides this broad three part definition of what qualifies as a disability. And the reason that it does that is to avoid situations where the ADA is adjudicating what does and doesn't count. Um, that's uh, generally not something that the law is interested in doing. And instead, to determine whether discrimination on the basis of disability occurred uh, in the context of the situation, the individual, and how disability interacted with the um, instance. So with that in mind, um, the ADA defines, defines disability as either someone who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, someone who has a record of such an impairment, um, such as someone with a chronic or remittent uh, uh, diagnosis where they may or may not be experiencing symptoms uh, that impact major life activities or someone who is regarded as having such an impairment. So maybe someone with a physical difference that doesn't directly impact their ability to uh, do major life activities, but does result in discrimination based on their appearance. And again, this is deliberately broad. So also the term major life activity is quite broad. That can include anything from um, walking, hearing and seeing, um, thinking or communicating, uh, breathing. It's it's deliberately broad, um, caring for oneself. Essentially, again, the ADA doesn't want to adjudicate what does and doesn't count to a large extent and instead wants to um, provide kind of a broad uh, base of what could be considered a disability in the context of discrimination. The ADA is divided up into five titles, uh, which you had a hint about in that this one is, this presentation is about Title II. On the screen here is a cropped image of George H.W. Bush um, seated next to a disability advocate in a wheelchair and signing the ADA in July of 1990. Um, so the ADA's anniversary is celebrated on July 26th, and this year will be the 33rd anniversary of the ADA. Um, look out for programming in your area. There's often some really great celebratory programming um, around the anniversary of the ADA. So the five titles of the ADA, Title I addresses employment. Um, it pertains to any employer of 15 or more employees. And there's an asterisk there because uh, state laws may broaden that coverage. So in the Washington state, uh, Title I applies to employers of eight or more. Um, and Title I is enforced by the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Title II addresses public services. So that's state and local government entities or entities funded by state or local government funds. And that's enforced by the US Department of Justice. Title III addresses public accommodations, that's business and nonprofits, and that's also enforced by the DOJ. Title IV addresses telecommunication, which is primarily relay and captioning services, and that's enforced by the FCC. And then Title V, uh, sweet miscellaneous. And there's a little arrow here, just in case you forgot, we are here to talk about Title II. Um, before I do that, I'll say, so the asterisk here around employees is a good opportunity for me to add that, um, like I said, the ADA is not the only law that protects uh, the rights of people with disabilities. So um, in some cases, as we talk, we'll run into questions around things like housing or uh, education access or federally um, run spaces and how access is governed there. So there's a whole network of other laws that interact with the ADA, provide some similar protections in other spaces. Um, you all may be familiar with the Fair Housing Act, um, provides protections to people with disabilities in the housing space. The ADA broadly talks a little bit about housing, but really the FHA is where um, any disability protections in private housing uh, are housed. Pardon me. Um, 
the Rehab Act of 1973 governs federal access and um, IDEA addresses education access broadly. Um, and then, like I said, regarding employment, um, state laws can have a big impact on disability rights as well. So broadly, state and local laws can expand the protections of the ADA, but not contract them. So in the example of employment, uh, state law can require that employers uh, with smaller numbers of employees also follow uh, disability employment law, um, but they can't expand and say, or pardon me, contract by upping the number and say, oh no, only employers of more than 50 are required to follow the law. Um, that's a little maybe opaque, but um, it'll come up again as we're discussing some uh, elements of Title II. So just kind of want to plant that seed there. Okay, pardon me, I'm not trying to open that menu. Off we go. <laughs> uh, Title II, again, state and local government entities. And I will say just in the context of um, transit, uh, sometimes entities are both Title II and Title III. So um, sometimes a private company might be receiving state funds to perform a service that falls under Title II. In general, the ADA will ask that the more stringent requirements be followed, and that's going to be the requirements of Title II. So just to kind of keep that in mind as we move through this, if there's questions of like, is my entity a Title II or Title III? Generally, if there's any state or local government funding involved, Title II is going to be where you're going to look uh, with some exceptions. Uh, and that is not going to be the first time I say with some exceptions, because the big catchphrase of the ADA is really, it depends. So my goal here is to give some broad strokes about Title II and then um, arm you with the knowledge that you're going to have to uh, apply them to sticky situations, most likely, and to take a deep breath as that occurs. So Title II, state and local governments, this applies to spaces like counties and cities, transportation agencies, libraries and schools, courthouses, parks, and voting centers. And again, it's enforced by the US DOJ, Department of Justice, at both the federal level, and then there's generally state or county enforcement bodies that take on the role of enforcing the ADA at the state or local level. Um, Title II intends to provide equal opportunity for people with disabilities to participate in the programs and services offered by entities uh, funded by state and local government and the equal opportunity to benefit from those services. Um, it also intends for people with disabilities to receive the benefits of those programs and services in the most integrated setting possible. So to that goal, what's required of Title II entities, uh, they must make reasonable modifications to their policies and procedures. They must make programs accessible, um, ensure effective communication, perform a self-evaluation and post public notice, have an ADA coordinator transition plan and grievance procedure for institutions with 50 or more employees. And on this slide, the first three items, reasonable modifications, program accessibility, and effective communication are in bold. We're going to spend the majority of our time talking about those three. Um, Self-evaluation and transition plans are um, really a, a creature unto themselves. And you have uh, on your calendar today a transition plan uh, event. So I'm going to spend not a terribly large amount of time on um, the question of self-evaluation and transition plan, other than to just note that they are requirements under Title II. I'm going to spend the majority of my time on those first three here. So <laughs> before we dive in, here are some more of these uh, oblique and broad keywords. Um, Title II keywords, reasonable, effective, and readily achievable. Uh, what do those mean? <laughs> When a modification is reasonable, it's because it's considered reasonable. The ADA is often really circular in its language in an attempt to keep things broad and broadly applicable, but um, this can cause a lot of confusion. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the ADA sets those boundaries around these terms. 
Um, so something is reasonable up to the point that it is not, either on the basis of some of the limitations of the ADA that we'll talk about at the end, um, or because it's not effective for the person making the request. Um, similar for uh, effective communication. What makes communication effective is that it is effective. And uh, it is effective up until the point that it is not. <laughs> I'm, I'm harping on this a little much, but really I, I wanna be clear that the ADA provides guidance to a certain point, but really often doesn't provide answers. That can be really challenging. Um, so I'm hoping to give you some tools to understand kind of how to interpret that language and where to go when uh, interpretation is difficult. Um, so we'll start with reasonable modifications. Um, a state or local government agency must reasonably modify its policies, practices, or procedures to avoid discrimination. Um, I'll pause here again to talk about language a little bit. A big area of confusion for people working with the ADA or speaking around their rights uh, as people with disabilities is uh, that for some reason the ADA, well, probably for its own reasons, the ADA uses the terms reasonable modification and reasonable accommodation to denote really similar things. In the world of public space, Title II and III entities, um, when, you, when a person with a disability requests a modification to a policy or procedure, that's a reasonable modification. When a person in their workplace requests a modification of policy or procedure or uh, additional tools or resources to do their job, that's a reasonable accommodation. I find that it's kind of uncommon for people to know that distinction. And so I recommend just thinking of them as very similar. If someone comes to you and asks for an accommodation, you probably know about what they mean. But just to clear up any confusion before we get started, similar concepts, uh, unfortunately different, but very similar words uh, that I often trip up on as well. And here to start off also is our one of our first oblique words, uh, reasonable. So examples of reasonable modifications. On the screen here, there's um, two images. One is a, a, sign, a piece of signage that says no smoking, food, drinks, alcoholic beverages, glass containers, or animals allowed in the pool area. Um, and the other is an image of people standing uh, behind the sort of roped off area waiting in line. So a reasonable modification might be a modification to the food and drink or pet policy, um, as long as it is uh, not dangerous or a fundamental alteration of the program. A person with a disability can request things like, um, as, an, as a modification of the food and drink policy, someone with diabetes might need to bring food into an area where it's restricted. Or we'll talk about service animals in a minute, but someone might need to request a modification to the pet policy to bring their service animal. Um, I will note that the sign says no smoking first. Sm asking to smoke in a no smoking area is not considered a reasonable modification. And people who are active smokers are not um, considered people with disabilities. They may be people with disabilities outside of their status as people who use tobacco products but their right to smoke tobacco in a no tobacco zone is not a protected one. Um, in terms of the line, someone with mobility disability might uh, request that they not be required to stand in line and you might provide a modification such as calling them when it's their turn um, or directing them to a different desk uh, or scheduling an appointment outside of the sort of waiting hours. Um, there's really no restriction on what a reasonable modification can be, what the solution can be, as long as it's reasonable for the person with a disability and the entity and um, can be achieved in a timely manner and isn't an undue burden to the entity. And again, we'll talk about that toward the end, but um, reasonable modifications broadly are kind of an opportunity for creative thinking. Um, they can also come up in pretty stressful situations, um, but really the ADA doesn't provide a lot of guidance about what they can be, and uh, it's kind of up to the entity and the person making the request to determine what's going to be effective and reasonable. 
Um, when we think about uh, other elements of Title II that come into play here, um, it's important to think about who's included. Um, so non-discrimination eligibility criteria are um, allowed in some cases under Title II for access to programs and services, but there are some boundaries around how that happens. Um, so an entity may not use eligibility criteria for a service that screen out or tend to screen out people with disabilities However, neutral rules are permitted. So for example, a public pool um, could require that people uh, know how to swim um, to, at a certain level to sign up for a swimming class, um, but not um, make requirements about their um, bodily uh, needs or experience. Um, Integrations, we talked earlier about the most integrated setting possible. Um, it's important to keep in mind that a, a Title II entity may not deny participation of qualified people uh, with disabilities to programs and services. Um, separate programs are permitted when necessary, uh, but they may not exclude people with disabilities from the regular program. So to continue with the swimming pool uh, example, um, it's perfectly acceptable for a public pool to set up a separate swim class for people with disabilities, but they cannot insist that people with disabilities only sign up for the special separate swim class. They must still make uh, reasonable modifications uh, and provide appropriate access if someone wants to take the uh, integrated swim class. Um, unnecessary inquiries. So uh, this comes up especially around um, reasonable modifications and determining the appropriate modification or around effective communication. Um, the ADA prohib prohibits um, Title II and three entities from making unnecessary inquiries into the existence of a disability. Um, broadly, an inquiry would be considered unnecessary if the person's disability is obvious. Um, and if a person's disability is not obvious, some inquiry is permitted, um, but it must not be overly intrusive. So um, considering again, the like uh, what the interaction is like, what the request is like, how important it is for the entity to have this information, but requesting things like uh, medical records is really generally not appropriate in the context of a reasonable modification unless it's an ongoing issue and that information is really critical to making the modification or uh, meeting the communication need. But overall, um, keeping the inquiry at the base level for understanding and verification is, is what's appropriate. And then surcharges. So again, this comes up a lot around reasonable modifications and effective communication. Um, even if a modification is expensive, uh, a person with a disability may not um, be charged. So um, an entity may not place surcharges exclusively on individuals with disabilities to cover expenses associated with reasonable modifications and auxiliary aids and services. This comes up a lot around um, ASL interpretation. If someone requests ASL, um, it's not uncommon for an entity to think, oh, well, they need to pay for it. And that is not appropriate. The ADA really doesn't allow for um, the individual making the request to be charged for access. All right, a couple slides on service animals. This is a hot topic, so I've included more information than I might normally, um, just because there's always questions about service animals. Um, so service animals as defined by the ADA, are animals that have been individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability, uh, also known as the animal's handler. Only dogs and miniature horses are considered service animals under the ADA. And in Washington state, a service animal in training receives the same protections as a fully trained service animal. So this is one of those state laws where you can extend additional disability rights protections, but not less. So in the state of Washington, and actually in many states, uh, service animals in training also have uh, the same access rights as service animals. 
service animals are, again, any dog or miniature horse. Um, there's no restriction on breed or size of dog. Um, the miniature and miniature horse is key, so I guess there is a restriction there. Um, and a service animal must be performing tasks related to the disability. Um, a service animal can go anywhere the handler goes with few limitations, um, and those limitations are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, oh, pardon me. And when we say task related to disability, I want to pause there because um, I know most people are familiar with uh, seeing eye dog or guide dog as a service animal. Um, so that's a very kind of visibly recognizable uh, type of service animal in many cases. But a service animal may also be a medical alert animal, um, may, be, may uh, assist with physical mobility and stability. Um, may be doing a number of tasks, maybe um, a, a psychiatric alert animal. Um, so there's a number of tasks related to disability that a service animal might be performing. On the other hand, um, emotional support, comfort, and therapy animals are not covered under the ADA. Um, there are some state and local spaces where they may receive protection. I think the city of Seattle um, extends protections to emotional support animals. Um, but overall, they're not covered in the same way. Um, so a person with an emotional support, comfort, or therapy animal um, would not have the same rights to bring that animal to public spaces that a service animal user would. In that context, um, if uh, someone is one is unsure of whether an animal is a service animal, they're permitted to ask two questions. And when I say someone, actually, I want to be very clear that that's a business or a state or local government entity. This is not, I really don't want to encourage people to just, as citizens, walk around and, and inquire about service animals. Um, but if a public space is wondering whether something is a service animal, they're permitted to ask two questions. Those questions are, is this animal required because of a disability? And what task or service has this animal been trained to, to do? Um, those are the two questions. This is one area where the ADA is very clear. So um, you might notice in those two questions, there's no space for uh, requesting a demonstration, asking what the disability is, um, asking for documentation. Um, the ADA doesn't recognize any kind of service animal registry. Uh, there's no requirement for animals to wear vests or uh, have any kind of special documentation. Um, I know that sometimes people do this and there's certainly a lot of stigma um, placed on service animal users who feel like pressure to put their animal in a vest or to carry some kind of uh, internet purchased service animal card, which are broadly a scam. Um, but as a Title II entity, what you are permitted to do is just ask these two questions. Um, limitations of service animal access. So um, a service animal can be excluded um, if they're out of the handler's control. So if they're barking um, more than a little, uh, wandering away from their handler, or if they're not clean, um, or if they're a credible threat to others, um, snapping or biting at other people in the public space, um, or if they fundamentally alter or threaten the nature of the entity, for example, uh, a service animal most likely can't an enter a sterile hosp hospital room or a restaurant kitchen, or in some cases like a zoo or a petting zoo. Um, so in those contexts though, exclusion of a service animal does not, uh, is not tantamount to exclusion of the handler. So in the case that a service animal is excluded, um, the entity still has the responsibility to provide accommodations uh, to the person with a disability and come up with another way for them to access the goods and services um, provided by the entity. Um, that's pretty important because that's, as you can imagine, that can be pretty challenging. That's a very fraught situation. Um, and it's important to think creatively in that situation about how to provide those, the access and those services absent the service animal. So I just kind of went over this, but again, the responsibility falls to the public entity um, if the exclusion has occurred. 
And to learn more about service animals under Title II and III, you can check out our service animal FAQ fact sheet. Um, we also have a service animal comparison chart where you can see um, what kinds of animals are covered in what ways in each of the states uh, within our region, if you are curious about that. Okay, I'm gonna drink some water. That was a lot of service animal. Okay, um, so our next sort of broad responsibility under Title II is effective communication and the provision of auxiliary aids and services. The ADA requires that Title II entities um, and Title III entities as well um, communicate effectively with people who have communication disabilities. Um, and this would include um, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, people who are blind and have difficulty reading print materials, um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who may have difficulty understanding, people without natural speech who use communication devices. Um, the goal is to ensure that communication with people with disabilities is equally effective as communication with people without disabilities. And there's an asterisk here. Importantly, Title II entities must provide the form of effective communication preferred by the customer in most cases. So um, what that means is uh, both Title II and III entities are required to provide effective communication, but under Title II, um, the requested type of communication is generally required. So what that means is if someone is coming in for an appointment and they have requested ASL, in most cases, the Title II entity cannot say, um, no, we can't get an interpreter. Uh, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to use uh, CART or um, some other form of interpretation. Um, there are some situations where that might be appropriate, and we'll talk about that in the limitations section, but broadly, a, a more stringent requirement of Title II is providing the requested form of communication. Auxiliary aids and services are uh, tools for ensuring effective communication. Um, and the type of auxiliary aid and service necessary to ensure communication will depend on method of communication, the nature, length, and complexity of the communication taking place, and the complexity of what's being communicated. So auxiliary aids and services are anything that like facilitates making communication effective. They may be things like providing a large print copy of a form or document uh, for someone with a visual impairment or providing a digital or audio copy that are, is usable with screen readers. Um, it might include providing an ASL interpreter, video remote interpreting, or um, even in the case of uh, when we think about the nature, length, and complexity of the communication, sometimes you're going to be in a situation where someone just approaches the desk and is deaf or hard of hearing and needs to communicate. And they may initiate communication through passing notes or um, using uh, like texting or um, maybe even utilizing a companion. Um, that may be effective for short-term communication and that may be perfectly appropriate. And so it's important with auxiliary aids and services and effective communication broadly to monitor the communication situation and increase the level of access to ensure that communication stays effective as a conversation gets longer or more complicated or as documents get more complicated. So um, a person with low vision may be able to navigate a document just fine for a little while and then may need to request uh, auxiliary aid or service in some form in order to navigate something more complicated. Um, so that can be kind of an ongoing conversation. Um, determining the method again on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you're making this determination, you wanna consult with the person with disability and accommodate their preferred method of communication. Um, again, taking that nature of uh, the duration and complexity into account. Um, you want to protect the privacy of the individual, so giving them the opportunity to choose, but also um, not, you know, putting them on the spot in a way that's inappropriate um, or calling undue attention to their request. Um, effective communication and auxiliary aids and services must be provided in a timely manner. So 
it might be reasonable to say if someone shows up and says, I need an ASL interpreter right now, that may not be feasible. Um, but the answer can't just be no, right? It has to be, here's what we can do now. And here's the timeline on which we can secure an interpreter. Um, and most importantly, whatever you choose, it must result in communication that is effective. Effective being another one of these broad words that um, doesn't mean very much on its own and kind of has a circular logic within the ADA, but um, it's important to think about like how to constitute a definition of effective in each uh, interaction that you have. So if someone is understanding, able to communicate, um, the interaction is uh, successful and people leave, if not with what they want, then at least with all the information, that, that would be an effective uh, communication situation. Um, if understanding isn't happening and someone is unable to get access to the information that a non-disabled person would easily have access to, that's not effective communication. Okay, um, moving on to program accessibility. So this is the last kind of broad bucket of responsibilities that we're gonna talk about today. Um, program accessibility under Title II means that all programs must be readily accessible and usable to people with disabilities. Um, it applies to existing facilities viewed in their entirety. Um, Non-structural methods of access are appropriate. And again, the most integrated setting that is appropriate is the priority here. So just to define a couple terms, um, when we say all programs must be readily accessible and usable, um, this is kind of tied into the self-evaluation and transition plan. The ADA broadly kind of has an understanding that Title II entities, including um, state and local government agencies and schools and libraries and transit organizations, they might have, their programs might span a large amount of geography and a large amount of different kinds of facilities. And so, whereas in Title III, what you want to do is barrier removal, like removing physical access barriers that are readily achievable. Under Title II, you want to look at the program as a whole, so like the whole transit network or the whole library system, and ensure that the program is accessible. So what that means is if maybe if your city has eight library branches, a good amount of them need to be accessible, and the accessible ones need to not all be clustered in one quadrant of the city. Um, so that means that taken as a whole, people all over the city can access the programs and services of the library. When we talk about non-structural methods, this is about like other ways of delivering services. So if someone's closest library isn't physically accessible to them, how else might they access the program of the library? Maybe through um, remote uh, checkout and delivery or um, through access to um, kind of a, a phone checkout service, or maybe there's a, a interlibrary transfer system where they can send the books that they want from their closest library to their second closest library that's more accessible. Um, things like that are kind of the creative thinking around working within a larger Title II structure um, to provide program access as a whole. Um, integrated access for people with disabilities while working within the reality that maybe the whole system is not fully 100% structurally accessible. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the self-evaluation and transition plan around what areas of access does the system need to work on and how are we going to do that? So the program accessibility is kind of an ongoing project, just like the self-evaluation and transition plan um that you are going to access as a way of um creating ongoing access while addressing structural uh physical and access issues within the transition plan kind of according to that plan Whew, okay so we just kind of talked about this what does taken as a whole mean so that's the overall assessment of the program access across services and geography making sure they're not clustered and again, the transition plan should address program access um, with a working plan to improve overall access. 
Um, we talked about this already as well. The most integrated setting appropriate means that separate and specific services and programs are permitted and might even be popular and might even be a solution to access in many ways. However, they can't be the only avenue of access or the only program available to people with disabilities. So it's not acceptable to require people with disabilities to access your goods and services and programs only through those channels. Um, this is, I think, actually more of a Title III slide, but um, I kept it in here in terms of thinking about barrier removal. This is the general order of priority um, when we think about um, removing barriers to provide access. So there's three images on this screen. Priority one is the exterior route into the space. Priority two is the interior path of travel. And priority three is restrooms. Um, and this is more uh, to the facility access part of program access. Um, okay, so to recap, we've talked about reasonable modifications, what they are and kind of broadly how to make them. Um, program accessibility and barrier removal and effective communication. And then again, just to revisit this list, so self-evaluation, public notice, ADA coordinator, transition plan and grievance procedure are all related to each other in terms of this other process that should be ongoing for Title II entities around increasing access. And I'm gonna talk about those just briefly, but again, with the reminder that you all are gonna be uh, engaged in this um, uh, Title II transition plan workshop later today. So hopefully this is just a foregrounding for that. So a self-evaluation is an assessment of uh, the accessibility of all existing programs, facilities, and structures. Um, and public notice is the act of posting notice so that the public is aware that a self-evaluation is taking place um, and that a transition plan is in the works. Um, self-evaluation and transition plans should all be made public documents um, and are and along with those, a grievance procedure is required um, so that the public can make, uh, can put forward grievances related to accessibility of the programs and facilities. Um, a grievance procedure needs to have a reasonable response window where the public can expect a reply to their grievances. Um, and <laughs> The ADA coordinator broadly uh, would likely be involved in all of this. So the ADA coordinator is a position that's required um, of all Title II entities with 50 or more employees. Um, that's going to be a person who maybe is making this self-evaluation and transition plan happen. ADA coordinators are often housed in HR facilities or equity offices, um, and they're often uh, lonely and overworked. So if you only have one ADA coordinator, um, tell them they're doing a good job <laughs> and give them a hand. Um, I, I find that ADA coordinators are often kind of co-located in an area that makes sense, but that results in them being kind of overloaded. So this is just a shout out to ADA coordinators. You're working really hard. <laughs> That's a tough role. Um, and if you want to learn more about ADA coordinators or how to be one, um, either because your organization needs one or you would like to support your existing ADA coordinator, um, the ADA coordinator training certificate program um, is a great resource uh, for getting certified. Whew. Okay, again, you'll learn more about those, I think, uh, in the last session of the day. So I'm going to leave it at that and move on to limitations. So I referenced this a couple of times. This is kind of the mechanism through which an entity would say, no, we don't have to do that, or we can't do it like this, we're going to do it like this other way. Um, uh, just want to pause here and say, again, I'm, I'm bringing up a lot of um, things about the ADA that are kind of as they're written, seem <laughs> maybe not straightforward, but quite firm. And the reality is that these are all very challenging, squishy, interpersonal situations that people will have to deal with on one side or the other. Um, so I don't want to present these as if they are easy conversations, but just to kind of set you up with information. 
So in the context of limitations, um, first of all, we have personal devices and services. This one's pretty straightforward. There's no requirement to provide things that would be considered a personal device or service as a reasonable modification or part of access. So what we mean by that is things like eyeglasses, wheelchairs, personal communication devices, personal care attendants. Um, those are not required. Uh, those are things that you would reasonably expect someone would come in the door with um, or would need and use throughout their life and not just in public spaces or not just specifically in the Title II space. Um, so those are not required, even though in some cases there's confusion around this, like in a, maybe in a people become accustomed to the Target or Walmart provision of uh, grocery shopping scooters. That's a really um, useful thing for some people, but it's not a requirement to provide. And so their absence is not an appropriate reason to request one as an accommodation. Essentially, those are a helpful tool to people with limited mobility, but the store is not obligated to provide them. That would be a personal device or service, a power wheelchair. So other limitations are a bit more complex. Um, a Title II entity can deny a request for modification or access on the basis of either undue hardship or administrative burden, fundamental alteration, or direct threat. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about each of these. So undue hardship and administrative burden, um, this basically is the, that costs too much or is too hard denial. Um, so when an entity is going to claim undue hardship or administrative burden, the burden of proof is on the entity to explain why. So it requires an independent and thoughtful analysis and a consideration of all resources. So for example, to return to the library system, if one library office says, no, we can't provide that accommodation, we don't have the budget, it's not the budget of that one library that's at issue, it's the entire system's budget. And similar for administrative capacity, um, all the resources available within that entity need to be considered when denying an accommodation request, or pardon me, a modification request. See, I can't stop doing it either. Um, the head of the public entity should be the one writing a statement of the reasons um, for denying a modification or a mode of access. And um, any other action should be taken that will ensure equal benefits and services. So this is the most important thing for all of these, including, as we discussed, service animal exclusion. Um, it is still the responsibility of the entity to provide equal benefit and access to services, even if the requested uh, modification or type of physical access is impossible. So once undue hardship or administrative burden is claimed, it's still the responsibility of the entity to provide that access in some other way um, where the person is not excluded from the program. Fundamental alteration. Um, this one's a little bit more complicated to explain, but um, transit is actually kind of a good example. So a fundamental alteration is a change in the essential nature of the entity's programs or services. Again, um, an independent and thoughtful analysis needs to be conducted and a write-up needs to be done by the head of the public entity and any other actions need to be taken. So a fundamental alteration would be something like um, you know, so uh, it would it would be appropriate for someone to say, I need the bus to kneel so that I can get on. Um, I need wheelchair uh, access space on the bus, but it would be a fundamental alteration of fixed rate tra route transit to say, I need the bus to pick me up at this time exactly, or I need the bus to pick me up from my house. Those would be fundamental alterations of the concept of a fixed route transit system. However, things like paratransit are there to fill those gaps. So that's a great example of other actions that will ensure equal benefit to services is providing an, a, a different route, a uh, different service or program that will accommodate some of those needs rather than fundamentally altering the nature of the fixed route system. 
All right. And then direct threat is the final uh, sort of category of exclusion. And we talked about this with regards to service animals. So a direct threat to the health and safety of others, again, requires an independent and thoughtful analysis. Um, and the most important part of direct threat is that that analysis needs to be proven by facts, data, and medical community consensus. It can't be based on assumptions, stereotypes, or generalized fears. Um, so that might be, uh, to return to our swimming pool example, um, a person with a disability who the swimming pool operate uh, like team considers to be unsafe just on the basis of stereotypical knowledge of their disability, that's not direct threat. Um, the threat has to be real and unmitigatable. Um, another good example around service animals is like pit bulls or other breed restricted animals. Um, it's not appropriate to cite direct threat on the basis of a breed stereotype. The animal has to actually be a direct threat on the basis of its behavior, not on the basis of a sort of stereotypical uh, assessment of its potential behavior. So again, all of these can be interpreted a bit obliquely so that they're applicable on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's kind of the broad strokes of um, exclusions and limitations of Title II. Um, and the most important thing here that I really want to emphasize is that responsibility to provide access some other way. Um, I know that these conversations can really get challenging as um, these limitations get cited, but really not closing that door and saying no is the most important thing to keep the access conversation open and figure out a way to um, ensure that people that you're meeting that um, stated goal of equal access to benefit of program and services. And then offering assistance. So this is kind of uh, just a broad category. And I think the next um, uh, presentation will probably address this as well. So in the context of uh, public Entities um, always ask a person if they need assistance. Don't assume that they do. People with disabilities may need reasonable modifications or effective communication, but they also may just be going about their day. Um, so let people come to you with their access needs. Um, be creative and flexible and willing to think creatively to provide access on a case-by-case -case basis and be patient and give people the time to communicate what assistance they need. Um, again, sometimes easier said than done on both sides of these interactions, but best uh, practices being to um, assume autonomy, assume competence, and uh, move forward from a place of best intentions. Okay. All right, it's 1030. Um, I want to look at a couple of scenarios here, but I want to make sure I leave time for questions. So we'll move through these and take a look. Um, there's just a few. And then um, as questions come up, you're welcome to put them in the chat um, or uh, I'll hold about 15 minutes at the end here. Okay, so a few scenarios. We'll start with this, the notepad scenario. So a person approaches the front desk counter, presents a notepad that states, I have a question, I am deaf, and the person makes a writing gesture. What do you do and which ADA Title II, that should say Title II, um, principle do you apply to this scenario? So this one is gonna be effective communication. And um, in this case, what you're gonna do is provide them with a pen and paper as requested. Um, take your time to ensure understanding on both sides. And if the situation escalates in complexity, consider other ways of communicating effectively. Um, what you're not going to do is speak in a slow or exaggerated manner, attempt to communicate in an unrequested manner, such as gestures or lip reading. You're not going to refuse service until an interpreter is present, and you're not going to rush the person or fail to provide the requested access method. All right, the ASL interpreter scenario, and there's a drawing of a person doing sign language um, on the screen. Um, so a client requests an ASL interpreter for an upcoming face-to-face -face meeting. 
Your coworker says that the client will probably bring their own interpreter like a family member and that the team shouldn't worry about it. What should you do? This is another effective communication scenario. Um, I don't know if we really talked about this, but what you should do, if at all possible, arrange for a qualified ASL interpreter to be present at the meeting and inform the requester once the interpreter has been secured. Um, and as we discussed, if, if uh, arranging for a qualified interpreter isn't possible on the timeline, uh, you should inform the requester of that too and figure out whether you can reschedule or whether another form of communication will be equally effective. What you're not gonna do is rely on the requester to bring their own interpreter or ask their companion to in act as an interpreter or ask the requester to pay for the cost of the interpreter or fail to provide any means of communication. And what's important here too is that um, when we talk about, so on the what to do, we've got the word qualified ASL interpreter here and qualified is important. So uh, a person's companion may be um, perfectly able to communicate with them. And in some cases they may prefer that, but overall, if they request interpretation, asking a family member is not really appropriate and it is never appropriate to ask someone's child to interpret for them very really want to underline do not ask people to use their children as their asl interpreter even if that communication is already happening do not do it all right hard copy scenario so you hand a customer a routine form to fill out and they tell you that they have a hard time reading it because they have bad eyesight what do you do and which title two principle do you apply this is also effective communication. Um, so what you're gonna do is if possible, you're gonna create a large print copy of the form. Um, if this is impossible to do expediently, you can discuss the best way forward while honoring their request. So you may wanna create an alternative digital copy um, so that they can use their screen reader to read it. You may wanna read the form out loud to them so that they can take the information in um, that way. But what you're not going to do is refuse to provide a copy on the basis that it is difficult. And you're also not going to interrogate the person about their vision and disability status. So this is a good example of a um, when you might not need to do a uh, verification of disability. On this in this situation, this this shouldn't this isn't too big an ask. The person is struggling to engage with the form as it is. There's no need for medical verification. Uh, in order to provide a large print or digital copy of the form. Um, so it shouldn't be necessary to get any more information about their bad eyesight. The way that they phrased that is their choice and um, it's just your responsibility to provide access. All right, and we've pretty much already gone over this, but the pet scenario, again, this is uh, your center has a no pets policy. And it's clearly posted on the sign. A customer has entered this, the center with, I won't say service, we'll say an animal. Uh, and there's an illustration here of a person walking with a service animal with um, appears to be a uh, guide dog as it has the handle um, on its little jacket. Um, so what do you do and which title applies to this scenario? This is a reasonable modification of the pet policy. So what you're gonna do is leave them be. <laughs> Um, unless they need something from you, you can just leave it alone. Um, or if you're unsure whether the dog or miniature horse is in fact a service animal, you can ask those two permitted questions. But what you're not gonna do is ask for verification, uh, like a document of service animal status. You don't need to ask why the animal's not wearing a vest. You're not gonna ask the person for a disability status disclosure or for a demonstration of the animal's task. And you're not gonna pet the animal without explicit permission. Um, just a baseline. I think we all get this, um, but this is a yeah good opportunity to just leave it be as long as the animal is behaving appropriately um, and it seems like it's a service animal. Um, but again, those two questions are what's available to you in terms of verification. Okay, and that uh, takes us to 1037. So here are some resources. Um, the ADA Building Blocks course is a great place to get started on the ADA basics. Um, there's a lot of great resources on this sheet. And then as well, our um, website is here on this contact slide. So there's lots of great fact sheets on our website that you can um, take a look at, including that service animal comparison chart 
and uh, Title II toolkit. Um, there's also our phone number and email address up here. Um, and again, you can contact us for technical assistance uh, through either of those if you have questions um, about the ADA that we can help you with. Okay, those are that's the presentation. So I'm going to stop my screen share here and open it up to questions. I believe towards the beginning of the presentation, uh, Hansi uh, asked a question uh, in regards to like a slide towards the beginning. And that question was, what is the context of requiring a record of impairment? Does requiring a record of impairment create barriers? That's a great question. Yeah, that's um, kind of why we, why the ADA kind of draws a line around that being kind of as needed. I think, um, a record of impairment request certainly does, um, I think it, it increases the labor of the person with a disability and prolongs the conversation about a modification. Um, I think the general guidance would be that that really shouldn't be necessary in most cases. Um, if there's a scenario where a modification is a larger ask, either a larger financial ask or more difficult to uh, set up administratively. There may be a reason why if someone's disability isn't apparent, a verification needs to happen. Um, but overall, I think um, letting people kind of tell you what they need is the best practice. Does that help? People are welcome to, to unmute, or if there's questions in the chat, if you wouldn't mind reading them, that'd be great. Jeff, uh, Jeff Rivers has a question. Oh, great. Has his hand up. Feel free to unmute, Jeff. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Sabine. Great presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, got a question for you. You mentioned the AD8 uh, certification program. Can you uh, talk a little more about that, please? Absolutely. So the ADA cord, oh my gosh, I always get this acronym wrong because in my opinion, it is one too many words. Um, the ADA coordinator certification training program, ADA CTP, um, is a national program that is housed within one of the regional centers. Um, and I can actually drop the link in the chat. I'll do that, find it real quick. Um, it is a program that um, we'll get you ADA uh, coordinator certified, and um, it can be accomplished, I think, typically it takes about a year, year and a half to get the credits. Um, if you're interested, the ADA symposium is coming up pretty soon, both the virtual and in person, and that can be a great place to get credits. But just one moment, I'll find that. Uh, link. There we go. Okay, that is in the chat. And essentially, Great, the, the shape of that program is um, taking a certain number of credits of ADA basics, so addressing it, uh, each title and some key issues, including um, uh, the, the 2010 building standards, um, transition plans, and effective communication, and then a certain number of kind of elective credits in any kind of specialty area you might be interested in. I think it's something like 40 credits total. Um, and and then you're a certified ADA coordinator, which is very exciting. Feel free to go off mute, can't you? <laughs> hey, yeah, so I, I sent another question in the chat, but I also wanted to elaborate it a little bit. Um, generally, what I see is, as you've mentioned, there there are two questions that employees are legally allowed to ask of service animals to determine the um, verification of it. And 
what I've kind of seen in conversations is that employees don't want to ask those questions. You know, they're afraid of crossing boundaries. They're afraid of reactions from people. And essentially, you know, what we've kind of seen in the rise of illegitimate service animals is they're just kind of, um, you know, everywhere and causing implications for legitimate service animals. So in my own personal circles, I have had um, disabled people advocating for employees asking these questions um, and kind of being like, you know, if it's a real service animal, they, the handler should know these questions you're allowed to ask um, versus someone who maybe, you know, like got an ESA registration off a site and doesn't really understand the actual kind of rules. So what are your thoughts on kind of that balance in general and encouraging employees to ask questions that they're legally allowed to ask? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So <laughs> the ADA as a law, I think, is lacking in the support for these interpersonal challenges. Like it is really, I can, as someone who has previously worked in, in well, like with the public, I can extremely empathize with the like tension of needing to ask these questions for safety reasons um, and also feeling anxious about either putting someone in an uncomfortable situation or getting a lot of pushback. Um, I do think that, as you say, like most people with uh, service animals are, in many cases, they're aware of the questions that are allowed. And I think also generally just used to, like people, people with service animals overall, I find are just anxious about when someone is going to ask them this question, but not unprepared for it. Um, whereas I, the issue of people with a printout certification online, I think education about the fact that those don't come from the Fed is important. Um, and education for employees about, you know, what the ADA does consider a service animal is important. And then yeah, because those questions are allowed, people can ask them. But the ADA unfortunately doesn't provide a lot of guidance about how much, when, in what way. And I think in a in a workplace, like creating some support around how, you know, if this is coming up a lot, how are we going to communicate about this? Do people feel supported to ask questions and um, address access in that way? where they're not feeling like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask these two questions. And then my manager is going to be like, why did you, why did you do that? Um, versus are people feeling, I don't know, I think broadly conflict is always hard and um, setting employees up for, uh, to, to feel supported and able to have that conversation and feel like they know where their boundaries are in terms of having some conflict there is probably the best bet. And then knowing that like those questions are legally permissible. So regardless of a bad reaction, that's a protected right on the employee's side as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like that was kind of a duck walk, but it's a duck walky issue. Well, there isn't any questions we can <laughs> end a fine. little early uh, before right. 11. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sabine, for that great presentation on the ADA. Absolutely. Really yeah, thanks so much for having me and feel free to get in touch with us. Um, I'll be sending my uh, slides along as a PDF. Um, so y'all are welcome to distribute that to the attendees and feel free to get in touch if questions come up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, with that, uh, since we're ending a little early, we're going to break until 11.10. Uh, and we'll reconvene for our Q&A with uh, uh, our staffers from SDOT. And uh, yeah, so with that, Brock, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't have anything to add. Uh, we just we look forward to seeing you at 1110. Um, so um, see you then. Yeah, so today we have Tom Hewitt, the ADA coordinator with Seattle Department of Transportation. In the past, he's worked as the director of service development at the Maryland Transit Administration. 
In that position, he led the creation of the service plan, desktop optimization, and development of the operating implementation implementation plan for Baltimore Link. And we have Michelle, who is an associate transport transportation planner with the Seattle Department of Transportation. She is also an affiliate instructor at the University of Washington, where she instructs courses such as climate optimism and a race and social justice seminar. Uh, so Thomas and uh, Michelle, could you give me kind of what you do within your roles, uh, starting with Michelle? Yeah, I can give a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Michelle Abunaja. I use she, her pronouns. I work in the transit, transit service and strategy team within transit and mobility at the Seattle Department of Transportation. I work on coordinating for the Seattle Transportation Plan's transit element on our next update. And I also work on a suite of climate projects and also transit access and um, delivery projects. So I'm excited to chat with you all today and I'll pass it on to Tom. Great, thanks, Michelle. Uh, my name is Tom Hewitt. I'm SDOT's ADA coordinator um, within our project development division in SDOT. Um, I wear multiple hats. Um, so on one side, I am, you know, the the all of SDOT's ADA coordinator. So I deal a lot with um, uh, with ADA accommodation requests, with any type of accessibility complaints, and work with different program and project owners and managers in order to, um, you know, provide solutions to these issues. Um, so that is one side. The other side, um, I'm the ADA program manager, um, specifically delivering on our um, commitments for curb ramp compliance. Um, we're under a consent decree up until 2035 to deliver 1,250 curb ramps annually. So we uh, make sure that we work with all of our partners, both internally and externally, to deliver on those commitments and um, allow us to be building curb ramps in the public right of way. So what inspired you to get involved in transportation planning with a focus on mobility justice and universal design? What experiences or perspectives have influenced your approach to this work? Great. Um, so I grew up in both urban and rural places. And in when we were living in an urban place, um, we were very transit dependent and we saw transit as an access to opportunity. It was how we got all around the city. And then when we moved to a rural area, um, we had to get a car and there was no transit service where we grew up. And so because we didn't have a car um, at that time. So I think very early on, I just had awareness of taking the bus and how much extra time that might take or how you might need to plan your diff day differently, especially because um, our cities are often planned more for private vehicles than they are for public transit. And so because of this very early on awareness, especially when we moved to a rural area um, and needed a car and became car dependent, um, I started to question why it was that way and ultimately decided to go to school to study planning for those reasons. Um, which I'm very thankful for. It gave me a deeper perspective on how to approach um, urban planning, especially because I had fantastic faculty um, at Eastern Washington University who focused on tribal planning. I was then able to go to the University of Washington where I could learn a little bit more about the civil engineering behind some of the planning work that I was interested in and also some of the climate analytics that I was interested in to do some of the greenhouse gas accounting for the capital projects that we're focusing on and hope to deliver on. So the personal experience led toward the academic and eventually professional experience. But overall, I care about um, all modes of travel being dignified and easy and at minimum safe, but at best enjoyable. And so that's why I went into planning. And that's why I focus in this area of um, equity and transportation. I'll pass it to Tom. Great, thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, I I really just have a passion for the mo movement of people and want people to you know be able to move freely, um, you know, and choose how they want to go where they need to go and feel safe about doing that. Um, I grew up in northern New Jersey, about ten miles away from New York City. So, um, you know, yes, it was a suburb, but um, it was. It was a little strange for folks to driving into the city. You know, you always took public transit to get in there. Um, and again, being for, you know in in New York, um, you get around by transit. That's that's the way folks do that. 
Um, so I really, you know, having that right at my doorstep, you know, really brought me into this kind of urban fabric and this multimodal, um, you know, environment. Um, then I went to school in central Ohio, went to, I'm a Buckeye, went to Ohio State. Um, and I really uh, learned to love the, you know, the local bus network. And I know there's always been, you know, differences between light rail versus buses, but to me, transit's transit, you know, getting, getting people outside of single occupancy vehicles and using any form of, of alternative transportation, again, using transit. Um, so that really got me into understanding more about, um, you know, urban planning and how development goes. Um, I had my undergrad in sociology and uh, social psychology. I really like had an understand or wanted to get a better understanding of how people think and, um, you know, especially when it comes to the built environment. So um, after my undergrad, I stayed in Columbus and I got my master's in city regional planning. Um, so I focused on kind of the built environment um, and, and all the aspects, social, um, you know, aspects of uh, movement and, and getting people to where they need to go. Um, I also took a couple courses in universal design way back when um, and really got an understanding in some of the facilities on campus and how they were constructed to be universally designed or you know designed uh, in inclusive design as we heard yesterday um, and, and really opened my eyes to um, this idea to be designing for everybody you know and and how it's a wider range of folks. Um, my mother um, also has mobility issues. So from a personal perspective, um, you know, understanding things such as, you know, locations of accessible parking and having lower slopes and having, um, you know, handrails on things like that, you know, it, it kind of brings, brings me home with um, making sure that we're designing for, for all folks' needs. Um, and then I'd be remiss without saying, um, I have, uh, now they're eight, but or they're gonna be eight, uh, seven-year-old uh, triplets. And um, so again, from a universal design perspective, um, we had our triplet wagon. And ironically enough, it was the size, the, the same envelope as your um, typical mobility device wheelchair, 30 by 48 inches. And so whenever my wife and I would be going to places, I would right there understand, okay, you know, me being an able-bodied person, having difficulty navigating through whether it's a restaurant or a sidewalk or something like that, you know, I have the, you know, I have the privilege to be able to pick up the, the triplet wagon and be able to move it around or pick it over curbs. And a person in a mobility device does not have that ability. So that really, you know, kind of brought me, you know, grounded me in, okay, yes, you know, um, I do not have a mobility disability, um, but making sure that we're designing spaces for, you know, all folks and, and um, you know, not just able-bodied folks was really important for me um, and really influenced my work in, you know, how uh, we get around and making sure we're getting around um, in, a, in an equitable fashion um, and, again, in a safe fashion um, for everybody. Thank you. Uh, just to back up a little bit, how do you both define mobility justice personally and why do you think it's essential to consider it in transportation? Uh, <laughs> Tom, you can answer that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, how I define it is, you know, kind of back to my, a little bit more of my passion, you know, how it's the facilitating the movement of people, um, where they want to go and how they want to get there safely and comfortably, but prioritizing modes that support the widest usage. And when I say that, I really focus on non-single occupancy vehicle because not everyone can drive and also not everyone can afford having a vehicle and all the associated costs, um, you know, but we also have to be aware that um, especially, you know, some of the things that I deal with on a daily basis is, you know, unfortunately cars are part of our transportation system, but we have to, when we're, when we're dealing about, you know, mobility justice, we wanna make sure that we're prioritizing accessible parking, accessible passenger loading zones and, and keeping those things available and in mind. Um, and also, you know, slowing down vehicles doesn't reduce access. Um, there's been, you know, questions and comments that I've gotten from folks about, you know, closing streets or making, you know, our, our healthy streets or our neighborhood greenways and, you know, folks saying that, oh, yeah, it's a reduction, you know, it's a reduction of ADA and it's, well, no, it's, it's slowing down, you know, the movement of vehicles. And I think that's all part of mobility justice because, you know, there is this wide continuum of how people can get to where they need to go. We just want to make sure as transportation professionals that it's done in an equitable way and that people can enjoy and feel safe getting to where they need to go and not having it be another stressor in their life. 
-hmm. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to, you know, Tom really summarized it well. And I think I can just add that, as I said before, it's that where folks feel at minimum safe and even better if they enjoy the commute and enjoy being in the street. Um, I think I also like to view mobility justice, not just in the lens of people throughput or vehicle throughput, but just the feeling of being on the street, like the small interactions that you get, the, the land use supporting those small interactions. There's all of these additional components that we can dive into later. Um, but overall, I think the justice in this is that we've created places where people get to be human and have human interactions when we don't prioritize folks um, who aren't in vehicles, we are signaling to them that they're not as valuable in the right of way. And the justice piece of this is that everyone who is using the right of way is valuable. And so I think overall, I try to center that in my work, um, especially because many of the reasons why we're traveling is not just for you know, personal benefit to run errands and so on, it's access to opportunity, um, access to jobs. And I think uh, supporting folks who are traveling outside of a vehicle, um, trying to access that opportunity, it's the best way we can support them is creating an enjoyable environment for them to do that. And so that's how I like to see mobility justice from the infrastructure lens, but also from this emotional lens um, as we step out into the street. Uh, what transportation projects have you both worked on that is exemplify either universal design or mobility justice? Shall we? Did you say me? <laughs> I can I can kick it off. <laughs> um, so I don't want to have give you my whole resume, <laughs> but I'll I'll try and be brief. Um, I've had the fortune of falling into ADA very early in my career. Um, I worked on ADA projects in rural towns in Eastern Washington, and it was such a pleasure getting to work with these smaller cities, um, especially because they're, you know, they're very engaged, they're interested in delivering, um, it, their populations and communities are smaller, and they're also very engaged, and so it it's just fun to get to deliver sidewalks and um, public right-of-way where people use it quite frequently, um, especially in those smaller towns where I think there's sometimes the priority on capital infrastructure like water or sewer or other things. It's nice to see the prioritization of public right-of-way improvements as well. So that's, that's one area. Um, I've also had the awesome opportunity while working for the Port of Seattle's Maritime Environmental Team where we made a multi-use pathway. Um, and that was just an unlikely project where we got to really deliver on um, putting paint in the ground on the ground within six months, which is just probably never going to happen to me again in my career. But it was a good <laughs> it was a good time from concept to delivery and seeing folks use the pathway off of the street in a safer area the next day after the paint had dried. And so it's sometimes um, rewarding to see that the uh, treatments for the right of way can be as simple as paint um, to redirect folks onto a safer path. It doesn't always have to be multi-million dollar projects um, that rip up the concrete and change the entire landscape or infrastructure. And so those are just a few examples. And one more from the policy realm is um, I currently work on the Seattle Transportation Plan's transit element, where we have an opportunity to really deliver quality transit service among other um, modes of travel that support transit. So walking to transit, biking to transit, or just those modes uh, to get to your destination independently. And it's always important to have a very strong policy infrastructure to support the work you want to do later down the line. And I'm very um, excited to be a part of that development so we can see more improvement in our right of way in Seattle in the future. I'll pass it to Tom. Great, that was awesome, Michelle. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the projects that I've worked on, um, you know, out of grad school, um, I worked as a consultant down in Tampa, Florida, and uh, we had a lot of contracts around the state and also some with the federal government, um, you know, regarding station assessments. So um, the key station assessments as part of the FTA, and then also transition plans, um, you know, throughout Florida. So, um, you know, I think it was a matter of working on these these elements, but you know, through my throughout my career, it was more about 
going above the minimum. And that's something that we'll discuss, you know, I'm sure further uh, later on in this, you know, in this Q&A is that, you know, it's really important to go beyond the minimums of the ADA. You know, that should be seen, you know, an experience as a floor and not the ceiling, not, you know, not a checkbox that we have to just meet. Um, and, you know, examples of that are things such as, you know, wider curb ramps, wider sidewalks, you know, the, the 2010 ADA standards, a three feet, 36 inches is an accessible route. You know, the pedestrian access route within the public rights of way accessible guidelines, only four feet. Um, but in our city of Seattle standards, our standard sidewalk width is six feet. And I know we will always want to have even wider sidewalks. Um, you know, something else is just sim something as simple as aligning curb ramps with crossings. I know that could be problematic, especially in the public right of way with other utilities and, and things like that. But, you know, working with our design teams and engineers to make sure that, you know, it's not just meeting the letter of the ADA, but again, being usable for everybody. Um, and that includes, you know, where, where you're looking at the context of the, the sites. Um, is it a high activity center, a high pedestrian trip generator? Is there, you know, transfer locations with transit? And you, there's going to be a lot of people moving back and forth. So it's all these things that, you know, you really have to make sure that it's not just meeting the ADA. Um, you know, you think about locations, you know, throughout the country where it's, you know, a huge pedestrian uh, trip generator or activity location, and yet there's a four foot wide curb ramp that, you know, is not really useful um, when you have, you know, hundreds of people, you know, crossing an intersection at the same time in places such as like New York City. Um, so I think that's, you know, projects like that, that we worked on, um, you know, me within, um, you know, Florida, within my position in Maryland, and now here in Seattle, is just stuff I want to um, further expand on. Um, something else when it comes to universal design principle is things such as tactile wayfinding. You know, this is something where the ADA, the 2010 standards, and even PROAG do not really cover a lot of, um, you know, elements when it comes to tactile walking surface indicators. And that's really the, the, the broad term, which many of us are aware of detectable warning surfaces. You know, that's the truncated domes um, at the foot of curb ramps or along transit platforms that denote a hazard. Um, but you know, tactile wayfinding. And that's something where, you know, we work with our urban design groups to make sure that if we don't, you know, if we have a wide plaza or if we have, you know, wider sidewalks, uh, we want to make sure we're providing cues for people with vision disabilities, people who are using canes to be able to provide guidance um, along a pathway and to make it safe. Um, you know, there's a lot of projects that I work on, a lot of projects that I'm able to comment on and like our, our Safe Start Street cafes, things like that, where, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a great idea, and, um, but it's all in the, the details and the delivery, because if you start expanding sidewalk cafes and, you know, or cafes into the sidewalk and into the pedestrian access route, you want to make sure that you have these cues so that a person using a cane is not going to be traversing a sidewalk and then getting startled because they're walking into people who are sitting down or into retail racks and stuff like that. So I think these are things where, um, you know, it, it falls between ADA, but then more so universal design because we want people to be able to experience these things and feel safe and comfortable doing so. Yeah, uh, how do you measure the success of transportation projects in terms of their impact on mobility justice and accessibility? And Tom, you kind of touched on that, so you elaborate a little more. Okay. Um, I mean, from my my perspective, um, really, there's no in my in my perspective, no formal measurements for what we're doing. Um, but we want to focus on a reprioritization of what we need with regards to trip generators. And again, what is the existing network, and how can we improve that network access? So whether it's accessible sidewalks, you know, the you know the number of blocks or the number of feet with accessible sidewalks, APS, bike networks, stuff like that. So I think it's 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 part of uh, usage and benefit and looking at the activities, um, but then also you know I would say and I'm I'm not saying this is a joke but really fewer complaints about stuff you know when you um, and and depending on the complaints because I want to be specific because it's the substance of the complaint I know a lot of times we'll get complaints from people about taking parking away but we're expanding a sidewalk and making it more accessible and more universally and inclusively designed because we're widening sidewalks, but we're relocating parking. So, you know, I think when we're talking about bigger projects, 
it's understanding the substance of when we're getting feedback from the community and using our professional judgment to to kind of sift through those comments um, to make sure that we're addressing you know um, the needs of the people who are going to be using that that you know infrastructure and making sure that we're again um, following the following their needs. Uh, you know, other than that, um, from my perspective, um, we don't really have you know specific measures, but it's really just about um, listening to the community and making sure that we're you know adhering to what the community needs following our requirements and then going above and beyond from an inclusive design perspective. Thanks, Tom. I would say, um, at least in my role, um, so I've spent a lot of time in the field surveying and then taking that data, prioritizing it, crunching it, and then you know we deliver and we see some folks using it. And I really wanna highlight what Tom said is, the nature of feedback we get um, is such a great indicator of how folks are using the space in Seattle. I'll just speak from our department's perspective. Um, I know that we've conducted public life studies after um, work has been implemented. We also do um, uh, the Move Seattle levy counts widgets, <laughs> essentially, how many of X have we delivered on? And I think that's really important. But early on, I talked about the emotions of a place because I'm from an area or I grew up in an area where there were these nice wide sidewalks um, that didn't have any discrepancies in the slope and no one used them. And that was because there was a culture of driving supported by the land use. And so I think the success is really if we're able to go back and observe through public life studies, if folks are actually using what we've built, um, I think it's very easy to to see a place and say, oh, well, the culture isn't there um, as if we only experience culture, but we also influence culture. And at SDOT, I think, especially as managers of the right of way, we have an opportunity to evolve that culture further. And we do so when we go back and look how look at how people are actually using the right of way that we've created for them. And so I think public life studies are one of the best ways we can do that. There are many, many ways we can do that in Seattle and we can get this uh, get to this a bit later in um, some of the other questions, but we also conduct focus groups where we compensate members and get to learn how they actually use the space and what how they feel in that space because engaging in the public realm is a very um, emotional experience and we, we like to hear that and see how we can improve it. So that's one way um, and I'll just reiterate the ways that Tom highlighted are also um, um, important to me in some of the projects and workloads that I manage. Both of you kind of touched on this on your answer, your prior answer, but how do you incorporate feedback from diverse community members uh, in your transportation planning process? Um, I can start on this one. <laughs> so, um, I'm really grateful to be a part of a fantastic team that does a lot of reflection um, and we do a lot of equity specific reflection and that's supported by our colleagues like Anya Pintak who leads the transportation equity work group. Um, so one way I think about engagement and how we how we reflect on improving is going back to the transportation equity work group and asking them um, did what we deliver on resonate with you? Is this how you're using it? In conducting focus groups, we'll wait until you know a, a treatment has had time to kind of integrate itself into the system. So that could be a year, six months. It's really dependent on the project. Um, but one of the many ways we do that is by looking at what we have at SDOT called equity tactics and making sure those tactics are worked into our portfolio of work so that we can go back and say, well, tactic 52.2 about community engagement, did we follow through on that? I'm gonna double check on my work plan and here's all of my tasks and items where I can engage with the transportation equity work group, who's a diverse group of um, compensated community members who, come to Seattle and live and work in Seattle to tell us if we're doing the job that we think we're doing based on the priorities we co-developed with community. So I think that is um, the first way and like the best way to kind of earnestly listen to the community and incorporate their feedback and follow up with them again because they've helped us 
create our priorities and also continue to help us evolve our, our priorities after we've delivered on what we said we hope to. So that's one, but I'll pass it to Tom. I know there are others. Yeah, no, and no, no, thank you, Michelle, because I think you hit a lot of those great points. Um, you know, it's really about listening to the community and, and kind of really refining what the project goals are. Um, you know, many times, and we'll be discussing this later on as well, is, you know, sometimes we don't come back to certain locations for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So we want to make sure that we're expanding, when feasible, expanding the project scope to really address, you know, a bunch of different concerns from the community. And that, you know, we have to be listening to all different, um, you know, um, groups within the community. Again, this diverse, uh, you know, community members. But now I, I take it back to something I learned in grad school, and it's it kind of like a concept that, you know, as a as a child, it was, you know, it's it's really called sense making, asking why, you know, just continuing to ask why and diving deep into really the underlying um, needs and desires and goals of the community. Because a lot of times we'll get questions or comments about something. And, you know, we're professionals, we have a, a a certain level of, of technical acumen and understanding of regulations and laws, the public don't always, don't always have that, that level of specificity with what the issues are and what they're really trying to get out of it. So they may you know, have a comment or a, a concern, and then we start to ask why, and then it evolves into, oh, if this is, this is your underlying concern, and these are ways that we can address it that they may not be thinking about. They may not even realize that that is a, a feasible solution to address said issue. So it's really, you know, this, this constant communication, this two-way street, you know, two-way communication, if you would, with the community, you know, on, on this feedback. Um, because, yeah, again, asking why, understanding the project goals, um, and then, again, using our professional judgment to aid in the prioritization. Because, you know, I'd love to say everyone's comments treated equally, but when you have folks that have certain, you know, um, certain priorities, there's going to be conflicts. And as a job, as a professional, transportation professional, that's our job to, you know, use our judgment and, and weigh those things. Again, a business is going to want parking right in front of their street, you know, but maybe that's going to be at odds with um, a, a bike lane or a wider sidewalk or something like that. Um, so again, it's it's making sure that we're we're aware of um, of these comments and understanding you know what the goals are. Um, and I'll provide a couple of good examples. A um, couple of them very recent. Um, you know, I got a request. Um, and for those of you who don't know, you know, um, we have a project that um, we would be closing a, a good portion of Lake Washington Boulevard here in Seattle um, on the weekends. And um, we got complaints about. Uh, you know, people wanted vehicle access because, and they said it was a, it was an ADA issue because we were closing it down to cars. And, you know, my, my responses were, well, you know, Lake Washington Boulevard currently is not accessible. It's not fully, you know, accessible for people of, you know, of all abilities. And so long as we are able to understand the need needs of this person, where are they trying to go? Are they using Lake Washington Boulevard as a pass-through or are they trying to enjoy the lake and the beautiful vistas that, that the boulevard provide? And you know, closing this temporarily is actually an enhancement because then folks can use the entire street and sidewalk for you know, this enjoyment rather than just you know, having a very small section of sidewalk that's available and you know, have some potential like uh, safety and comfort concerns, you know, when, when you have vehicles on there. So again, it's, it's a matter of asking the right questions um, and then just having that dialogue and again, using our professional judgment to, um, you know, have the best solutions and going back to the community and, and seeing if that addresses their needs. Tom, I'd like to add to some of what you shared. I think that was a great, yeah, you shared some great um, examples on how we communicate with community. And I just want to highlight in my experience building policy with community. Um, our comms mm -hmm. team does a fantastic job on getting down to the why and asking very thoughtful questions that will elicit 
the true responses that we're trying to get from the community. There's often, like you mentioned, Tom, this higher layer of this is what we want change. And then when we get down into the nitty gritty and continue to ask how come or how could this be different, we find five solutions to a problem. And I think that has been a great experience that I've had uh, with our comms teams. Of course, we always have room to grow in our engagement with community and there can always be more engagement. But I think we're trending toward a path of co-creating with community. And we see that with the Seattle Transportation Plan as well. There's been opportunities online to engage, in person to engage. We have an ongoing engagement hub where folks can drop pins and leave comments. And some of the comments have been incredibly informative. And I don't know that we would have even gotten them in a personal space, the way in, in person space, excuse me, the way we have gotten them online. And so just creating multiple avenues to give feedback and uh, asking very intentional questions has really helped us engage with community in an earnest way. And I look forward to how we can do that more. That's great. Uh, um, you mentioned kind of the closing off the street and people complaining or saying that is the ADA kind of problem. Uh, how can those working within the field ensure projects not only comply with the letter of the ADA, but also advance the spirit of the law? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the I said before, the ADA should be the floor and not the ceiling, you know, when we're talking about, you know, projects, you know, I, I deal, I, I'm not going to be ashamed, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that, you know, there's still folks, you know, within our organization and throughout the country, in my experience, that just use the ADA as a box to check off, you know, they come to me, okay, what, what do we have to do to comply um, with the ADA? And you know, I always go back to them. It's like, well, how is it used? You know, do we understand the context of that location? The, you know, are, again, is it a major activity center? You know, what what folks are using these these locations and going above and beyond just checking off the the ADA box if you if you um you know if you would, um, you know, I, I mentioned it before as well. But a good example is just curb ramp design and orientation. And, you know, um, ever since, and one of my engineers did some research on this, but, you know, in the early 2000s, we've had in our city standard plans about requiring two curb ramps to be put on, on each corner. And that's something that people may be like, well, okay, like, you know, how does that have an impact? Well, you know, otherwise you have one curb ramp, which we call a bisector, and that, you know, really shoots people out literally into the middle of the intersection. And, um, you know, that's something we, we try to avoid at all costs. And now currently, you know, under PROAG, even though it's not, you know, legally enforceable, it is the best practice. And, but we've been doing that in the city of Seattle, you know, for, you know, for over 20 years. Um, so I think when we're talking about the spirit of the ADA, it, it is, you know, it's not just equal access, but equitable access, um, you know, within our public right of way. And, you know, when we're talking about the spirit of the ADA, there are some things, and I know the previous presentation, you know, kind of brought that up about how the ADA is vague for a reason, and it, it leaves a lot of interpretation, you know, whether it's within the, you know, jurisdictions and the courts to kind of work this out and decide. Um, but a great example is um, tactile walking surface indicators and wayfinding. You know, there is no... Uh, nationwide formal standard for these um, tactile walking surface indicators beyond detectable warnings. And even then, you know, um, you know, it's, there's certain applications where you don't need detectable warnings. Um, and that was, you know, um, I don't want to go into that detail, but um, with the tactile walking surface indicators, um, you know, that's something that we've been piloting and we're going to continue to pilot these treatments so that when we have shared use paths, you know, a person with a vision disability can enjoy it just as much as um, you know, a person pushing a stroller, just as much as a cyclist using a, a shared use, multi-use path, um, because we're providing some cues, we're providing some separation, um, but it's still accessible. And so I think that's just one example, but it's just a good, good you know, concept of the ADA should be you know, perceived as the floor and not some ceiling slash checkbox that we should just say, okay, it's ADA compliant, move on. Um, and, and I think that should be, you know, when, when you're dealing with any project, um, that should really be the, the essence of, you know, yes, you're, you want to comply with the ADA, but more so do you want, are you make, making sure that it is, you know, accessible for all? And that being said, is it, you know, designed from a universal design or an inclusive design perspective? 
Thank you, Tom. That was great. Um, gave me a lot to think about while you were chatting. I first want to say that I love how this question is phrased. We're not saying that we're trying to go above and beyond. We're saying we're trying to meet the spirit of the law. And I think that is a very intentional way of thinking about ADA and even planning in general. I feel very strongly that the best attribute of an urban planner is deep empathy um, and being able to listen to when people tell you that something in the built environment is difficult for them and imagining what it might be like to experience it like them or even attempting to experience it like them, like maybe ride the transit route that they said that they're not enjoying or needs to be changed. And I think with ADA, it's very similar. Many of us um, don't experience everything that we hear in terms of complaints in ADA. And it, we don't need to experience it to see it as valuable and valid. We just need to work with them to implement a solution. And so the spirit of the law is that empathy. And I think in urban planning, we can focus on that empathy to deliver strong results with community members who are experiencing it. And I think that's the benefit of community engagement. It's, you know, we're not expected to have every single experience and know what it's like, but we are expected to be thoughtful in listening and in our delivering. I did notice a lot of folks on this call are working for cities or counties. And I wanted to highlight that I understand a lot of folks um, hire consulting firms to help them deliver on ADA. And with that same idea in mind, this empathy, the, I think also the firms that we hire to assist us should have embody the equity goals that we are hoping to embody as organizations. And so I think we can even take it one step further in our request for proposals to elicit feedback and questions from consultants to show that equity alignment so that we can go beyond just checking a box, but really meeting the spirit, as you you all asked, um, of delivering for our for our for the folks in our jurisdictions, because it is equity work isn't a checkbox. It truly is people's emotional experiences. It's the way we live. And um, the more we bring that into our work, it can be difficult because it's hard to manage a lot of emotions, especially in a professional sense. But I often find, at least in my own work, and I'll use I statements, I get a really great response when I try and step into that space more. And so I think embodying that our, ourselves through the spirit of the law, but also making sure who we hire has embodied that in the work that they've done in the past, in the people that they hire, in the way they talk about it, and in the way they write about it in the plans that they hope to deliver on. And if I could just jump in back on back on that, because Michelle, you you uh, you know kind of triggered something in my mind about that. You know, when we're talking about communication um, with the community and and in particular the disability community, um, there's this uh, there's this idea of um, you know first and foremost, let me let me say that we want to get firsthand ex, you know firsthand experiences you know from people in the disability community and i can't stress that enough you know michelle you touched on it about you know even riding transit routes to get that experience about how people are you know um experiencing you know that that trip um go out talk with the community you know go on field site visits with them experience it that way um because that is completely uh you know a valuable way to firsthand, you know, um, be with a person as they're going through, you know, these potential challenges. Because, you know, in my in my experience, it it is difficult to, you know, go with the person. Um, you know, I've since coming to Seattle, I've done a lot of field visits with folks from Lighthouse for the Blind and the Deaf Blind Service Center, and being, you know, being able to um, meet up with them at King Street Station. And go on the seven, you know, down um, into you know Rainier Valley. Go to Lighthouse, examine the crossings, and you know it's it really. I don't I don't want to be you know um, uh, unsympathetic, but it really opens my eyes to how people experience this. And saying I'm not going to say to them, oh, that, well that's compliant. It's it's if it's not working for somebody. I don't care if it's compliant. It's not you. It's not usable, and we have to get out of that mindset to just say, "Oh, it, it meets compliance." And you know, when we have engineers and folks, we need to all go out there. You know, from the planner, from the engineer, the designer, the project manager, 
you know, work with these local community groups. I know, again, we have, you know, the Seattle Disability Commission that, that I work with. We have a lot of other um, disability rights advocacy groups that I've been working with and I, I want to continue to work with and have better relationships with. Um, because, again, when we're talking about the spirit of the law, there may be these minimum requirements that, yeah, it's, it's the minimum, but it doesn't mean that we have to just do that. And that experience is is extremely valuable, um, you know. And I'll close, you know, on, in this comment with this: that there's this back and forth about, you know, simulation exercises. And I was always, um, you know, I was trained and talking with folks. That's not necessarily a bad thing to do, but don't have simulations supplement first-hand experience going out with people. Um, uh, Having a, an engineer, um, you know, tell me that, oh, yeah, it's only a 3%, 3.5% cross slope. It's close enough to 2%. Um, it's one thing to put them in a manual wheelchair and have them say, hey, is, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's a whole other thing to have another, a person and being with them and, and sh having them show you, like, this is truly, you know, difficult for me, and if not impassable. You know, for something that is a one and a half percent difference from the standard. So again, it's you know simulations are are, are it's a tool, but I, I think the firsthand experience from people in the community is is the way to go when we're talking about the spirit of the law and going above and beyond and and this whole idea of you know inclusive design for everybody. I think those were wonderful. Uh, how do you address issues of intersectionality between disability and other aspects of identity, such as race or socioeconomic status in projects? Oh, Dr. Michelle. Thanks for asking this question. I think it's important to acknowledge, especially as you know, the more marginalized identities someone has, the more compounding the experience can feel, um, especially because as we know, the sidewalk and our right of way is not the same experience for all people, especially based on race, gender, disability, class. And so I think as we talk about ADA and as we talk about mobility justice, acknowledging the different marginalized identities and their different intersecting experiences um, and being, being able to accept feedback, I think that might be difficult as a planner and might be hard. Um, there have been times where I've been in public meetings and folks come to these meetings visibly upset and they have a right to that, I think sometimes when we don't deliver, um, don't deliver safe and accessible right of way. It's an, a jarring experience for them. And so I think first and foremost, being somebody who is able to listen deeply and validate that experience because the emotions can't be pulled out of the experience. They are part of the experience and not asking them to temper down the emotions of that experience. They are one and the same. And the fact that they've even come to share, I think, shows at least a little bit of hope in being able to change the experience. And so I try and take that with grace. Um, and then lastly, I will say, because of these compounding and also intersecting identities, we can't Man, we can't pretend to manage for all of them and all the very specific use cases. But with the ADA and meeting the spirit of the ADA, when we plan for our most vulnerable populations, the people who have the most difficult time using our system, we are planning for everyone. And I think that is very commonly said in our field of work. And I hope that continues to embed its way into our work because we don't need to understand to the T every single specific individual use case. Because when we plan at this base level that is thoughtful and inclusive, we do plan for all of those use cases. So I try and stray away from the community having to overly share these sensitive details of their lives if they don't feel that it's comfortable. It matters that it impacts them and it matters in a way that I will do my best to change it so they can enjoy the right of way the same way everyone else should be able to. And so um, that's how I like to think about it. And um, that's how I like to try and take the onus of explanation off of the community, even though I'm hoping to co-create, I don't want them to have to explain every nuance of their existence for us to co-create um, solutions together. So I'll pause it to Tom. That's a great segue, Michelle, and really, really thoughtful responses that elicited some some additional feedback I wasn't originally, you know, uh, thinking about because 
you know, you think about, um, you know, this intersectionality between race and socioeconomic status. And, um, you know, there's the old joke. It's like the, the, you know, the scariest thing to hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know, it's, you know, we, we are, you know, we are the government, you know, we are, you know, city employees. But I, I want to recognize that, you know, we get we get feedback. We've talked about this before, about getting customer feedback and how we utilize that. But you also have to, you know, we also have to be cognizant that there's people that just don't necessarily trust that, you know, that the government's going to be, you know, in, you know, doing stuff in their best interest. And they may be already be disenfranchised and not care and not be providing comment. So for us to say, yeah, we're going to do feedback based on comments, you know, it, you, there's an old adage like the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And, you know, there's certain locations where we have, we have the background information, we have the data, we have the knowledge to know that these communities, these areas that have been marginalized, like we have to focus on them, regardless of if we get a hundred comments or two comments, because, we, you know, we know that there are people there that, um, you know, and infrastructure is lacking. Um, and there's this basic level of mobility that we have to provide, that we have to adhere to. Um, and again, accessible, like Michelle's mentioned before as well, accessible pedestrian infrastructure is useful to everyone. Um, so just understanding that, um, you know, there is almost like an inverse of, yeah, we wanna look at where we're getting a lot of comments on, but also, we want to look at areas where we're not getting any feedback on, and maybe there's a reason for that. And it may be um, a language access issue. And I know we have a language access program that you know we're working on these things to get the different you know get materials out in different languages, go to the community, get stuff where you know it's not some meeting at 6 p.m. on a weekday night that they have to provide feedback. I know Michelle mentioned with the Seattle transportation plan having interactive tools that we can utilize. Um, so just, you know, be aware as we're talking about these other issues as well, that it's not, you know, it's this nuanced mix between getting feedback and using existing data sources, because we know that, you know, we have data. I, I'm, I'm very impressed um, coming to Seattle a year and a half ago on the treasure trove of GIS and other geospatial data that we have that can show us you know, we have no sidewalks or missing sidewalk connections, no curb ramps. And we know that there's a medical center, uh, you know, a, a community center, a school at this location. So it doesn't matter if we get five comments or 500, we need to provide that connection because we have, you know, th these other data sources that really just are, uh, you know, shining right in our eyes that we need to do something about it. And, and we can't just say, okay, we haven't gotten any comments from this this area, this neighborhood, let's not prioritize it. If anything, we need to really be thinking critically and prioritizing it just as much, if not more than other areas that we may have received a lot of comments on, again, based on other data and other factors, such as uh, language, you know, and, and, and social or uh, racial and socioeconomic status that we have the information about. Tom, that's a great point. I, I wanted to add one more thing because I recalled while you were sharing, I think, um, yes, at, in Seattle, I think we're very lucky where we have a lot of data and we have a large team that synthesizes it all, helps us figure out what sources of data we can use and how. It's a well-resourced group. And I think in my experience in ADA planning, especially for smaller cities, mm -hmm. sometimes less than 5,000 people, they're not always as resourced. And I almost want to give like a token of maybe solace in that area. Like if you're working with a city that's not as well resourced in that way around data specifically, there's still so much that can be done. Um, and I think the best way in terms of how I like to think about it in terms of being a planner is this attitudinal accessibility coming in and saying, I'm really here to listen to you and embodying that even in your gestures and your facial expressions in the way that you ask the questions in language that is accessible to the community. Um, so all of that to say is we, you know, for the smaller cities, we can go out and gather data. Um, we can meet community members where they're at. And even if you're not 
um, working with this giant tre treasure trove of data, um, it's still there's still plenty to pull from, and there's so much that folks can do as individuals to improve that experience. And I sometimes feel like we forget how valuable it is to be affirmed by somebody who's um, working in a capacity like mine and Tom's um, as a community member to, to say, I think you're right. I think it does need improvement because that alone just opens the door to so much more co-creation. And so just wanted to highlight the piece of de um, attitudinal accessibility and how we can embody that more for areas that we don't have the um, additional resources. This question is primarily aimed or Zoom, Michelle, but how do projects that increase accessibility intersect with intersect with efforts to address climate change? Oh man, I feel like I could go on this forever. So <laughs> I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I think the main theme that I try to implement and explain when we talk about climate is everything that we do is climate work. Our safety work is climate work. Our housing policy is climate policy. Our land use policy is climate policy. Everything that we do that makes it more comfortable for folks to walk, bike, take transit, where they don't have to go so far to have their needs met, to get to their job, to go to the grocery store, that is all climate work. And I think if we're able to see every piece of our portfolio as a climate opportunity, we've come to learn that everybody at the Department of Transportation plan at the Department of Transportation is a climate planner. And that's a really exciting opportunity because we have a lot of solutions that can be implemented. And I look forward to when folks feel empowered to look at their portfolios and say, I not only have a climate piece, I have it's a climate piece because I run the, you know, transit oriented development program. And that means people won't have to travel as far. There's just so many ways that you can enact climate policy that it's almost like overwhelming and exciting <laughs> for me to dive into it because there it's just an endless opportunity to really meet our climate goals. Um, and so I'll stop there, but Tom, if you wanna add anything or maybe I'll think of more as you're talking. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, you you hit a lot of the points that I was going to bring up, you know, about getting people out of cars and facilitating non-motorized transportation. Um, and again, walking and rolling and biking and access to transit and making it easier and safe to, to access transit. Um, this this uh, this whole aspect, uh, it, it touches on a couple of different issues that I deal with um, on, on the daily, if not, you know, weekly, if not daily basis. Um, because a big part of our climate goals and our climate policy is expanding our urban street tree canopy. And, you know, the one thing that is very problematic from an accessibility perspective are the tree roots of, uh, you know, that upheave sidewalks and create impassable and, and not non-accessible segments of our pedestrian network. So, you know, that's something that my group has been working on and, and we're going to continue to work on this and we want to get some public feedback as well is, you know, what are our policies for, um, you know, this, these conflicting, you know, kind of, kind of conflicting goals. Um, and, you know, I say this to our urban forestry folks and, you know, I'm sorry if I'm, you know, uh, you know, kind of digging at people, but, you know, trees don't have civil rights. And so we have to really make sure that we have, um, um, you know, alternative design solutions or just solutions, um, you know, in general that we can, kind of balance both these goals, you know, about providing accessibility, but also maintaining, if not expanding our urban street tree canopy. Um, things such as, you know, modifying the sidewalk, um, you know, we could slightly ramp up the sidewalk within ADA allowances. Um, our urban forestry team has been working on uh, using bridge plates. So, you know, we can uh, do root pruning and shave down roots. So we work very closely. And that's something that, you know, coming on board with SDOT, I didn't expect that, you know, as an ADA coordinator, I'd be working very closely with our urban forestry group and learning about our, um, you know, root pruning and air spading and stuff. So, you know, when we're talking about the, you know, this intersection between climate goals and accessibility, um, you know, anybody who walks and rolls around the city of Seattle, you know, can, can get a firsthand experience of what tree roots do. I'm not saying that we have to take trees out. But there are other solutions, and sometimes it could be a little contentious because we may have to, you know, you can only go, you know, you can go up or down to a certain extent, but laterally, you, you know, you can buy right of way, which I know uh, folks we don't necessarily want to do, 
or you can take a, a lane and expand the sidewalk that way. And that comes back to this whole inclusive design where widening sidewalks and having, you know, being able to go around a sidewalk on the opposite side, as opposed to in between a private property and a tree is just the solution. So, you know, it, it takes, it takes a lot, um, you know, of, of heads to come together to address all these issues because it's not in a vacuum. It's not, you know, in a silo. Um, we have to be able to work to achieve both of these goals, which again, are very important goals. Um, but again, I wanted to mention that whole thing with, you know, the urban street tree canopy is, is a very big issue in Seattle. Um, because currently, you know, we install street trees um, done properly. You know, certain trees um, that have certain root structures that uh, kind of coincide and how they're, uh, you know, how they're planted um, will not be upheaving sidewalk panels. But unfortunately, you know, the urban foresters and the arborists of the, you know, 80s and 90s did not necessarily think about that. And we're, we're feeling those benefits right now. So it's just a matter of in your you know, jurisdiction and municipalities to be really thinking about what your policies are um, and, and defining them. So it's not, you know, because we deal with that on a case by case basis now, but we want to have policies so that everyone's aware, okay, these are the limits, this is what we can do to ramp up, um, or otherwise we can meander around sidewalks. And, you know, at the very worst case, you know, we may have to remove trees, but doing a two for one or a three for one planting and having those trees being done in a proper way so that we're actually putting more trees out there um, that will, again, provide that, that climate goal and urban um, uh, canopy goals while also um, providing accessible uh, pedestrian access routes. Tom, thanks for highlighting the tree canopy piece. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, one thing I love that I've learned from the urban forestry department is to think of trees in Seattle or anywhere as generational wealth. Um, like if we pull down a tree, it's, um, you know, it's hard to replace a canopy that big. It'll take years and years. And so I love that framing and um, it's a great way to think about it. I will say um, I'm going to pivot a little bit away from the tree canopy and come back more to like the system itself. I think what we're seeing with the Seattle transportation plan and where we're trying to move forward as a city um, is having this integrated approach to our planning. Um, it's not just we're doing a transit master plan and we'll do X transit treatment here and X transit treatment here. It's really thinking about it in an integrated way of how can this transit treatment connect to this um, PED treatment that also connects to this third space that we see people going to quite often. And so taking an integrated approach, and I understand that you know cities are limited in funding, you have your CIP and you kind of have to stick to that. And how can we put more in? We're already doing as much as we possibly can. And I think every time you have an opportunity as a city to or a county to re-plan for the next 10, 20 years, it's a great opportunity to capture this integrated approach. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of promise and growth that comes out of that because in the past we had planned our system in silos and now we're trying to stack up our system in terms of um, how people connect to each mode because truthfully you know as we say in the transit world every transit trip is a walking trip first and so taking that and expanding it to every part of the system it could also be a micro mobility trip it can also be a bike trip and how do we think about that holistically and so um, I'm looking forward to participating in planning evolving into more system wide lens. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention one last uh, little tidbit I got from um, one of the arborists when I was out in the field a couple of weeks ago is that trees um, are really nature's bollards. And, you know, so to have, uh, you know, trees between the sidewalk and the vehicle, you know, uh, vehicle space and, and the roadway um, is actually uh, could be, you know, kind of perceived as a, as a vision zero benefit as well, because you do have that um, that sense of of separation and security because you have this you know this massive natural barrier that can help you know um, provide some of that comfort as well as again um, shade you know um, sometimes protection from you know if if you have a major uh, tree that has some canopy it provides some coverage from you know some some uh, precipitation and stuff like that so like Michelle said you know there's a lot of efforts that we're doing within the city to stack these priorities together and it may be more com complex solutions, but um, you know, a no, no easy problem, you no know, difficult problem has an easy solution. And so working together to address all these simultaneously 
is um, can have benefits, um, you know, cost and otherwise um, down the road. Great. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll open it up to audience questions. But my question is, what advice would you give transportation planners and those in adjacent fields who are interested in promoting mobility justice and universal design in their work? Tom, you can go ahead. <laughs> OK. Um, hmm. no, this is a good question. Uh, some advice. Um, I, I really think you know inclusive design, it can be difficult and it can also you know, be costly sometimes. But, you know, when you're um, when you're thinking about projects, when you're working on projects, really present this idea and, and you know, and a plan and show, you know, cost benefit relationships. I mentioned before, you know, there are times where we'll we'll do a um, arterial asphalt and concrete paving project that we're not going to come back for another 15, 20 years. So, um, you know, you want to make sure you're you're addressing you know, all these issues. And yes, so it may be some more upfront costs, but then you don't have to go back and do other things. Um, same thing with, you know, when we're putting in curb ramps or putting accessible pedestrian signals, or if there's other work being done, we want to make sure that we're providing that full network connection. So a lot of times, you know, with my program, with the curb ramp program or working with our signals team, um, you know, examine the sidewalk. You know, don't just stop at the curb ramp and say, okay, we're done in our project because we may, you know, it may still be impassable, you know, half a block down the road. So I think, um, you know, from the transportation planner's perspective, getting into this mobility justice universal design work, you know, really start to think about the user experience and then being able to, you know, think about how we can convey that to the decision makers and managers and, and, and you know, higher ups. Um, because you, there is a cost benefit to doing things together and, and kind of lumping all these um, you know, improvements together. Um, you know, I also think, you know, again, this is just with future proofing projects. Um, you know, think about what, you know, potential needs are. Michelle, you know, hit on it a couple times about, um, you know, transportation issues or land use issues and climate issues. So, um, you know, you want to think about all these other factors involved. And as planners, um, one of my, you know, former, uh, you know, a colleague of mine who said, you know, planners wear, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide with, um, you know, what we know and the scope of, of what we know and, you know, bring in subject matter experts, you know, communicate, you know, have discussions both formally, informally, go to potential, um, you know, happy hours, meetings, um, you know, community events, um, you know, talk about your role in your organization or as a consultant and, and kind of share because, you know, you could get this informal feedback and develop these relationships with folks that, that are lasting, um, you know, and again, from an inclusive design perspective, universal design perspective, it's important to understand different facets of our communities, um, you know, society in general, and how we can shape, you know, especially the public right of way based on the needs of, of the community. Um, you know, get feedback. I think that's important, you know, to be understanding how we get our feedback and, you know, don't just be myopic in um, the local context. Uh, when I was in Maryland, in particular Baltimore, um, it was difficult because we would be bringing in examples from, you know, DC or from New York. And they're like, that we're not, we're not DC, we're Baltimore. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, these, these have benefits to your, to the community. And again, that explanation. Um, you know, so I think that's important. And I think lastly, it's good to tell stories. It's good to be a storyteller and explain what we're trying to do. Give, give experiences, um, you know, talk to people, um, get their stories as well and, and build that into your repertoire because it's important to kind of um, empathize and also emulate what you hear from other folks and say, hey, you know, this has worked elsewhere. This may not exactly work here, but maybe we can try some of these aspects of this project and see how they work. Pilot stuff. Um, don't be afraid to test stuff out because, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, you know, document things and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least you tried. And especially from the universal design perspective, and a great example I'll close with this is, is the tactile, you know, walking surface indicators and tactile wayfinding. Um, unfortunately, you know, we had a project that with the Federal Highways Administration, we were supposed to test out some of these treatments um, this spring, and that got pulled. So we're going to have to do that internally. But 
we want to make sure that, you know, again, we're future proofing these projects so that we don't have to rip stuff out in five and 10 years because we got feedback from the community on these treatments that aren't, you know, formally regulated um, yet. So I think it's just a matter of really, you know, widening in kind of your breadth of what you do, um, but then being able to take that all back, synthesize it and, and put that into your focus of, of whatever you're trying to achieve. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Um, what I do with my graduate students at UW, we do this uh, activity to kind of find your area and find your your niche where you can have the most impact and the most change. Because I think folks who are engaged in mobility justice and equity and you know these broad terms that have so many solutions. And sometimes we feel like they're, we're the ones like carrying the torch forward and we want to change the world. And I think it's really great to kind of scale it back. You in this moment, think about what am I good at? What is in my control? And what do I like doing? And if you ask yourself these three questions in the context of your work portfolio, you're going to find that you might have this special skill. Maybe you're really good at interviewing and hiring, and therefore you can pull the people that you need to deliver these projects. There's, and then organize yourself around the people who have complementary skills. So I really empower everybody to meet with their teams and ask themselves those three questions and find out how you can build a team of folks who have complementary skills so you can deliver or bring in the people who will deliver on the things that you need to deliver on. And so um, everything that Tom shared, I don't need to reiterate it. It was awesome. But I also think taking a step back and trying to remove the onus from just you as an individual in your big organization or maybe your small team in your big or organization delivering on um, equity work because I think as we invite more people into our movement into moving forward on these grant solutions folks start to feel empowered and also when we say you have x skill that I cherish and admire and I have this skill it's um creates a really collaborative and complementary environment and acknowledging what those skills are and those subject areas are can be really helpful. I think sometimes there's this assumption on our teams that, you know, I'm Michelle and I do climate planning and therefore that's my skill um, where it can, we can really dive deeper. Like I do climate planning, but also came with a disability ADA background. And so I think about it in this way, whereas maybe Tom with his transit uh, service planning background will think about it in a different way. And so diving into those niches with your team and seeing where you have the skills and where you might even have the gaps can really help you conquer the workload that looks really daunting as one individual because I think we know this about planning, we know this about community, and we know this about ourselves. We're not meant to do it alone and it it's not it can't even be done alone. So I hope that you take the time to find your your skills and your team skills and really build together. Great, thank you very much for that. Okay, we are gonna open it up for a Q&A from the audience. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or just go off of mute and ask a question, or you can just type in the chat. I'd like to ask a question, um, Thomas and Michelle. You mentioned traveling and working in other agencies, other areas, and I know it's something I notice when I travel is just how accessible different cities are and even different countries. What are your thoughts? It just seems to me that the Pacific Northwest is really ahead of the curve in accessibility. And we're doing a better job out here. I'm kind of proud of that. Is that really supportable by the evidence? Is that something you've noticed as well? I can speak to this and then Tom. Mm -hmm. I. You know, I like to give kudos where it's due, but we have a lot of room to grow here, and I hope to continue to support that change. I think, um, I think when we work cons with consultants from other uh, from other places around the U.S., they also give us kudos on the work we're doing. But our equity goals and our equity tactics will show you every single place where we need to improve, and there is a lot of them. And so, you know, I'm proud of our work, and I'm very proud of our colleagues, and I'm proud of how our organization is shifting. It's one reason why I continue to work and stay in the Pacific Northwest, because the base is there, but we have a lot more work to do, and I'm excited to engage in it. Tom? Yeah, no, I um, I echo that sentiment again, um, you know, coming from, you know, New Jersey, living in, in Ohio, going down to Florida, being in Maryland and then here, um, 
we are yeah we have a lot of of um progressive accessible and, and universal design type policies and technical uh guidance that we that we you know incorporate but like michelle said we have a lot of work still to do um you know in, in my experience you know yes we have um you know we we've done a lot but um we can still improve and yeah, it's just a matter of this continual improvement with access. And, and that's something that I was, I was very impressed coming here and I still am about, I mentioned about pilot treatments and testing things out. Um, you know, we, we've done a lot of that more so than in other parts of the, of the country. Um, so, you know, I'm proud of, of what, you know, ESTA and the city of Seattle has done in, in the past. But it doesn't mean that we can just kind of pat ourselves in the back. You know, we we're um, I go to conferences um, when I was not with SDOT. I went to the Nas National Association of City Transportation Officials conference last year um, in Boston, and everyone was coming up to us um, about all of our projects because we are seen, you know, around the country as leaders uh, with, you know, in state DOT, also our partners at King County Metro and Sound Transit with a lot of the transit expansion that's going on. But again, I mean, it's it's interesting because now being here, you know, we get comments, we get complaints, we get feedback that we could do better. And I'm not, I'm not discounting those comments. It's just, um, yes, we, we do a lot of great work here, but like Michelle said, and I'll, I'll echo that, um, we can always do better. And that's our job, and that's what we strive to do every day: is to just continuously get better um, in providing a more accessible public right of way and inclusive, um, you know, inclusively designed right of way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. Um, go, do you set, have something else, Michelle? Yeah, I just wanted to say that we have a really engaged. Uh, group of citizens, and so mm -hmm. it they really push us to be better and. I'm thankful for that. Like we, we get so much feedback when I go back through, even on a small project, there's just a lot to parse through. There's a lot of themes that I can pull from and often feedback from a former session on a different project will connect to feedback I'm getting in a new session on a pilot project. And I think I feel grateful that we continue to get feedback and folks have trust and hope in us to read it and deliver on that. I think that's another reason why we've been able to push forward is that the folks who live in this area uh, don't hesitate to let us know and I hope they continue to tell us. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna add, I know um, Brian uh, Wood had a question in the chat that um, you know I just noticed, um, which is a good question, Brian, regarding Aurora Ave uh, Stay Route 99. And um, I'll be I'll be quite frank. I mean, I live in North Seattle. Um, I traverse Aurora Ave frequently, um, you know, uh, by bike, walking, uh, you know, using transit on Aurora as well. And yeah, it is um, it is it is a pedestrian hostile environment. I will say that. Um, you know, on top of that, what you pointed out about how within the revised Code of Washington RCW. Um, you know how um, all intersections are legal crossings and so there are requirements to put in curb ramps when we do certain work in the right of way um, both sidewalk and um, roadway work so we put in curb ramps as, as per required um, but that doesn't mean we have to put in any type of uh, pedestrian crossing treatments per se um, so I, I don't have a specific answer for you on you know how the city balances um you know uh traffic the movement of traffic um that's a lot of our you know traffic transportation engineers that deal with that uh, i will say this that i can you know we continue to push for improvements and making sure that you know when we're you know um doing any improvements to crosswalks and and crossings um you know we want to make sure we understand again the the origin destination nature and including where transit access is. I know we have um, a Reimagining Aurora project. I forget the exact name of it, but we got some money, um, $50 million, uh, to be able to examine, um, you know, kind of that whole Aurora Ave corridor and and examine what we can do to improve that that um, experience for all users, not just the people driving. Um, because something I I remember um, learning about is the you know the E line is the highest ridership route in the state. Um, so we know that it moves a lot of people. And so we know then people are coming and going on to Aurora from all the you know, destinations there. 
Um, and there's also a lot of, you know, um, multifamily and, you know, developments that are occurring there. So it's going to be important how we, you know, how we treat Aurora in the, in the next couple of years as we're planning and, and in, you know, moving into the design phase. Um, but so I, I didn't necessarily answer your question directly, but just know that um, we've been having a lot of internal discussions regarding that um, Aurora Ave project. And um, so keep, be on the lookout for any public involvement in the near future on that, on that um, corridor project, because it is top on our list to make sure we're improving, um, you know, um, the safety and the lives, you know, folks who use that, that corridor through our city. Uh, last Tom, question from the oh, chat from Jennifer. I just want to add to that oh. last piece on um, the last question. Um, Yes, we're going through that right now. And yes, it is a pedestrian hostile environment. Unfortunately, I use Aurora very regularly as a pedestrian. And so I think um, this question when I read it in the chat is uh, very relevant to the work I do and also what I experience personally. I do want to say that right now, if you commute into Seattle or if you're a resident in Seattle, um, we would encourage you to respond to some of the Seattle Transportation Plan public feedback um, in, on your experience. It will help us do more focused community feedback in the future. That is one corridor that, of course, Tom mentioned, we're, we're very interested in improving. Um, and this desire to move traffic, in my view, um, can be served through other means. Um, maybe traffic through that area can be, you know, uh, changed while, as commute patterns change, as we offer more transit service. So I don't know that it's always going to look the way it does now, but we're working on building that out for the future. And so um, I'm excited to see how that evolves because the way it is currently, um, there's a lot of solutions in our tool belt that we can start to implement with community uh, once we hear more from them. So I encourage you to give feedback where you have it because we're eager to, we're eager to accept that. And I, Ed, I don't know if I could quickly uh, give an answer or at least a suggestion for Jennifer as well um, okay. about, um, yeah. So I'm, and that's something I know, you know, Michelle mentioned she did a lot of, um, you know, rural transportation planning. Um, you know, when I was in Florida, that was something that um, we dealt with too. You know, there's a lot of locations in rural, you know, county, cities, jurisdictions where they don't have, like you mentioned, you know, curb gutter and sidewalk. And, um, you know, the, the ADA, states that you know the the shoulder can be used as a pedestrian access route and i know we have i believe i actually put this this stat in my notes but um the city of seattle i mean be with annexations over the years over the decades um we have eleven thousand blocks uh without sidewalk without curb and gutter sidewalk within the city so one thing that we've done and and this may be um be able to be utilized for your purposes is we have alternative walkway uh guidelines that we're working on um that you know are able to we were able to put in certain design measures that um are are lower cost but quicker to implement and provide an alternative. Um, and these are in locations, I wanna say it's supplements where we have crappy sidewalks, it's locations where we have no sidewalks and we know that people are walking and rolling in the road or on the shoulder. So using things such as, um, you know, um, extruded uh, concrete curbs, um, you know, wheel stops, um, using, you know, flex posts even um, to, to have that delineation, um, you know, where there's no curb and gutter um, that's, you know, a potential solution. Um, and then just, you know, making sure that with development that there may be sections, if it's feasible to put in curb and gutter at a later time and using an alternative walkway kind of um, uh, standard in the meantime as a temporary means um, can, can help support kind of that, that safe uh, um, travel along these more of these rural roads rather than just having people walking on the shoulder per se. So we can, if you want to touch base with me, I can add a little bit more to that. Um, there's also some other guidance. Um, and I think uh, Florida Department of Transportation has an accessing transit document that I remember working on way back when, but I think they have some, some guidelines um, for kind of rural applications and how um, you can you know, design um, in these areas that don't have curb and gutter. Thank you. Uh, we're a little bit over time, so I think we can conclude uh, our 
Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, Tom and Michelle, for participating in this. Your answers were really great. I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience did too. Rock, do you want to say something? You're off mute. <laughs> um, yeah, that was phenomenal. Uh, that was a great presentation or a great uh, Q&A session. I really appreciated it. Uh, okay, great. Uh, that we're done. Uh, we will come back at one o'clock for our ADA uh, transition plan round robin from our consultants and public works departments from Sohomes County. So, thanks for having us. Right. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. It is one o'clock. Uh, this is our final session. We have our uh, ADA transition plan round robin with uh, public works departments and uh, those consultants that did work on uh, ADA transition plans within the county of Sohomish. Uh, I will share the screen. This will run from 1 to 2.30. This is our final event of the Universal Design Forum. <clears throat> Uh, we have Edmonds, Everett, Lake Stevens, Mount Lake Paris, Monroe. I believe PSRC is presenting. Am I missing any uh, public works departments that have or want to present? I did see Rita joined us, but I'm not sure if she is presenting from Bothell. Rita, could you indicate in the chat real quick if? Uh, I'm here. Uh, okay. I'm still sick, but if there's any time left, and I, I will try to present. At okay, the absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. Make sure everyone is here. Okay, great. I think everyone here, everyone is here. All right. All right. Who would, we'll have Edmonds go first, and it will go Edmonds, Everett, Lake Stevens, Mount Lake, Paris, Monroe, PSRC, Bothell. Thank you. Um, just to, to start real quick, um, as we do this, uh, I'm going to launch two polls. Uh, so hopefully everybody can multitask at the same time. Um, but the first will just be where's everybody from uh, and where you work. And then the second will be a sign in. Uh, as we've done in all the other sessions. So, uh, Bertrand, uh, looking forward to your presentation. I'll let you go ahead and get started here and change the spotlights uh, just in a second. Yeah, let me know when I can start. Oh, I need to add one thing. Uh, I forgot Jennifer. Jennifer is presenting on uh, Marysville. So we'll have Marysville go after PSMC. Apologies, Jennifer. I good to go. All right, yes, you're good to go. Hey, everyone. Oh, yeah, my name is Bertrand House. I work for the city of Edmonds as their transportation engineer. I just want to do a, like a five, 10 minute presentation on our ADA transition plan on public right away, which we actually completed back in uh, 2017. So about five or six years ago. So I'll go over the requirements in this plan and the goals uh, as part of this plan. Then how did we come up with our ranking and our schedule? What kind of public outreach we went through? the total cost of all the necessary upgrades in the public right away, and then implementation. What have we done since 2017 to make uh, to improve the conditions in terms of ADA compliance on city right away? So I, I'm sure you guys already went through this in your in your in this session, but just a reminder, yeah, the American, Americans with Disabilities Act, basically a law that requires equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities and basically from uh, a city or public agency point of view, we're responsible for, for providing full access uh, to programs, services, and activities. So the requirements in our transition plan, first, uh, we actually hired uh, MIG to complete this, this plan. It's about a one-year process. Uh, but the first thing out of the get-go, and that's one of the requirements, is to do a self-evaluation of all the city right away. So that includes curb ramps, sidewalks, and traffic signals. So they evaluated approximately 2,000 curb ramps throughout the city, along with 72 miles of sidewalks, and we have 23 signals as well. 
Uh, and then once this evaluation was done, obviously is the goal is for the one of the requirements is to identify what we what upgrades are necessary at all these key locations. Another requirement as part of this transition plan is to designate an ADA coordinator. And that's obviously uh, helpful for the future. So when there's any um, future citizen ADA related complaints, you that person is responsible for coordinating and then investigating and coming up with a, an answer to that specific uh, individual. And that's obviously staying in compliance with all federal and state accessibility requirements. Um, sorry. Are my slides moving forward or not? Can you guys just give me a, a year or no? Hello? You guys see my slides going? Yeah, yeah we can, see, we can see the full slides and we can see actually the full um, PowerPoint application as well. Okay. Uh, so you're good the way it's looking, right? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. So what, what are the goals of this plan? It's obviously to identify various strategies on removing these barriers, and it's to come up with a, a projected schedule over the next six, 15 years, as well as obviously since you're you're coming up with a schedule. What is what are how are you going to fund all these improvements? Uh, so you have to have come up with a funding strategy, and I'll go over that a little bit in the in the next couple of slides. But it's through obviously you got new construction project, which will address a lot of the ADA issues, as well as identifying new local annual programs such as the annual sidewalk program, or maybe come up with an annual ADA curb ramp program where. The funding that you allocate to that program will be specifically for curb ramps, and then obviously, and then you can uh, require developers to remove ADA bar access barriers. or see if they're redoing some uh, doing some sizable de redevelopment. They have to redo the sidewalks, so that would address some of those issues. And then one of the big ones for bigger pots of money is to seek some uh, grant opportunities or apply for some grant applications uh, when it, when available. So this chart right here, this is a. Uh, so once this self evaluation was done by the by our team, we then had to prioritize, and that you prioritize. So then, then you can actually come up with a schedule. You can, so here on the purple on this slide, you have the these are the high priority locations. So this is all the diff, all the curb rounds that were identified were identified in one of these boxes based on the category of the deficiency, which is the the rows on the left side as well as the location. So just going over the location real quick, you, we identified six different locations, whether it was, so if it was a location where you had a citizen complaint requesting a curb ramp upgrade, that would definitely be number one on the, it would be a high priority. And then you have a location serving government offices, then you have a health medical facilities and then transportation services and then commercial and then other areas. So those are the six categories. And then the next, the, the rows on the side right here, and I'll go over on this slide first. So the, the, um, we identified six categories in terms of the ter type of deficiency. The number one is basically, yeah, there's no, there's no existing curb ramps. It's a really high deficiency. And basically, as you go to number six, your deficiencies are being reduced until you get to number six, which is no deficiency. Uh, so if you, yeah, you, have, you come up with a, um, a curb ramp that's, a high, it got a complaint from a citizen and then it has no curb ramp. Obviously that'll be in the, the purple. So purple is high, orange is medium, and then green is is uh, is low priority. And we'll we'll look at that in a little more detail afterwards when I go over the schedule. Um, and we've already gone over this. Then we, obviously this is a map of just, um, just to show you the, the number of deficiencies throughout the city. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them every, in a, and it's citywide issue. Uh, so those are the high priority locations. And then on this map, you have the medium and low priority locations. And then once once that was completed, that's when you come up with your schedule. And um, so you have a it's a like I said before, it's a fifteen year horizon. So you you allocate the first the high priority locations, which is um, these all these purple locations. Those are considered your high priority ones. So you want to do those in the first five years. So out of the, there's a total of nine, approximately 2,000 curb ramps throughout the city. As of 2017, there was only, as you see on my cursor right here, there's 117 on the bottom of the chart that were actually non-deficient. So that met ADA compliance. 
and there was 400 that were characterized as high priority, then 940 for medium that were, should be addressed over the next 10 years, and then a little under 400 for the next 15 years. So you have a good, good schedule and a good plan for what you want to address in the near future. Um, so that was a, yeah, we hadn't done this transition plan before. So this was a good starting point for the city of Edmonds in terms of moving forward and making, addressing as many ADA issues as possible, uh, as soon as possible. And then I want to go over this real quick. Um, in terms of the sidewalk barriers, it's it's similar maps, matrices and schedules that I showed you for the curb ramps. So you have the maps identifying all the pedestrian barriers. So these are tripping hazards on sidewalks. This is shown right here. And it's just like the curb ramps. Um, if there's significant deficiency on the sidewalk, it'd be a category one. Whereas if there is no deficiency, there's no obstructions, it meets the minimum uh, horizontal clearance for sidewalk width and the cross slopes are meeting standards, then it would, it would be in the sixth category. Um, and that's when this same chart as before, this chart is, is developed and the same thing, we have the same six locations and then the six categories that I just showed you on the previous slides. And then you come up with a schedule, uh, specifically, this is specifically for sidewalk barriers. So you have another 15 year horizon, planning horizon. And then you can see there's a pretty sizable, I mean, in terms of uh, deficiencies, it comes out of just under 7,600 throughout the city. So it's definitely a, a big issue and a high priority issue for the city of Edmonds. I want to touch on public outreach, what, what was involved in the public outreach for this project. So the first thing is we did create a committee in the development and review of this document. It was, it involved uh, four uh, residents and uh, that obviously had some uh, interest in transportation and accessibility. And of those four, there was, I believe there was three that had different various disabilities. So it was good to see, to get different perspectives from based on their disability and to see their, their point of view. Uh, and then in terms of document review process, there was no open house for this project, but we did have a, a press release. The, plan, the draft was provided on the website as well. And then a hard copy was available for review and we put the docu the hard copy document at various locations. Um, so when you combine, and I didn't really touch on traffic signals, but the traffic signals was also evaluated. And for that, we looked at, uh, did the signals at APS, audible pedestrian signals, the location of the push button, did it meet the vertical height uh, requirements? Um, and if you combine all those, the three categories, curb ramps, saddle barriers, and signals, it came up to this one. We, we were just shocked when we saw the total amount. It was $159 million. And obviously that's something we, in a 15 year horizon, that's, yeah, you're looking at $10 million per year uh, on average, which is pretty hard to achieve, obviously. But one of the things we did do from a, a city point, we started identifying some um, new funding sources. I mean, we have been running a overlay program for the last probably 12 years now. And obviously this one is, it's cost, it was, it's been going on for a while. So it's not a new, a new funding source after the transition plan was completed, but it's about out of, out of the, we get about 1.5 to $2 million allocated for overlay every year. So about a hundred to $200,000 are specifically for curb ramps upgrades. So that was one existing funding source. Then the next four on your on the list right here, ADA curb ramp program, sidewalk program. Well, those first two are definitely were new introduction after the completion. So we we allocated some funding, and this those aren't huge amounts, but it's it's a start. It's a way to get get the program going and make some improvements. And then also we did create an audible pedestrian signals program, and that ran from 18 to 20. So we had 20. This is an annual budget. We had 50,000, so that enabled us to address all the signals that didn't have it previously. Um, and then in terms of current, so since then, the ADA curb ramp program, the sidewalk program, and the audible pedestrian signals, those have been, well, the audible pedestrian is done, so we don't need any more upgrades. But in terms of addressing ADA curb ramp program and sidewalk program, um, we eliminated that and we created a new program. We basically hired a concrete crew, which in turn would create many more curb ramps 
you know, on an annual basis and obviously for a lot cheaper. I mean, now the curb ramps are for design and construction, I mean, it's going to vary based on the side of the project. We're looking at 10 to 20,000. So if, if you look at our annual program right here, 20,000 for the curb ramp, you'd only get one or two max per year. And then you might be able to do a small sidewalk project with the other the sidewalk program funding. So with this concrete crew, you you definitely get a lot more um, a lot more curb ramps and sidewalk items completed on an annual basis. So that we we look we searched for that for a couple of years. We finally got that in uh, 2020. So for the last two or three years, there's been a lot more curb ramp upgrade upgrades completed by our our our, our city staff. So that's been a great great addition. And that's, that was created because of our transition plan where we got a good idea where we have all these deficiencies and what we can, what can we do to address them as soon as possible. Try to achieve that 15 year schedule, which I wanna show you. Um, and obviously right here, the sidewalk projects in terms of, um, these are more for capital improvements. That's gonna vary from depending on the size of the project and how many curb ramps will be or tripping hazards are gonna be uh, addressed. And this is another a quick summary. So we we'll kind of repeat what I said in the last couple of slides, but since seven, 2017, we've completed about 80 curb ramp upgrades. So if you remember um, in one of the initial slides in terms of how many curb ramp were non-deficient in 2017, it was just over a hundred. So in the last five years, we almost doubled that. And um, let me just go back to this, just so you can see our schedule, our schedule for the curb ramps which is right here. So we're looking at, we had 400 in the next five years, which five years actually, next, well, this year is five years from when it was completed. I see at 407, obviously we didn't, we're not meeting this 407. We've completed 80, about 80 curb ramps altogether. So it's maybe 25% yeah, of that. So it's, it's um, we're heading in the right direction. And the main reason is, like I said before, is the creation of this two man concrete crew. They're able to complete about seven curb ramps per year. But they're not just doing curb ramps; they're doing a whole bunch of tripping hazards because they, all they do is concrete work the whole year. Um, so they do a lot of tripping hazards as well as they complete some small sidewalk project, whether they're it's a missing link or if there's a sidewalk that has many tripping hazards, they'll just re uh, reinstall a new sidewalk along that whole stretch. And like I said before, the traffic signals have been upgraded with APS. And um, just in terms of how to see how we're Moving forward in terms of the city, in terms of addressing all these issues, we're we're finalizing uh, ADA curb ramp information on our GS GIS, so we can show the the progress that we've done since the transition plan was complete, and then over the years, where where are we in terms of our schedule? If we're making more progress, and then what's the delta? What are the remaining deficiencies? And that concludes my presentation. And then if you have questions afterwards, please don't hesitate. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, we're going to turn to Everett for our next uh, ADA transition plan presentation. Thank you, uh, Ed. I, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, I, I'm noticing that we're probably going to have a lot of overlap, so I'm just going to kind of power through, <laughs> through, through my presentation, highlight the uh, relevant elements. So let me share my screen. Um, I believe this one, uh, is that coming through for everyone? I'm going to assume yes, that you see the presentation. Okay. So uh, I'm also going to post real quick into the, or at the end of my presentation, I'll post my contact information into the chat. I have to leave it to you. So you'll have it. Um, in case you want to contact me afterwards. Uh, hello, I'm Christine Anna Curtis. I'm the ADA coordinator and active transportation engineer for the city of Everett. Um, Everett, we are committed to making pedestrian facilities uh, accessible to everyone. We are the seventh largest city in Washington state. We are Snohomish County uh, population or county seat. Uh, and we're expected to see significant employment and population growth in the next two decades. And so uh, accessibility is really important and important to us. Uh, 
Bertrand already went over this, so I'm just kind of going to continue on. But I do want to say, fundamentally, why does the ADA matter to you? One, it's, it's the law, which we've talked about. Uh, anyone can experience a disability. Accessible facilities benefit everyone. And fundamentally, it's the right thing to do. Everyone has a right to use the transportation system and to be safe when they use it. Uh, to meet the ADA plan requirements, uh, Everett develops a transition plan for pedestrian facilities in the right of way. Uh, drafts were prepared in 2014 and 2018. Our final plan was published in 2021 and uh, put up on our website. Uh, just quickly to remind you, the elements of a transition plan uh, were to identify physical barriers in uh, the inventory, uh, evaluate those barriers, describe in detail the methods that are used to remove barriers, specify a schedule for removing them, identify an official who is responsible for implementing the plan, and uh, in most importantly, incorporate public feedback into the plan. To meet these requirements, uh, our ADA transition plan includes the, the following sections on policy and procedures, our inventory and self-evaluation, uh, criteria and prioritization framework for barrier removal, uh, methods and schedule, and then as well as a description of our public outreach methods and effort. Policies and procedures, again, we define the requirements of the plan. We define uh, accessibility standards that we follow, as well as the criteria by which we evaluate barriers. Our inventory, uh, self-evaluation inventory was developed or uh, collected between 2011 and 2014. Uh, it was evaluated for barriers as defined by the criteria established in the policy section. And then we made the inventory available to the public on our uh, uh, ADA website. Uh, obviously, again, people have talked about this before. There are many types of pedestrian barriers, uh, cracked and even sidewalks, obstructions in the sidewalk. Uh, where there is a curb ramp that's missing or doesn't meet standards, as well as uh, pedestrian signals where there isn't a push button or it's not, uh, doesn't have an audible tone. Uh, obviously, this list isn't comprehensive. It's only intended to describe a few examples. Our prioritization framework, uh, we established a uh, priority one, two, and three. Uh, within those priorities, uh, priority one is highest priority for removal. Those are uh, barriers that are reported by the public. Uh, they are located in areas with higher than average population of people with disabilities. They are located near services such as schools, medical centers, uh, government offices, and transportation facilities, uh, transit facilities. Priority two, uh, located in areas near services, such as restaurants or shopping centers. And priority three is uh, located in areas near industrial and manufacturing centers and all other areas not included in priorities one and two. So we developed a prioritization map um, that includes our priority framework as well as the concentrations of people with disabilities. Um, this kind of map, we have a full citywide map as well as neighborhood maps on our website. This is just an example showing um, our priority framework, how we applied it near uh, Hawthorne Elementary in North Everett. So for our methodology, methodology section, uh, we included uh, our street maintenance and barrier or repairs program, which reviews and removes barriers reported to the public and follows our prioritization framework. Capital improvement program projects 
such as sewer and water replacement, remove barriers located within the project site. Uh, the same thing with transportation projects, such as roadway construction. And then we also require when private developers work on a project, they have to make improvements to pedestrian facilities in the public right of way. For our schedule, uh, we included a list of barrier removals that are completed each year. Uh, our annual maintenance pavement maintenance program that is anticipated to remove barriers, as well as the list of capital and transportation projects that are anticipated to remove barriers. Uh, the ADA transition plan is meant to be a living document. So our goal is to update the plan every year that can include any updates to uh, applicable policies and accessibility standards, um, updates to our inventory, improved processes to track barrier removals, uh, an ongoing evaluation of the prioritization framework, any new funding sources or programs that can be applied to barrier removals, and uh, an updated list of removals uh, that are completed or identified uh, in the methodology section. Uh, I do want to read this quote. Uh, it has been kind of a guiding quote for the city of Everett. Uh, it was, uh, it's from George H.W. Bush, who was president when the first ADA law was passed in 1990. He gave this quote on the 20th anniversary. Uh, there is no place in our society for prejudice of any kind, yet it was not that long ago when Americans with disabilities were not often given equal rights and opportunities. Whether the cause was ignorance or indifference, it was not acceptable. We can all take pride in how much the ADA has accomplished, yet there is always more to be done, which is why it's good to not only celebrate our successes, but to look forward at what still must be done. Uh, that's it. Uh, my contact information is up on the screen. I will post it in the chat. Uh, and you can also contact us through our website. Um, I will be available until two if there are any questions. So thank you so much for, for letting me share our ADA transition plan with you. Hey, thank you, Christina. Next, we have Lake Stevens. Hey, I'm Kim Clinkers. I'm from Lake Stevens. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Great. All right. I will um, share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, I'm hopeful. Is that working fine? You guys can see the PowerPoint presentation? No. Not see the slides. Okay, that's not great. Let's close this. Oh, I have to hit the share button. Okay. Does that, does that seem to be working okay? Yes, we can see them. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so I'll yeah, I'll try to keep this quick and just talk specifically about um, some of the elements that Lake Stevens is working on. So um, my name is Kim Clinkers. I'm the city engineer here. Whitney is also um, on the call. She is our engineering tech, and Ryan Peterson um, with Transpo Group was our consultant that helped um, prepare this project. So just, I wanted to quickly discuss um, some elements about the city of Lake Stevens. We have about 40,000 residents. Um, this is, our city boundary is shown in blue here on the screen. Um, we have about 122 staff that the city employs here. And also I wanted to note that Lake Stevens does, is a non-CA agency. So I think that we were required to have a transition plan in place five years after WashDOT had theirs um, finalized. Okay, so just to um, overview the timeline of our transition plan, um, it was initiated last year around July 2022 when we selected Transpo Group to um, help us with our self-evaluation and developing the transition plan. 
Um, the self-evaluation was completed between November and February of this year. We had a, a public outreach phase in December, um, and then we Transpo completed the assessment analysis in February. Our draft plan was available um, early March, which we had uh, sent out to the public for an opportunity for them to review and provide comments. And then we just finalized it at the end of March and submitted it to WashDOT. Um, this, that first portion of the plan was specific to all pedestrian facilities within our right of way, including sidewalks, curb ramps, and pedestrian push buttons. Um, right now we're currently in process to evaluate all non right of way uh, facilities for ADA compliance. So this is gonna include city owned publicly accessible buildings, parks, amenities, and trails which we will be adding um, to this, the transition plan this year. And then we are beginning to think about um, implementation and tracking. So to dig into that a little bit more, I'm just gonna touch on some of our, our data collection. So for sidewalks, this figure was part of our transition plan. We have 137 miles of sidewalks. Um, you know, only 6% are compliant, um, but the majority of them at 90% have minor compliance issues. Um, and we did use a street scan in 2021. They provided the majority of the, the sidewalk data that Transpo used to complete this analysis. Um, and I'll keep going on to our curb ramps. So um, Lake Stevens has over 3,000 curb ramps. Um, Transpo group, we didn't, we had a GIS layer um, for some existing curb ramps, but once they started looking at the data, it was it was outdated and not complete enough for um, an ADA evaluation. So Transpo Group helped us this past year to uh, go out and evaluate all of these almost 3,100 curb ramps for ADA compliance. Um, and it uh, looks like about 11% of our ramps are compliant. Uh, majority of them have significant compliance issues. For the, the push buttons, um, we have about 100 pedestrian push buttons in Lake Stevens. None of them measured to be fully ADA compliant. About half of them are the older style um, H style ones, which are pictured above uh, that need to be fully replaced. And then about half of them um, are the newer style APS buttons that um, could be upgraded or reprogrammed. Um, and in addition, we do have about a dozen of the rectangular rapid flashing beacon assemblies with the push buttons that uh, we'll be trying to, to relocate to be um, in compliance with ADA standards. Uh, I just wanted to note that with all the, the data gathering as part of the self-evaluation, Transpo Group helped um, set up a GIS portal um, to be able to display all this information. And that's been helpful as we um, talk through the data and the prioritization process. So this was just a, a snapshot of um, the portal that they hosted for us to look at the data. For our public outreach phase, um, in December and January, we had an online open house, which included a public survey and an online reporting portal. Um, I think we had about 17 citizens respond to our online survey, which we use their input for the prioritization process. Um, and it, as I mentioned, we also did provide the draft transition plan uh, to the public for their review and comments, but I don't think that we received any comments from the community at that time. So I was going to highlight um, the prioritization process. There was two main metrics that Transpo Group used for the prioritization, uh, the first being the accessibility index score. The figure here on the screen is specific to curb ramps, um, but they assigned a score between zero and 30 for each curb ramp, depending on the severity and physical impact to accessibility. The other metrics was a location index score, um, which rated each facility in regards to its proximity to popular community destinations. Uh, the graph here on the screen was some of the survey data that we received from the community and um, they their input suggested that we should prioritize um, improvements around schools and institutions and neighborhoods. So 
those, uh, the location index score was rated between zero to 45. And then they combine those two scores, which is the combined index score, um, which is a score of zero to 75 to prioritize these barriers between low, medium, high, and very high for um, their removal. When it came to cost estimating um, between the sidewalks, curb ramps, and push buttons, Transpo Group estimated it to be about $37,600,000 to remove all the existing barriers within the public right of way. For the transition schedule, um, they helped us estimate our current level of funding for barrier removal at about $1.66 million per year. This includes our typical capital improvement projects, and we'll have some upcoming um, transportation benefit district projects, in addition to our annual pavement preservation and overlay program, and the work that our public works crew does for sidewalk repair and maintenance, and in addition to permitted private development and utility upgrade projects. So in summary, with the current Funding allocation uh, is projected to take approximately 23 years to remove all existing right-of-way barriers that were identified with our self-evaluation. Um, some of the recommendations from Transpo Group, uh, we're working on developing a program for the barrier removal that we can monitor and adjust. We'll start with a, a five-year program, monitor that, and then evaluate and adjust for the next five-year program. Um, we're going to focus on the highest priorities first. About a quarter of our barriers were prioritized as very high and you know a little over half were prioritized as high. Um, in addition, they recommended if we were able to allocate additional annual funding um, that would help with our barrier removal process to go quicker. Um, so for example, if we contributed an, an additional $2 million per year, then we could complete this in 10 years as opposed to 23 years. So just to summarize some next steps that we're working on, um, as I mentioned, we're currently evaluating our city-owned publicly accessible buildings, parks, and amenities. Um, we're going to complete the, that prioritization process and cost estimating and the transition schedule for those elements and get those added to the transition plan. Um, right now, our, our team, our project managers, our plans reviewers, and even the consultants that we're working with, we're focused on being more mindful of ADA compliance for our new capital and private development projects. The city council is interested in, in um, our team reviewing city records to see if we have NEF documentation or if we're able to identify some existing facilities that may be covered under the safe harbor provision. So that's additional research we'll, we'll be looking into in the future. Um, also, this, this year, I'm having one of our inspectors look at the APS style pedestrian push buttons to see if we can get those easily reprogrammed so some of them can be ADA compliant. And then we are this year kicking off a dedicated annual ADA improvements capital project. Um, we are focusing on some past curb ramp improvements that um, were missed with previous capital projects. So that's our main focus this year is to get those corrected. And then we will start implementing um, the next year's phase in support of the transition plan. Uh, another element of this is just updating our engineering design and development standards that, as, that was part of the self-evaluation. And then we'll be working on incorporating new facilities and updating our barrier removal efforts into our GIS database so we can um, update, update the data and use it in future years. So this is my closing slide. Um, this is my contact information here. Uh, Max Ross is our risk manager and our ADA coordinator for the city of Lake Stevens. And as I mentioned, Brian Peterson um, was our project manager at Transco Group that helped with all of this. And I do have a link to um, our transition plan website, which has a also a link to our complete transition plan document if anybody's interested. All right. I think that that yeah, that's the end. Hopefully I can there we stop sharing. Yeah, thank Excellent. you for looking. Oh, thank you.
Next, we'll have Mount Mike Terrace present, I believe Jeff. Uh, and then also after Jeff presents, we'll have a mini Q and A uh, since Christine is leading at two. Uh, that feel free to present. All right. Well, hi everyone. Jeff River City Mount Lake Terrace. Give me a sec to get the right windows up here. So I've only been with the city for a short while. And all right, why are you not updating? Let's share screen one. Hit the share button. There we go. And I'll get, oh, okay, now you guys, everybody goes tiny. All right, so let me give you a little background on City Mount Lake Terrace first. The first 205 homes were built here in 1949, right next to what they call the Everett Tacoma Freeway, that we call I-5. We're four square miles with a population of uh, 22,000 people. We're served by Community Transit, Sound Transit, and King County Metro with light rail service planned to start in 2024. It'll stop at the new Sound Transit uh, Light Rail Transit Center next to the new existing transit center and next to a, a large mixed use development called Terra Station. Within the city limits, we have 75 miles of sidewalks and we have about 1,000 curb ramps and 22 traffic signals. I want to say if I had Thomas's SDOT budget, I could upgrade every curb ramp in the city within a year. All right, so we hired Transpo Group as well, so shout out to Transpo and Ryan Peterson to develop our plan, and that included performing our inventory. We started with public open houses to establish our priorities in July of 2019. The self-assessment was completed in November of 2019 and then adopted by the City Council in September 21, September 21st of 2020. I wasn't here. I've been with the city for about three months now, and many of the people that were involved in the transition plan aren't with the city for one reason or another. What I can tell is that our city took a strategic and tactical approach and made decisions that reduced the scope of the plan to ensure that it was a manageable program that fit within the staff constraints and the budget limits. One thing about the city here is that our engineering staff is a team of about six people. And in, in addition to streets and roads and, and design in the right of way, we're also involved in uh, the development reviews on the private developer side. So when private developers come in and go through the permitting process, the civil review happens here. So we're stretched thin at times. And with that turnover, it's really um, created some holes that we're, we're still trying to fill. We also had, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of large capital projects during the same time that also took staff time away. So compared to like Snohomish County where I came from, our engineering and traffic operations had about 150 people, whereas here again, we have six. Um, so our inventory, the guidance was we used the 2011 PROAG. We completed our self-assessment. And here's the map that Transpo created. One of the strategic decisions was to limit the assessment area to one square mile. And that's within this blue dashed line and all these red dots. We just didn't have the time and the funds to do the entire city inventory. So they reduced in scope. What they discovered, of course, like everybody, 78% of our curb ramps were not compliant. 62% of our sidewalk was not compliant. And 72% of our pedestrian push buttons were not compliant. And I think everybody's familiar with why this is. Um, <clears throat> as the city developed and grew, it experienced a major growth in those post-war years. There were no ADA standards. The PRO Act didn't exist. There was no guidance. And then once the ADA was created, development in the city, I think, had already peaked. And so there weren't as many newer curb ramps. And then things like the um, detectable warnings that the um, FHWA put a hold on installing detectable warnings. So many of our curb ramps that were built after, say, the 1970s were still not compliant and didn't get uh, detectable warnings. So we also had public involvement. I mentioned we had an open house. We also had an online survey and then a focus group that met in January of 2020. And then we have a, a separate citizen planning commission that advises our city council. We had a series of meetings with them in the first half of 2020. And the final result was we had city council meetings, a final public hearing, and the plan was approved. 
So the methods we have for removing all these barriers, we have our capital improvement projects based on our tip. We have our general transportation fund and we have our city public works crews. We have signal and utility upgrades and then we have um, permitted or private development happening throughout the city. Our funding is coming uh, from federal grants, HSIP, Safe Routes to Schools, and Community Development Block grants are some of the larger ones. We also get state funds and of course city funds. And so our consultant developed our corrective action schedule and they created the similar ranking that Lake Stevens is using. We have our, our barriers are ranked by their location, their proximity to pedestrian generators, schools, shopping, businesses, um, transit, and then their severity ranking. Just uh, for a, a ramp or sidewalk, how bad is it? How steep are the slopes? How steep are the cross slopes? And then combining those, they developed the, um, the ALCS ranking. And as you can see, you know, a lot of the ramps within our surveyed area are um, very high priority to remove. Some cost estimates were developed within our assessed area. The figure is about $28 million. If we estimate for all the barriers within the entire city limits, we're looking at over $56 million for a total of 85 million to fix every barrier within the city limits. The estimated schedule for this was 50 years. Um, as everybody's finding, it takes a long time and a lot of money to upgrade your ramps. What I can't find many traces of is progress we've made since then. In fact, since the plan was released, a lot of private development has occurred within the city and a lot of ramps have been built that have not been put into the inventory. So my first task, which I just finished, has been identifying and locating in our mapping where those ramps are and then coming up with a plan to get out and inspect them and add them to our inventory. I've been working with our um, GS technician and with a consultant to get that mapping data back in-house so that we can work with it, develop our plans. The next task then also is to create an MEF database. I don't believe we have been tracking MEFs. I haven't found any evidence of them, but that's a necessary component. And then moving forward from that is the next big step is completing the citywide inventory. So expanding out beyond that one square mile section and capturing the rest of the city. And then I want to develop a five-year rolling program to continue taking out the barriers ranked very high and high. Um, I don't have a targeted list yet. That's the next step now that I have the GIS data. I'll start developing lists of what ramps we can take out and what projects we can identify. Some other interesting statistics. The cost for our consultant to develop this was about $67,000. For city staffers, it was another 30,000. So a total of just under 100,000 to develop the transition plan. And for some interesting comparisons in with Snohomish County, where I came from, where we have 1,000 curb ramps, they have 10,000 curb ramps, so 10 times as many. And I believe it took the county a period of about three years to do their self-assessment, which they managed all in-house. So where we're one square mile, Snohomish County is 2,000 square miles, and where our population is 20,000, their population is over 800,000. And I mentioned already the difference in the sizes of the staff and how much more uh, people they have uh, to collect the data and develop the plans and build the schedules. Uh, their cost to collect the data alone was 150,000 in $150,000 in 2011. And we have here at the city an annual budget, I believe, of $50,000 to devote strictly to ADA, to barrier removals and other parts of our ADA program. I believe the county figures just managing their program costs typically $35,000 a year. They use a rolling 12-year schedule of barriers they need to remove. And they're able to remove quite a few barriers every year. They have a very robust overlay program. And they usually can replace about 100 to 150, maybe 200 ramps every year, just as part of their ongoing yearly overlay program. 
And I'm hoping that the city here can partner with the county in the future and get some of our roads included in their overlay programs so that we can get some more of our barriers upgraded. So that's where we are at the city. And we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It looks like a interesting, challenging work, and I'm hoping we'll make a lot of progress very soon. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to ask a question to our panelists uh, before we get on to other presentations, but are there any lessons learned that the panelists would like to share for other cities? The, the most important thing, element, item for the city of Everett is that this is an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. We always have to think about our plan, think about how we're implementing it uh, and notify the public about it and give them opportunities to give us feedback. So it's it's an ongoing thing. I'll say it's also a, an incredibly complicated data management problem. So um, looking at the gap from when the transition plan inventory was created to where we are now, but luckily we have a very small physical area to work with. And so finding out what ramps have been built that didn't get inventoried isn't that challenging. At Snohomish County, we had a similar problem in that there was a period of about three years we called the gap years where ramps didn't get inventoried, but with a lot more development happening, private developers building you know, a development of 500 houses with intersections at many county roads with curb ramps or our own projects, a corridor project might have 50 or 70 ramps in it. We had a very high number of ramps that didn't get inventoried, and we were struggling to find ways to, you know, find out where are they located in the county, and then do we have people to go out and measure them? And so it was very challenging to get through those gap years. Um, I think we did. The other challenge was what format do we keep that data in? It looks like people are using GIS. We're doing it here in the city, and I rather like it. I think it's it's manageable, people are familiar with it, and you can get a lot of data out of it. Um, the county switched to using their cartograph asset management system. Um, and so all new curb ramps currently being inventoried at the county go into cartograph. And it's a, a very rugged, very powerful system, but it's a little complicated. And the unanswered question is what to do with the old inventory data. Should we take these 10,000 ramps we have and bring them into cartograph? And how much time will that take? And how much will that cost us? Is it even worth doing? Or do we just maintain these two data sets? And I don't believe the counties yet really come up with a good answer to that. They're just maintaining the status quo and having two separate data sets. And I was going to add one quick lesson learned um, from Lake Stevens. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Good data in it means good data out. Um, we're running into that that issue right now. I think that we were balancing, do we try to use what we have um, outdated and complete data just for the sake of making this more efficient and checking the box and getting through the analysis and the plan development? Or do we invest the time and the energy up front to go collect the missing data and get complete information? Um, and I would recommend that to anybody that's, you know, getting into this process that I think it is worth thinking through because, you know, once you have your plan, you really need to think about how you're going to implement it and the useful data that you have um, will really make it more effective and efficient when you try to go implement and use that data. So that was one lesson learned that I think would be helpful for others. Great. I think we'll move on to our next presentation and we'll have PSRC present next. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Kim, and I am a senior planner, um, and I'm with Puget Sound Regional Council. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our agency, um, we are the MPO, so Metropolitan Planning Organization for four counties in central Puget Sound, including King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. Um, and we did not prepare any slides for today. <laughs> Hope that's okay for everyone. 
Uh, but I'll kick this off um, and Nick, Nick Johnson, an assistant planner um, who joined me today will share more details about um, our agency's ADA transition plan inventory survey efforts. So um, just to kick off, um, in our latest regional transportation plan, a long range transportation plan for the region, um, we have an action called for um, in the plan to research and support ADA transition planning in our region. Um, for now, uh, this means that we are doing a background research on ADA transition plans um, and creating a comprehensive um, inventory of, of the transition, transit, transition plans sorry, in the region. Um, and, uh, and as of right now, we are uh, planning to gather some general information about uh, ADA transition planning um, status from member jurisdictions, including cities, counties, towns, and other agencies um, to really help uh, help us understand our role in this work. Um, we began this work with a um, search of basic information in ADA transition planning, um, including roles and responsibilities by agencies. Um, and we reached out to all member jurisdictions recently earlier this month. Um, on ADA transition planning status um, about two and a half weeks ago. <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass this over to Nick uh, to let him share more about our ongoing survey efforts. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Um, so I'll just sort of informally talk about our survey. So as Jean said, we sent the survey out at the beginning of the month, and we were um, we shared this with jurisdictions, transit agencies, uh, port authorities, and um, others. And the survey content uh, was asking for the best contact at each agency, uh, the completeness of their self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, and the dates of completion, if that was relevant, or estimated dates when they were planning to have their self-evaluation or transition plan complete. Uh, and finally, we asked for a link or a PDF to uh, their either transition planning page or their plan if it was available. So uh, we sent this out early April and had a deadline of April 14th. Uh, which was last Friday. And so far, 78 agencies have completed the survey uh, with about 20-ish that have still yet to complete. And we're currently kind of in the process of um, sending out some reminder emails because we are hoping to get as close to 100% completion as possible. Um, and for some kind of brief overviews of what we're seeing from this inventory, about 50% have completed a transition plan from what we've seen so far, with almost 20% having a plan currently in progress. So um, it's pretty interesting information. Uh, and I think for now, that's all we have to share. Uh, we, we will be, um, it's an ongoing process. We'll be following up with these remaining agencies to try and get that complete inventory. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any questions. Yeah, um, and moving forward, once we um, clean up the survey survey results and collect comprehensive information on the plans in the region, um, we will review the plans um, and work with our transportation policy board for the next steps. Um, and we would also like to thank everyone who completed the survey on time. And if you haven't already, uh, please take 10 minutes of your time today to complete the survey. Um, again, uh, we'll, we will work with our board and our uh, relevant committee uh, members together um, moving forward. And if you have any questions, please let me and Nick know. But that's it from us. Thank, right, you. thank you. Our next presentation will be from Jennifer, uh, presenting on Marysville. Hi there. I'm Jennifer Salman with Transportation Solutions, and I'll get my presentation going here. So I am with Transportation Solutions. We are a transportation design and planning firm located in Woodinville, Washington. Today, I'd like to highlight some best practices for public right-of-way transition plans. I'll look at a few case studies for success stories from 
uh, the city of Marysville, as well as the Port of Everett and Sultan. I'll look at some lessons learned from those agencies and some closing remarks. So one resource I like to share with uh, agencies, uh, if they are new or in the process of ADA transitions plans is the NCHRP 20-7 um, uh, guide. And what's really nice is that it's a helpful, short, about 30 page refresher, as well as an introduction to all of the great content every past presenter has provided. Something interesting in it is that it does provide a variety of inventory approaches. So for smaller agencies or agencies with limited budgets, looking at the way you decide to collect your data, um, this is something con to consider um, if um, collecting data and the costs associated with that are something you're needed to, um, to address. And then with all of the listed ADA barriers, uh, I have also included rectangular rapid flashing beacons. They are not technically right now an ADA barrier in the 2010 or the PROAG standards, but I'm, I'll address them more later. Um, the pictures on the left show an accessible pedestrian signal that is the right type of push button, but there is a um, faded sign and it is beyond the reach that's allowed. And then the bottom picture shows a rectangular rapid flashing beacon that is very close to a crossing, but it's almost, it's too close because someone has to be in the ramp and pushing a button at the same time. And so we're, we're looking at RFEs as well. Another tip is before doing your ADA field evaluation work, consider again, your pedestrian access routes as those high traffic corridors, transit routes, um, all those pedestrian generators and the likely ADA destinations that um, all the other um, uh, agencies have presented on. Kind of knowing where, knowing your um, generators first. If you have to do a phased plan, work on those. Work on those first. With other elements of planning, the public engagement piece um, include members of the local ADA community throughout the process. Uh, we recommend that it's it's not a here's our draft plan, what do you think, but engage the ADA community early and often. Also, providing multiple methods and platforms for your engagement is critical. Um, in person is not in, is not always convenient, and so. Um, hybrid and uh, and multiple online methods um, for surveys that's um, recommended. And then valuing that public feedback when you are prioritizing barriers for removal. When it comes to the plan, prioritizing barriers for removal near those pedestrian access routes and likely ADA destinations is an easy first uh, step. Providing that financial commitment and schedule, we recommend that agencies start looking at ADA transition planning like their uh, six-year transportation improvement plan or your capital improvement plan. These ADA transition plans can take decades to implement as you see the cost and the time it takes to implement. So build that into your regular planning and financing of um, agency budgets, and then establishing your approach to monitoring your progress. We recommend annual report cards to, if you have limited agency resources, at least each year you'll know where, what have you done with recent projects, and then maybe at that five-year update is where you do more significant updates to data portals or um, other, um, other reporting methods. So for some success stories with the city of Marysville, this is a couple of years ago now, but we utilized Esri's ArcGIS Survey 123 platform. It's compatible on tablets and phones as well as desktops. And it has that mapping element and a photo attachment option. And so this is a kind of a neat way to collect GIS data through your public engagement effort. But I also utilize SurveyMonkey because people sometimes just want to use what's familiar. And SurveyMonkey is great. Um, um, it is the, you know, as the older and more um, present survey model, its ADA accessibility is, is up there. So 
Um, also with accessible parking, uh, we looked, uh, it's going to be at a future update, but for the city of Marysville to be aware that the 2010 standards look at off-street site-specific parking, but that marked and metered on-street parking is covered by the 2011 PROAG. So if we're going to try to meet the spirit of the ADA and go beyond the minimum, being aware that marked and metered on-street parking uh, is it's in the PROAG. And then accessible pedestrian signal policy or APS policy. WashDOT has a policy and WashDOT requires agencies to have a policy. They don't have to be the same. So look at your agency specific situation and look at how your um, transportation network and your you know, alterations and maintenance activities to develop a policy that fits your agency. Another success story is the Port of Everett. The port is a much smaller geographic area than most of the agencies here today. So I had the chance to do a lot more with small data sets. So we looked at sidewalk and driveway sidewalk interface. And if you're at a bigger agency and you have to manage your resources about what you can afford to do evaluations on, you know, eventually you have to do every right of way facility. But some best practices look at do a combination of your curb ramps and pedestrian signals or curb ramps and sidewalks as a starting point. Um, sidewalks can be a very, very massive effort. Um, and so trying to think about, you might have to face things as you work towards a complete ADA transition plan. Another success story with the Port of Everett was direct engagement. So taking the time to research the local ADA or ADA adjacent organizations in your agency, your school districts, um, medical providers, senior living facilities, and um, doing that intentional direct engagement can lead to some really effective um, feedback. And so a small group um, with the Port of Everett, um, they ended up discussing and uh, they want to do an accessibility map of the port, and that's an objective to be completed by the next update of their plan. And lastly, the city of Salton, it's a current client. And in terms of some tools that I've found to be really helpful, um, I did all of the curb ramp and APS evaluation in Salton. Um, it's a population of just under 6,000, so much smaller than a lot of the agencies presenting today. Um, and so I used field maps to collect all of my curb ramp data, and I built in kind of a grading system um, kind of like A is better condition, D is poor missing ramp condition. And so I could do some of that prioritization work in the field and took pictures, and then it's ready instantaneously for me to review back at my desk, um, as well as on the iPad in the field. And there's also instant configurable map applications. Um, and that's the pictures to the right are showing just, this is draft for my client at the city to be able to review my work to date and explore it in just a, a viewer friendly uh, platform with nice big photos and all the data I collected, plus knowing where that is in relation to the other, um, other facilities. And then with rectangular rapid flashing beacons, we decided to include them in our self-evaluation. There are four actual push buttons, two crossings in Sultan. And so we looked at the FHWA interim approval 21 as our guidance on what is um, what RFBs must include and what accessibility features are required. Since many agencies are using RFBs, as an equivalent accommodation to a pedestrian signal, we want to make sure RFBs are as accessible as possible. So some lessons learned, the city of Marysville, uh, in-person public engagement is difficult. It's even, um, it's difficult for everyone uh, in smaller communities with less frequent or convenient transit access. That is an additional physical, and time barrier and comfort barrier. And so having um, hybrid and multiple methods of engagement is very highly recommended. For the Port of Everett, 
we spent a lot of time in the scoping phase, and this may be more for agencies who do work with consultants. Um, and you know, an ADA transition plan can be beyond the public right of way as well. And so really thinking about you might need to plan or budget for scoping activities if you're going to work with a sub with a consultant firm to identify what can be accomplished within your available budget for the year to spend on this. And lastly, for the city of Sultan, APS and RFB push button reach, so needs to be within 10 inches, and placement, it shouldn't be on the ramp, it should be at the landing. Um, these were things we were noticing as barriers to accessibility. And so um, wanting to, you know, it's not just the physical uh, push button style, it is how you reach it and where it is. And a lesson learned with as we're navigating the multiple resources on RFBs, FHWA, WashDOT Design Manual, and MUTCD. You know, we have push buttons, you have pedestrian actuated beacons, you have audible pedestrian signals. It, it can get confusing. So navigating all the all the uh, regulations and guidelines um, is just something that takes time. And then also. Uh, the PROWAG has its 2013 supplement that covers shared use paths. And so as Sultan grows and wants to expand its active transportation facilities, just being aware that we're recommending that they design to the latest best practices. So thanks for your time and my contact information, I'll put it into the chat as well. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Rita, do you feel comfortable presenting for Bothell right now? That would be our final presentation before we hop into Q and A. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you guys see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's get started. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rita Hu, Senior Capital Project Engineer with Public Works Department, City of Boston. And it's my honor to be here to give you a very high level overview of Boston's ADA transition plan. Boston's ADA transition plan was developed by its sidewalk program, which addresses pedestrian facility uh, or pedestrian safety, as well as ensures the pedestrian facility are following the Americans with Disabilities Act. Boston Sidewalk Program has a lot of responsibilities, such as it reviews sidewalks and curb brand condition, it creates project lists, it, uh, it looks for funding opportunities. It constructs sidewalk curb ramp projects. Lastly, it has developed, uh, maintain and update the ADA transition plan. Uh, the timeline of the development of the ADA transition plan. In late 2013, also started to gather information of the requirements of the ADA transition. Uh, ADA transition plans, and also the requirement of the Title II of the ADA. In 2015, we outlined the ADA transition plan. In late 2015, we hired a consultant to perform sidewalk and curb ramp inventories. In 2016, we developed a prioritization system to prioritize sidewalk and curb ramp projects. Uh, in 2017, we formed a task force uh, basically to prioritize projects and develop an implementation plans for Bothell and also for the transition plan. In early 2018, the first draft of the ADA transition plan was developed. In late 2018, Bothell City Council adopted the ADA transition plan. Since then, we continue to perform citywide inventory for curb ramps and sidewalk. Um, we plan to update the ADA transition plan this year, and currently we are conducting public outreach to gather input from public about the city's uh, pedestrian facility. 
the BOSS ADA transition plan specify who the designated ADA coordinator is, what the grievance procedure is, uh, what public notice about the ADA requirements and the processes that BOSO has been following. It also documents the self-evaluation of curb rent and sidewalks that were conducted in 2015 and 2016. Uh, the total mileage of sidewalk inventory in 2015 and 16 was about 70 miles of the street. The total number of curb rents inventory in 2015 and 2016 was over uh, 830. As of today, we have completed the citywide inventory for all existing curb rents, existing sidewalks, and missing sidewalks. Curb rent inventory. Here are the examples of the graphic and table in the ADA transition plan. The graphic to the left show the curb rent inventory map and the table to the right summarize the curb rent uh, inventory finding. Similarly, uh, the sample graph here shows the sidewalk inventory map and the table documents the uh, existing and missing sidewalk that were inventory in 2015-16. The ADA transition plan also talks about how Basel prioritized project by considering various scoring criteria. It also includes a nine-year implementation plan, which projected the total available funds to construct or fix the pedestrian facility within the nine year time frame. Last element included in the ADA transition plan was how Basel has planned it to monitor and update the ADA transition plan. Project prioritization, the need for improvements far exceeds our uh, resources. So we develop a prioritization system to prioritize projects. The prioritization system was focused on uh, safety, connectivity, walkability, diversity, equity, inclusion, and et cetera. The key ele uh, elements or criteria we use includes street condition, street classification, proximity, such as proximity to school zone transit stop, park and ride, public services, uh, shopping centers, parks recreation, manufactured housing communities, senior housings, and disability facilities. We also took into consideration of the accident data. Our GIS team uh, has created sidewalk and curb rent layers enable us to uh, <clears throat> document our inventory data, as well as uh, enable us to do all the analysis, the prioritization of the project. So once a master prioritization list was developed, we review the top ranking project again by considering additional criteria, such as constructability, project costs, leveraging opportunities, and the public input requests. So by doing that, a final implementation plan uh, was created. Implementation plan, the ADA transition plan has a nine year implementation. ADA transition plan has a nine year implementation plan it described how Boso projected the funding from each funding source and how we plan to utilize available funds to implement project. So our funding source includes sidewalk program, safe street sidewalk levy, payment preservation program, capital improvement projects, uh, and also some grants, private development. The two tables here are the example of the budgets and also project plan for the ADA transition plan. The table to the left show a list of the projected costs from different funding sources, 
So as uh, the table uh, to the right indicates, uh, the projected sidewall project for a nine-year time frame. <clears throat> In conclusion, Boso City Council adopted its first ADA transition plan in 2018. The current ADA transition plan does not cover all aspects of the, of the self-evaluation and implementation of Boso's programs, policies, and facilities. However, it does address the Title II of the ADA requirements. Since 2018, we completed five new sidewalk projects, which cost about $8 million. completed sidewalk repairs for over 200 locations around the schools and Boston downtown areas, and constructed and reconstructed over 80 new curb ramps by CIP projects, Payment Preservation Program or Operations Group. Our ADA transition plan is a living document and is currently being updated. Boswell ADA transition plan is available on the City of Boswell website and I have included a link here if anyone is interested in reviewing it, it's available online. And that is it. Thank you for your time. And my contact information is shown on the screen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rita. Uh, so with our last about nine minutes, I want to ask the panelists if you have any questions for one another. Please feel free to raise your hand or just put it off mute and ask. I have a question for the group. And it's actually a little bit of a tangent, though. Um, but thinking back on Anna Zivart's presentation, it's it's always wonderful to see her and she's um, just so illuminating about the problems that she faces and others with disabilities throughout our region. Um, I started following her on Twitter and then that led to me following a lot of other disability advocates and people who care about the built environment. And it's just for me personally, fascinating and eye-opening to get that um, wealth of perspectives from people like her that are in our area um, and, and see the, the problems and the challenges they face. And I, I really, I like that. And at work, it seems like it's a useful tool for me. It just keeps me, you know, focused that this is, these are the problems people face and I'm aware of them. I'm just curious if other people use social media and get the same sort of input and information from people like that. I can just provide my input since um, I'm on the panel, I guess. I deleted my Facebook account like a year and a half ago, and I don't do Twitter or any of those things. I'm living happily disconnected from social media. So um, that's my perspective on it. <laughs> and that's fine. Actually, Twitter is the only, I, I have a LinkedIn, but I don't remember the password. I've never updated it. I deleted my Facebook a couple of years ago. My Twitter account actually isn't in my name. It's not connected to me in any way. Um, I mostly just use it to follow people. And uh, again, I started following Anna because of her perspective. And that just led to me following people like Kim Kinchin, um, Brock, um, people like, um, oh, who is Ryan Packer um, with The Urbanist. And yeah, it's just eye-opening, but I don't participate. I just use it as a way of seeing what's out there, what people are discussing. I can add that for myself as a consultant and you know, needing to advise agencies on how to you know, implement a public right-of-way plan, as well as the wider scope of policies and procedures and roles for ADA transition planning is there's a national association of ADA coordinators and just looking at how they train their staff and um, just being aware of the wider scope of ADA transition plans and that the public right of way, yes, it's its own, um, I don't want to call it a beast, but it's its own, as its own set of challenges, but the ADA also extends, it connects to buildings, it connects to parks, and, and widening that awareness has been beneficial for me. Does anyone from the audience have any questions to our panelists uh, regarding their ADA transition plans or regarding their work in general? Thank you. Yes, um, I'm just curious how we um, 
regionally are elevating the the shared need here and the the scale and size of the unmet need for these improvements and um what some emerging solutions um or some success stories that jurisdictions might have at um, increasing the the percent of capital budgets that are allocated for these kinds of improvements. I can add that as we're learning about the new Safe Streets for All program, ADA transition planning is mentioned within the concept or the um, umbrella of Safe Streets for All. And so I would recommend exploring that grant um, if you have they have grants for planning but also implementation grants for projects and if you have projects that can meet multiple needs safety as well as ada accessibility thinking through all the ways a project can meet priorities of the city would be something i'd recommend since the safe streets for all program is a new funding opportunity at the federal level since the question was regional, I'm curious if our regional partners have anything to add. Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, for the recent, most recent um, regional transportation plan, we created a regional bicycle and pedestrian network for the first time. Um, and that was our first um, attempt to identify where the needs are, where um, the sidewalk networks are incomplete, when where the bicycle networks are incomplete. And we just launched our survey to take another step to see uh, which cities and jurisdictions have um, ADA transition plans and identify the needs um, for their cities, jurisdictions, and other jurisdictions. So we are taking baby steps right now. Um, and um, once we as I mentioned, uh, once we uh, identify and um, have more clear information of the ADA trans transition planning efforts in our region, we are happy to report back to the public or to uh, the jurisdictions in our region to work together to um, improve any gaps or needs uh, for infrastructure. Ed, I don't know if you see my hand up. Yes, go, go, go for it. Yeah. Um, Today's presentation and yesterday's uh, early presentation just reminded me that all the work that is being done right now in studying the transit gap, the unmet need throughout the state is, is really um, just part of that solution because 15 minute headways through a, a neighborhood that has no sidewalks is still keeping a lot of people from being able to get to to transit in a meaningful way. So I know that being in transit my my whole career, there's always this conversation about, well, you know, we do what we do and they do what they do. And I'm hoping that there's a day when all these conversations are together that with there's a sidewalk there, then transit can go there. And maybe, you know, there's more partnerships, more ways of getting that done, uh, less um, focus on the color of the money or the or the, the the tunnel of the money and trying to figure out a way to maximize our all of our resources to, to help the community at large so this has been an inspiring couple of days and i just want to thank you all for it i think with that we can conclude this 2 30. uh i'm going to share my screen real quick I'd like to thank our partners, the Disability Mobility Initiative, Homish Human Services, the Homish County Human Services for making this event possible. Uh, Universal Design uh, Forum has been an incredible experience to hear from many voices regarding universal design and general accessibility issues. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that's participated in it, uh, especially our panelists on uh, our ADA Transition Plan Roundtable today. Uh, thank you. Brock, do you have any additional comments? Um, yeah, that was a fantastic uh, way to end it, Tom, and a great last panel uh, for showing what we are doing as a community and, and obviously also seeing some of the gaps that we have to, to work on, both in terms of uh, actual physical gaps and gaps in terms of funding of uh, realizing the solutions. Um, thank you for, for all joining us. I think we had nearly 70 people uh, join us over the 
these two days. Uh, so fantastic representation. So we are going to have uh, four additional events uh, over the next couple of months. I just want to tip them off and uh, encourage you to register on our site at ghostnotrack.org slash events. Angie Schmidt, uh, who wrote Right of Way, uh, the book addressing pedestrian fatalities on May 3rd. On May 17th, Melissa and Chris Bruntlett, uh, who wrote their latest book, was Curbing Traffic. Um, on June 1st, Jarrett Walker, who wrote Human Transit. And finally, on June 21st, Nathan Voss, who wrote uh, The Lines That Make Us, and he's a Metro bus driver and provides a very empathetic approach and lots of great stories about uh, him riding the bus and the community he's built. Um, so join us for one of those four. And thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. I did uh, start a listserv uh, for the attendees and the registrants of this event. So if you have questions for panelists, feel free to shoot them that way. Ed will be sending um, additional, like the, the PowerPoints that the presenters had off to you. And I hope by Monday to have the video up um, of this event so you can rewatch certain segments of it if you wish. So thank you so much, uh, panelists, uh, this latest panelists and all of our presenters uh, throughout the, the past two days. Mm -hmm.